I lived in Germany for many years while my father was stationed there in the U.S. Army. We lived off base in private housing, and I loved it. That country is amazing. The vast forests, the mountains, the countryside, the farmlands, the little towns, everything. I quickly became really good friends with some local boys whose parents owned the town's dairy farm. We were always in the forests, running around and exploring, fishing, playing army, stuff like that. I was around eight or nine years old at that time, and I'm over 40 now. One night, I stayed late at the farm hanging out with the guys. I left at about nine or ten-ish. It was dark, but the moonlight gave pretty good vision. I lived just across the soccer field, and then across a small cornfield from the farm. As I'm walking through the soccer field, I see a bit of movement, just really quickly, out of the corner of my eye along the tree line at the edge of the field. I quickly stepped up my pace. As I turn to take my usual path through the cornfield to my house, I see at least a half a dozen silhouettes emerge from each side of the rows of corn on the sides of the path. I froze. They just stood there. And then all of a sudden, there's one standing behind me. Before I can snap around and get out of there, he asks in German where I'm going. I turned around, and what I see surprises but also relieves me. I answered in English and told him I was headed home. He was then curious about my English. Turns out it was a team of special forces operators. I mean, these guys were decked out so much in tactical gear, I couldn't comprehend how they were able to move so stealthily. Night vision goggles, packs, bags, weapons, there was even a dog. They looked like total badasses. Apparently they were using these small towns to do some off-base training. I just happened upon them this particular night. I will never understand why they chose to break cover and show themselves. They could have easily just stayed put and I would have walked right by them none the wiser. But they all walked me home as it was on their way back. It started off super creepy, but it was actually pretty cool. And it's an experience that I will never forget. I want to begin by clarifying that the majority of this post is a prelude to my actual upcoming amateur investigation. What I'll be documenting in this post is essentially a compilation of stories I've been told, some retellings of others, and also what little I've already checked out myself. I will not claim validity to any of the accounts I'm about to give you. All I can be certain of is that I trust dearly the person from which I continue to get a lot of these stories as they are the mother of a close friend I've known for over 10 years. Honestly, some of this stuff gets a little weird for belief, but I intend to put that to the test however I can, soon. The place I call my hometown and current town is a Kentucky county comprised of old coal mining towns that at one time had a bustling economy. Let's call it Arling. Unfortunately, coal mining died a slow and painful death, and so has my home. This saddens me greatly. Arling is one of the most beautiful places I've ever seen, nestled into the heart of one of the oldest mountain ranges on Earth. The Appalachian Mountains have a tangible, natural spirit to them. I also believe they are host to a variety of things we do not understand. I, along with my girlfriend and roommate, often hike on old trails around the county, in hopes of finding interesting sights to see. We are always looking for somewhere neat to hike far out into the sticks. I had a friend of mine ask some of his work buddies if they knew of any rural pathways to test out. One of them mentioned that his father had hiked a path ascending a mountain beside what we'll call the Old Lake, and that the place scared him to death. The Old Lake is part of a forsaken wildlife management area, about 10 miles outside of town toward the state line, at the base of Mount Mason. The government property lines only go so far. Beyond that is private land owned by a local wealthy family, presumably abandoned as well. 
The man's father told of how he had once hiked along the ascending trail that follows the creek from the lake and up into the mountains, past the wildlife management area boundaries. I will refer to this trail as Lonesome Creek. The man crested a hill and prepared to briefly rest upon a flat spot. He quickly took notice of a shady campsite that had evidently been set up on the flat for some time. The site was unremarkable at first glance, nothing there but a fire pit surrounded by wooden chairs. But he could just barely see something else beyond the tree line. It looked as though someone haphazardly poked big sticks into the surrounding forest. A closer look revealed that what he was looking at were pikes staked into the dirt and adorned with several cat heads. The man's hair raised up as he felt something out there put its eyes on him, as he put it. He quickly put distance between himself and Lonesome Creek and never again so much as visited the old lake. After hearing this story, it dawned on me that I had been told something similar years ago. This story too implied possible ritualistic activity on Mount Mason. As it goes, a mutual friend and his cousin had taken their ATVs on Lonesome Creek at night. Sometime into their ride, the pair spotted a makeshift sitting area right in the middle of the trail. It was shabbily constructed with a few chairs, as well as, quote, something like what a preacher puts his Bible on, a pulpit I think is what he meant. Even more frightening was a recently doused fire in front of the pulpit. Someone had been there just before they arrived. The two riders killed their engines and unseated themselves, looking around the ridge with their flashlights. As the silence soaked in, they could make out faint voices just beyond some trees on a steep incline near a ridge. Needless to say, they didn't bother shining their lights and left in a hurry. They probed no further. Remembering this incident was enough to have me look deeper into this harrowing mystery. The occult aspect of Appalachia has always intrigued me. Everything from folk magic to the blackest of practices pervades the history of the hill folk and their predominantly Scots-Irish ancestors who emigrated long ago. In the spirit of curiosity, my girlfriend and I took a midday ride up to the backside of the old lake, opposite from the frequented dockside where families boat and fish. The road was in rough shape, and upon arrival, it was obvious from the massive amount of trash that the Department of Fish and Wildlife had long abandoned this wildlife management area. We walked up the seemingly well-traveled path against the downward stream of the titular creek. After reaching the marked end of the wildlife management area, about a half mile in, we decided it was wise to go no farther. The sheer seclusion of the place pulled me in, but I needed to take time to plan carefully and gather up a few willing folks to walk along the old Lonesome Creek Trail. A quick check of Google Maps confirmed the garbage-ridden lakeside to indeed be the bottom of the trail. The path appeared to follow the creek up to a massive rocky ridge that wraps around the side of Mount Mason, leading to an overview of the newer, larger lake a few miles over. Finding out where to go was simple enough. I suspected that getting there would not be as such. The following Saturday, I managed to gather and prepare four of my friends to set out to the old lake. Two of us came with firearms and the other two brought knives and mace. Confident yet anxious, we left the dirty lakeside and headed up parallel to the creek. The lower part of the trail was lined with large jutting rocks that formed caves below and continued up the mountainside. These enormous jagged pieces seemed to have fallen long ago from the massive ridge, above which topped Mount Mason like a crown. Past the caves and closer to the lowest part of the ridge, the trail aligned into a rocky old creek bed now diverted and empty. We stopped to rest at the bottom of a switchback, now at high enough elevation to be cradled by a lower portion of the ridge overhanging the trail's connecting elbow. After some respite under the stone's shade, we began our ascent to the top. The path soon wound away from the creek and continued to repeatedly switch back and forth up the side of a steep, stunningly green hill. Studded into the landscape were small scattered stones laid upon by long fallen trees, all covered in moss of a believably ancient color. 
From this point on, the trail was faint but identifiable. Despite the trash at the trailhead, this high up forest looked absolutely untouched. After mounting the hill, we wound through thick growth made of a tree I'd never seen. Low hanging branches of a round profile surrounded the thin trunk, appearing like a cross between a weeping willow and an acorn tree. Beside that, there were quite a few other types of foliage that I had also never seen before. Once atop the hill, we finally checked in on Google Maps to see how far along the trail we were. To our dismay, we were pinpointed way off the trail on the map. This startled me considering there was only one visible trail along the whole path. What was even more startling is that we ended up on a trail not listed by Google Maps. Admittedly, this wasn't too worrisome since the pathway was fairly defined, despite not seeing much action. We assessed that we should make the best of the situation anyway and press on a little farther to make good use of the remaining daylight. Google Maps showed that we were near a rock crawling and ATV tourist attraction on the state line called Hole in the Rock, a wagon tunnel that cut through the mountain's crown near the top. However, the last and only check-in for the area was five years prior. Apparently, we had found ourselves on an old wagon trail stretching from our side through the tunnel and into the next on the other side. The place was old for sure. Exciting was the notion of trekking through an archaic commerce road, passing over the old Native American land of Mount Mason. Interesting stuff. We resolved to find the wagon tunnel and descend before dark, but we didn't make it there in time before having to turn around. I'll go ahead and tell you that nothing exciting happened, about which I am both disappointed and relieved. After hiking back down without incident, as expected, we left behind the old lake. It was hard not to dwell upon the chilling isolation felt at Lonesome Creek. The land was empty and quiet, not at all marred by frequent travel. I'm deadly serious when I tell you that this place had a very different energy than your typical nature trail. It evoked an unsettling combination of serenity and oppression. I found it to be the perfect place for strangeness in the primordial wilderness. Lonesome Creek seemed as isolated from the rest of Arling as Appalachia is to the rest of America. It can be easily ascertained that isolation of the spirit would certainly breed desolation of the soul. Yesterday, I rang up a lady we'll call Marla, whom I've known for quite a long time. Marla has been investigating the weird and wild for almost 20 years and has written a few books about local Kentucky myths, folklore, and paranormal stories. She has, with her own resources, even helped find the identity of an early 20th century cold case victim. Conveniently enough, it just also happens that she and her family live about a mile from the old lake. I knew that if anyone could point me to something, it would be Marla. To be quite honest, I didn't expect the volume or magnitude of some of the things she told me on that phone call. I have no bias toward the truth of the two stories I've already recounted. This is different to me. I believe this woman with everything in me, and I do not consider myself naive. I will relay to you the information she has given me, which consists of her own experiences as well as the accounts of her family members. I will do my best to tell them faithfully. When Marla married and moved to the old Lake Road, it seemed nice enough, rural and quiet. She had her first child in 1993, who would grow up to be one of my best friends. When he was barely a toddler, his maternal and paternal grandfathers often took him into the woods across the road from their house, through their family cemetery, and up a long dirt path. One day, Marla received a call from her father, asking her to tell her father-in-law who lived on the same property as Marla and her husband, not to take her son into the mountains that day. He said he'd seen some strange folk camping up there who seemed a little suspect. Her father must have been pretty concerned because later that evening, the state police showed up at the cemetery. The authorities informed Marla that they had to run off some people up on the mountain, but that they appeared to be trying to set up a site to regularly meet and loiter for whatever purpose. Before leaving the cemetery, the policeman she was speaking to told her plainly, between me and you, they were doing some strange things up there. When pressed, he would not say, just shook his head and declined to answer. About a year later, Marla got the gall to go with her husband up to where the police had run off the loitering creeps. 
She claimed to have found small animal bones scattered around a clearly once established site and a concrete slab fitted into the dirt and etched with what she described as obviously evil symbology. This was a time before cell phones, so she has no photo evidence. The next weird experience to befall Marla didn't come for almost six years. It seemed to have spooked her more than anything else she's told me. One evening, Marla thought it would be fun to take her son, then age seven, on a walk to the old lake to check out the creek, catch salamanders and find rocks as they often did along the river, which runs behind their property. They made their way to the lake and followed Lonesome Creek up toward the initial incline and past the Mark Wildlife Management Area. Apart from the creek babble, Marla caught ear of what sounded like loud voices farther into the woods. As she and her son continued up to face the second incline, it became evident that a group of people were gathered toward Mason's crown. A loud voice echoed from above, booming and fervent like that of a typical Southern preacher. The voice spoke rapidly and was periodically answered by a group of voices which spoke in unison. Marla and her son listened closely. The chanting began to cease and everything fell quiet. The eerie silence was broken by the man's booming voice, angrily shouting in Marla's direction from high atop the ridge. Marla grabbed her son and ran all the way back down to the trailhead, fearing that whomever had gathered there had seen her and was warding her off. Like the others, she's never since been back to Lonesome Creek. Years after her experience with the chanting voices, Marla recounted a time her father and father-in-law had been part of something unexplainable when traveling the trail from the Kentucky side of Mount Mason. Though they followed a path that both had walked many times before, the two men became disoriented and got lost. Marla's father said that an anxious feeling washed over him and suddenly it was as if they simply were somewhere else entirely. They made it home unharmed in an amount of time they described as unusually short, but were never able to explain the event. It was later realized that they had somehow ended up on the other side of the state line on Mount Mason, way out there. This was not her only account of this phenomenon. Just two years after the incident her father described, two fish and wildlife officials showed up at her house in the middle of basically nowhere the men admitted that they had no clue where they were. They told Marla that they were trying to get to their destination on the neighbor state side, but somehow became lost and ended up on the Kentucky side. I find it unsettling that despite having maps and being otherwise very familiar with their territory, they ended up miles and miles off track. Marla noted that both were visibly shaken by the experience. As time has crept almost 20 years past, Marla has searched for answers to her experiences and those of her family, but has found few. The only presumption she's gleaned is that there have been unexplainable forces in these mountains since they were settled and probably long before. Appalachia is closely tied with various oddities and old traditions, both good and bad, benign covens of witches yet existent within unbroken bloodlines, wannabe satanic sects composed of lunatics who gain pleasure through the infliction of suffering, old secret societies once prominent but that have since died with the coal country's prosperous towns dotted across all of rural Appalachia. There is much to be uncovered and there's even more that should be altogether left alone. If you think about it for a moment, this sort of place really is a perfect hiding place for things of a darker nature an isolated mountain range with an ancient soul, wherein you can find whatever old secrets you might be looking for. My dilemma is whether or not trying to find them is a good idea. The things I've written are the only bits of information that Marla has given me relevant to the ill air at Lonesome Creek and Mount Mason. There's much more that she has shared with me regarding other areas in Arling and surrounding counties as well. I fully intend on going back to follow the stream of Lonesome Creek itself up the mountain and onto that ridge. I want to be fully prepared to investigate the secrets of the creepy old wagon trail where dark things surely take place. Interestingly enough, I have discovered that a wealthy old family in Arling owns the suspect property along the ridge. Maybe next time we will find the path to get there. Marla and I are supposed to meet in person 
so that I can write some of her stories down for good detail. I look forward to that. And I will continue to share with you whatever I'm able. So, a little background to set the mood, and this is all 100% true. I grew up in central New York, between Parrish and Mexico. You can look up Happy Valley and see just how creepy it is. Surrounded by woods, farms, fields, gravel pits, and swamps. I'm outside roughly 90% of my day. I do firewood, logging, farming, hunting, fishing, and trapping. I'm certainly used to the creepy shit in the woods, so much so that there's a predator light on my walking stick, which is a backwards-facing LED light. People deter tigers from leapfrogging on them by wearing masks on the back of their heads, but we only have fishers, coyotes, and the occasional wandering bear. So every night on the wood line, I have a pimp fire pit set up that I use pretty much every single night. It's not uncommon to see raccoons and foxes. We feed the birds and even have a huge turkey and deer feeder. My house is basically a safe haven. We constantly have critters running amok in the daytime and especially at night in the shadows. So you get used to the random ground leaf flutter, twig snapping, chittering critters in the forest nooks and crannies staring at you, wondering if you're going to eat that last hot dog. It can be unnerving, honestly. But then, there's my clicky buddy who always says goodnight to me. It began when I moved into a good buddy's house. He and I are very much alike. Hard-working outdoorsmen who hunt, trap, and collect firewood. I've recently gone through some changes in my life and I was lucky enough to move in with him, which is only four miles away from where I grew up. Every night, after working or running through a trap line, I'd work on my fire pit, which is in a clearing we made to store firewood right on the edge of the forest. I'd hear this clicking, like a slower version of the predator's clicks. The sound was kind of random at first, but then, I noticed it reacting to me moving. Grabbing a beer, click, click. Packing a pipe, click. Building up the fire or taking a leak, click, click. At first, it freaked me out, like to the point of carrying a bigger knife than I should. Some nights, a loaded 223. A couple of those wandering bears came within a quarter mile of my fire pit, so. I wear a headlamp. I have a lit lantern by me, a roaring fire, a machete, the walking stick, so I'm pretty comfy, even though I'm kind of crapping my pants as I yell at the darkness to come and get me. So when the fire dies down, no more smoke for the pipe or hot dogs for my belly, I'll start packing up my stuff and get ready to head inside. Click, click. I look around for eye shine. Nothing. I move closer to the woods, stray a little to reposition my headlamp casting shadows. Click. I've even clicked back, and it kind of responded to me a few times, but I could just be stoned out of my gourd. I mean, it's freaked me out so much a few times, I've literally built up the fire just to walk away. My fire pit is built for that kind of thing. I'm literally a pro at having fires. When I did, click, click. Now, we do have nocturnal flying squirrels here, and one trick the squirrels, all squirrels, do is that they'll hide on the opposite sides of trees as you pass by. You'll never see or hear them. You won't know that they're there. Unless a friend is walking 20 feet in the same direction and you're both looking up at the trees, the squirrels can't hide from both of you. But I don't think this is what I'm hearing. It would make sense since I can't see whatever's making the noise, but they tend to chitter more than click-click. 
So now it's been over a year or so of hearing this sound, and I'm nowhere closer to finding out what it is. I've come to accept it. I'll even leave some food at the edge of the woodline, beginning of a trail for it, which is usually where I relieve myself and then go back to the fire or inside. So almost every night, I'll hear the clicks, and I'll say goodnight back, or call its mom a dirty name. I mean, I don't speak click, who knows what I'm saying. But I click back anyway, and then I head inside. I suppose this isn't a scary story, it's just creepy, and I wanted to share it. My friend and I were hiking in Blue Ridge, Georgia. We were just going camping for one day, and the trail was part of the Appalachian Trail, near the very start of it. My friend told me a story about one of his friends, and said that he heard voices and footsteps at night near Blood Mountain. He said that he had to night hike because the noises were so intense. We found a campsite, and we set up shop. As it got darker, we got a bad feeling, like something was watching us. And then, it started. We saw a pair of red glowing eyes, about 100 to 150 feet away from our fire. Then, my friend goes to dunk his head in the creek near our tent and he explains that something pushed him into the water. His shirt was soaked, and he hit his nose on a rock and was bleeding. After that, we heard a woman's voice. He was speaking, but we couldn't really make out the words. We heard it in front of us, behind us, and to the left of us over the creek. It could have been a hiker, but to the left, there was no trail. And if it was somebody night hiking, they weren't using a flashlight. We also heard footsteps around us and sticks snapping. Finally, we just got in the tent and tried to sleep. My friend fell asleep before I did, and I heard twigs snapping right next to my head outside of the tent. That was pretty much our entire night, but it was very, very creepy. If you decide to go camping in Blue Ridge, just know there are things out there lurking in the night. It might seem stupid, but this sound has bugged me since the day I first heard it back in May. I could swear that I've never heard anything like this. I went with my dog in a pretty offhand natural reserve in Italy for a walk. This one is a particular reserve. It's not like a park. It's wild and no human activity is allowed, except for monitoring and hiking in specific days of the month. It's because it's the habitat of a very rare bird, but I can't remember which one. This means that I was basically alone with my dog. But still, it was a super sunny day, and the place isn't dangerous at all. No slopes, no hard paths, only a very big river. And if you avoid getting super close to it, you'll have no problems with it. Everything was great until lunch. While eating, out of nowhere, I started to hear this very strange noise coming from multiple directions in the woods. Now, it was super weird, since I've read all the info of the reserve, and it says that whenever they make monitoring operations, they deny access, and I was pretty sure that I was the only person there. This place only has one entrance, and it's totally surrounded by a swamp. 
There are no cars except for mine and not a soul out there. The closest structure is about 25 kilometers away from that place. My dog started to bark and became so nervous that I had to calm her down for a while. Something like this has never happened before. My dog, a lab, has heard many noises in the woods, even louder than this one, but has never gotten nervous. I'll try to explain what the sound was like. The best way I can describe it is that it was like a loud metallic bang, like when you hit a stick against a metallic can, immediately followed by the sound of an engine failing. Like when you try to start an old tractor and it won't. It occurred three or four times per minute and lasted about seven to eight seconds each time. The noise made my dog and I very uneasy. I don't know why. I'm used to hiking in the woods, even at night. And in my life, I've heard much scarier sounds, like thunder and lightning striking close to the ground, very close to my house. But this one was somehow dreadful. It made me and my dog freak out. So I decided to pack everything up, head back to the car, and leave the area as soon as possible. The noise never stopped. It continued to occur in the same way I described it. And there's another weird thing. It always sounded very close. No matter where I went or how far I parked my car, around an hour of hiking from the spot I first heard it, it always sounded like it was the same distance away, like it was following us, maintaining about 30 meters of distance. My dog calmed down and fell asleep only when we were in the car and halfway back home. I felt super tired too, as soon as I calmed down, and I barely managed the drive to my home, trying not to fall asleep the whole way. That evening, I had a massive headache and felt very off. So I immediately drifted to bed. In your opinion, what was that? I didn't cross anyone to ask them on the reserve or at the office, it was closed that day. Nobody has ever been able to tell me what produced that noise. Plus, as I said, the reserve is super close to a river and a swamp. Maybe those things are connected. What do you think? I live in a part of Alaska where there's nothing but woods all around. I'm the only person who lives in these woods for about 20 miles in all directions, so visitors are always a special event. This time, however, it was a creepy event. I decided to go camping in the woods about five miles away from my cabin because I was stressed out that week and needed to get away from it all. I found a nice clearing and set up camp before nightfall. These woods aren't very quiet. There are always birds chirping, the rustling of leaves, and bunnies and deer running about. It was about 7 o'clock p.m. when the first incident happened. I was listening to the wilderness outside of my tent while the fire was dying down outside. I had my pack strung up in a tree and had my 12-gauge shotgun unloaded to my right. All of a sudden, all the noises in the area stopped. But then, I heard what sounded like snow crunching. I thought it was just a deer. The only real predators in the area that I had known about were bears. But this was far too heavy to be a deer or a bear. It was circling my camp. All I could hear was the snow crunching underfoot. It sounded like it was a two-legged animal, slowly getting closer. It did this for hours. I had my 12-gauge ready, but only remembered it wasn't loaded when the animal was about seven feet away from my tent. I grabbed my box of buckshot and put the first shell in. Click. The footsteps stopped. Click, click, click. I kept straining to hear anything. 
but it never came. I fell asleep for a few hours, but woke up at about 2 a.m. My tent was open. My shotgun was right outside of my tent. I felt like I was being watched. All I could see were the stars in the pitch black nothingness, but two stars moved. I didn't know how to react. The two stars that moved were now coming closer. They were eyes. The animal had to have been nine feet tall. It kept coming closer. I could smell it now. It smelled like rotten meat and death. My shotgun was only a foot away from my hand. I carefully grabbed it. I prayed that it was still loaded and that this thing hadn't unloaded it. I pumped a shell into the chamber and took the shot. The light was almost blinding against the dark wilderness, but what I saw was worse. It was hairy, too hairy to be a human, too long to be a bear. Its feet were gigantic, and they were a darkish color. The face had no hair, but was the same color as the feet. The eyes were huge and were looking right at me. The mouth was wide open, and the teeth were long and yellow. The arms were long and hairy, just like the legs. Its height was about nine feet tall, like I said, maybe a few inches less. After the shot, I heard a scream that shook the tent and the ground around it. I hit the animal. I heard it run off into the wilderness, screaming all the way. I started packing right up in the pitch black night, looking up at the stars. Nothing moved this time though. As I was leaving the clearing in which I made my camp, I looked back and saw those same huge eyes shining in the darkness and they moved toward me. I ran through the woods, unsure of where I was going or what time it was. I could hear the leaves snapping behind me. And when I looked back, the eyes were there, but they were closer this time. I saw the lights of my house in the distance through the thick woods. I could still hear the snapping, but it was farther back this time. I made it home and locked my door. The paranoia almost made me pass out. I still felt like I was being watched, even though I closed all the curtains. The only window without curtains or blinds was a very small window that was above the kitchen sink. I was in the living room for about an hour. It was now 5.30 in the morning and the sun would be rising. I looked around the house, still paranoid. I saw the window above the sink in the kitchen, but there was nothing there. I felt relieved for a second until the eyes moved into place there, looking right at me. We made eye contact and I saw the first rays of sunlight come through the window. The animal grunted and stomped back into the forest, shaking the ground and cabin as it moved. I don't see it often anymore, but it does show up. Sometimes when I'm in the living room watching a movie, or making food in the kitchen, I see the eyes. It only comes at night, but it's there. I feel that we've come to an agreement. I stay away from the woods at night, and I don't get eaten. I'll update you if anything else happens, but it's been months since the first incident, and nothing drastic has happened yet. It hasn't shown up in the last few days, actually, but I'm sure it'll be back soon. Where I live, we have had relatively few vid cases. There were almost none at all back in the fall. Because of that, Although we were still living under certain restrictions, we had more public health sanctioned freedoms than many other places. For example, at the time, we were permitted to share our social bubble with one other household and travel within our region. 
My family and our fellow Bubble family decided to take advantage of this by going on a fall getaway. We rented two side-by-side -side cabins in a beautiful waterfront wooded area and had a lovely relaxing weekend. Although there were other cabins nearby, most were not occupied and we saw no other people, although we did hear a dog barking a few times somewhere not far off. On our final night there, my son decided to sleep in the other cabin with his bubble siblings. Around 11 p.m. he called over, asking for some forgotten thing. It was a very dark night, and there were certainly no street lights in the deeply wooded cabin area. So I grabbed my flashlight and walked the short distance to the neighboring cabin to deliver whatever it was that he needed. On the walk back, I heard a whistle. It was a very human sounding whistle, exactly the kind of whistle one makes to call in a dog. It sounded very close, but shining my light around, I saw nobody. I heard it again and assumed someone was whistling for the dog we'd heard earlier, so I didn't think much of it. A short time later, another call came from next door. My son couldn't settle and wanted to come back to our cabin. This time, my husband and I both walked over, collected our child and his stuff, said goodnight to our bubble family and walked back. We heard the same whistle again, several times. It seemed to be on the dirt road ahead of us, moving gradually away. My husband commented that the dog must have gotten loose and the owner was out looking for it. Inside our cabin, we continued to hear the whistling coming at irregular intervals of maybe two to four minutes. At first, it would be loud and seemed quite nearby. Then it would gradually grow fainter, then stop as though the whistler had moved out of earshot. Then it would seem to circle around, coming from the other direction, getting louder as it moved past our cabin, then fading again into the distance then it would start all over again. Still not thinking much of it, my husband climbed into the loft to go to sleep while I started to pack for the trip home the next day. Our son was sleeping in a little room on the main floor to the left of the front door and the small window in his room was cracked open to let in the unseasonably warm night air. I was standing by that window, quietly gathering his scattered things while the whistle once again drew closer. But this time, instead of fading as it passed by, the next one was very close and incredibly loud, as though the whistler was just outside my son's window. The blind was down, but I was sure someone was on the porch right outside. I leapt to the front door, flung it open and threw on the porch light, ready to tell off some prankster on our doorstep. Nobody was there. I grabbed my flashlight and took a few steps out past the circle of light, then thought better of it and retreated inside. I locked up the cabin, closed and latched all the windows and lowered all the blinds. If someone was creeping around outside our cabin, I didn't want them looking in at us from the darkness. Deciding that I did not want to leave my sleeping son downstairs by himself, I settled on the sofa with a book. The whistles continued. Between each one, I would convince myself it was just a bird or an animal, only to hear it again and be certain that it could only be a human sound. The irregularity of it and the slight variations in pitch and tone also told me that it wasn't something mechanical or electrical or automated. Around 1.30 in the morning, my husband suddenly got up and started to get dressed. I asked him what he was doing. I'm going to find out whoever that is and ask them why they've been whistling for hours, he said. I was horrified. My husband is a pretty big guy and I was as curious as he was but I also felt deep in my bones that it would not be safe for him to go outside that night. I insisted that he go back to bed 
and thankfully he did. I sat vigil, listening to the intermittent whistles for at least another hour, until finally I dozed off on the sofa. When I awoke, it was morning. The sun was peeking around the blinds, and the whistling had stopped. I cautiously peered outside, half expecting to see some sort of evidence of a nightmare intruder, but there was none. A little while later, we wandered next door, coffee mugs in hand, to get our friend's take on the mystery whistler. Amazingly, they had not heard a thing, despite the fact that the sound was so clearly audible in our cabin and would have had to have passed right by them. We couldn't understand how they hadn't heard it. At checkout, I asked the woman at the kiosk down the road about it, but she just looked at me strangely and said she didn't know what it could have been. When I got home, I searched for audios of bird calls common to the area, and then ones not common to the area, in the hope of finding that same whistle. Nothing I found was even close, and we still don't know what we heard that night, circling for hours and stopping just outside our cabin door. So this happened relatively recently. My friends and I were living at a cabin in Lake Tahoe in California. It was in May, so not snowing, but the nights got down to near freezing temperatures. We had gotten some firewood burning in the fireplace and the three of us were chilling around it. We were drinking scotch and had turned down all the lights all the way down in the cabin. The nearby houses were about 300 yards out and they had their lights down as well. We heard creaking on our roof for two to three seconds, which stopped. That was followed by what sounded like a bag or something mildly heavy dropping on the roof. Then it was followed by the scariest, heaviest rumble any of us had ever heard. The entire roof shook, but nothing else in the house did. So we knew it wasn't an earthquake. We almost felt like something broke the roof and was coming down the stairs to get us. We screamed and picked up the hot fire pokers and searched through the cabin, tapping walls and the attic area. We looked up the chimney for raccoons as they tend to hide there. Also, this wasn't the first night we had had the fire. If a raccoon mama was nesting, she would have fell through the chimney. We found nothing. We saw our neighboring house turn on their lights and they came out with searchlights. They had heard a similar sound. We all thought a bear had run from our roof to theirs, but it's unusual for a bear to do that. The neighbor's dog was quiet through it all. I checked that there was no way out from the chimney besides up. So if something was in there, it couldn't have escaped the roof without popping the lid, which was intact. We don't know what it was. For the next two nights, we had a fire up, nothing. Not sure what it was, and perhaps I'll never know. Growing up, I had a childhood friend that lived relatively close by. We were like two peas in a pod. We were both adventurous, believed in the paranormal, enjoyed astronomy, and generally just being outside. She was born in Alaska and her dad lived there for quite a while. So they were always into camping, hiking, fishing, skiing, you name it. It was with my friend's family that I got introduced to fishing and did a lot of camping. This happened during the mid to late 90s and we were maybe around 10 to 12 years old. It's been a while, so I can't remember exactly. One camping trip, we went to this lake in the forest that was surrounded by a meadow and feeding the lake was a small stream leading out of the woods. Anyway, 
We played in the meadow and stream all day while my friend's dad fished. The lake wasn't very big and because it had a meadow all around it, he could keep an eye on our whereabouts while he fished. While messing around by the stream, the wooded area it was coming from gave me weird vibes. Can't explain it, I just felt really uneasy. Anyway, the day faded away into early evening and it was time to leave and find a camping spot. My friend's dad picked up his fishing gear and we all walked back to the truck on this long winding path through the woods. Once in the truck, we drove into a more remote area of the forest and made our way up this steep road that was so rough and at such an incline that I was convinced my friend's dad was going to break his truck. He had a four, maybe six cylinder Toyota pickup that was about as basic as a truck could get. In fact, I'm not even sure if the truck had four wheel drive, but being an Alaskan outdoorsman with years of experience, I trusted him. We finally made it up to the top, which was flat and relatively open, with a big area of forest in the opposite direction from the road we drove up. We pitched our tents, got everything set up, and my friend and I decided to go explore the area. We were maybe 50 yards from the tent when we heard a big crack as a tree branch snapped in the woods behind us. We got quiet and looked in that direction, but didn't see anything. Thinking it was just a deer, we brushed it off. As we were walking, we heard it again and whispered to one another about what it could be, but kept going. It stopped briefly, and when we were about 200 yards from our camp, we sat on a boulder looking down the steep wooded hill overlooking the dirt road from where we'd come. Suddenly, we heard another cracking branch from behind. Whatever it was seemed to be following us. Our imaginations going wild, we came up with everything from a serial killer stalking us in the woods to deer to Bigfoot. When we got back to the campsite, we told her dad what we had heard and how it seemed to be paralleling us. He kind of played it off as a black bear and secured all the food. Later on, my friend confided in me that her dad had gotten out his pistol and would be sleeping with it that night. My friend and I were sharing one tent and he was in his own tent not far from us, so we figured everything would be okay. I awoke some time in the middle of the night to hear something or someone walking outside. As I lay still, listening, I could hear it quietly circling the tent. It sounded like it was walking on two legs because it had a distinct rhythm in how it walked. Whatever it was sounded big as I could hear its weight, if that makes sense, as it put each foot down and walked. I could even hear relatively quiet, but deep, heavy breathing at times. As I lay there, listening, I could hear it wandering to the other parts of the campsite and then back to our tent, almost as if it was walking in a big, repetitive loop. This went on for who knows how long. It felt like an eternity. Terrified and unable to wake my friend, I lay there and listened until eventually I fell asleep. The next morning, I told my friend and her dad about it, but I don't know if they believed me or not. Interestingly, absolutely nothing in the camp was disturbed in any way. The ground was not very soft and in some places was covered in grass, so there were no footprints either. This is something that I have never been able to explain, and to this day, it lingers in the back of my mind whenever I camp. I always wonder what it was that walked around our tent all night. This incident happened in 1963 in BC. I was 22 and on my honeymoon when I saw a creature, what I would later call a Bigfoot. I saw it in the clear light of day, free of any obstruction, and I have thought about it every day since. 
My husband and I were camping in the Broken Islands. It was early June, and the weather was beautiful. It was about seven in the evening, and I walked to the edge of the water and began to wade out. The water came up to just below my shorts. I stood there and admired the beauty. The sun had not started to set yet, and there was a peaceful stillness at that moment. My husband was asleep in the tent, and I thought to wake him so we could cook dinner together. I turned back toward the beach, and it was standing there, motionless. I didn't hear it make a sound. The beachhead was gravel, and rocks that crunched and clicked as we moved around were everywhere, but I didn't hear this thing at all. I couldn't understand what I was looking at and just stood, frozen. My eyes were going all over its body, trying to comprehend. I thought it was a naked man at first. It was taller than me by a wide margin. I was five foot eight and this probably was over a foot taller. It was lean and lanky, like a basketball player. It hunched at the shoulders had long arms that hung at its sides in a non-threatening manner. It had long fingers with black nails. It stood with its legs close together and had long feet, just like its hands and fingers. It had a round head and the face looked like a person, but different. Something was off. The body was covered in a brownish hair, but its body outline was still visible the hair stuck up like an orangutan. The skin on the hands, feet, and face was visible and grayish, dusty and ashy looking. Its eyes were black and I couldn't see any other color. We just stood there looking at each other. I was stunned and it was indifferent. He never looked away, but he had an expression of indifference. I said, hello. In a broken half whisper, I couldn't think of what else to do. He smiled at me. His lips peeled back, revealing large teeth like a horse's. They looked too big and square for the mouth. When I looked at it in the face, the eyes at that moment, I realized that this was not a person. It was like a person, but it was something different. A wave of nausea overtook me. I began to vomit and felt faint. The world started to spin. I moved toward the shore and fell on my hands and knees. I heaved with such force into the dirt. The spinning stopped and I sat up. He was gone. I was there on my knees and just kept replaying the incident in my head for I don't know how long. I stripped off my clothes and cleaned myself in the water. The sun was beginning to set and I got dressed and lay next to my husband. I don't remember sleeping, just fever, chills and dizziness. We left the next day. I never told my husband what I saw. We split up five years later. I live in Texas. I've remarried, had children, grandchildren, gotten divorced again and remarried again. I never told a soul about what I saw. I would go to the library and look for books about monsters, trying to understand what it was, that thing I saw. Bigfoot became popular in the late 60s and 70s. I saw the infamous PGF footage. That's not like what I saw. What I stood staring at, what changed me forever, was something else. I came from a typical Texas, all-American family. I wasn't supposed to see this. Now I'm someone with a secret, something I could never talk about in my real life. My interest in this subject has been a complete secret. No one who knows me would ever guess. I have never said this out loud, but in 1963, I saw a Bigfoot. I'm a scout leader in Ireland. 
and my friend group are all outdoorsy people, so I've done my fair share of outdoor adventures. One time, we were away, camping down on a site in Roscommon. There were about four of us in a dome tent that night, and each one of us heard rustling and moving around outside our tent during the night. We were all scared shitless and didn't mention it to each other, until the next morning over breakfast with the others from our group. It wasn't until then that the two others in the other tents spoke up about hearing rustling right outside of their tents as well, and something rubbing along their tent wall. Well, we were all convinced that it had to be a wild animal, since there were no other people on our site. We had two nights left. It wasn't our first or our last time there. We've stayed there roughly around 15 times, give or take. And while I believe there are wild deer around, I've never seen them in person. Not once. There are always people down there on the site where we stay. So surely, wild animals would stay clear of that area and wouldn't come right up to the tent walls, right? Another time, while wild camping near Glindalo, several of us in a tent woke up several times to the sound of the zipper on our tent door. It wasn't just a small zipper noise. It was as if the exterior door were being fully zipped open or closed. There were two tents, so two groups, but we all decided to kip in together because of how cold it was. So it was nobody from our group joking with us. It could easily have been another group, but while wild camping, the chances of another person or group being close to you are slim. Once we looked around and knew that the door, to our knowledge, hadn't been zipped, and that we weren't in immediate danger, we chose to ignore it. It happened a few times that night. You kind of learn, while camping, to ignore weird noises and movements outdoors. Most nights spent camping, you don't get much sleep, really. You're always conscious of being in the wilderness, and so exposed. It might not be the creepiest of stories. Most of our weird camping or hiking experiences have happened abroad, to be fair. But all the same, it still hasn't put us off camping or being outdoors. Even if we can't be sure what's out there. So, I was a wildland firefighter back in the day, in Arizona. I worked in a forest that was generally popular with a lot of recreation in the northern portion, but I worked in the southern portion of the forest, which was really remote. It barely had any roads or campgrounds, so if you wanted to recreate there, you had to work for it. The fire crew I was on only had two duty stations, one in a small town where the rest of the forest employees worked out of, and one that was about two and a half hours away up a really windy mountainous road. The remote duty station had an old forest service ranger station and a newer double wide trailer that was recently put in. When I worked at this place, it had no cell reception. When my crew and I weren't working, we were playing horseshoes and watching movies. They did eventually add a cell phone booster, which sadly just made people play on their phones, but I digress. So as for the creepy story, I wanna keep it pretty simple, but my supervisor from that crew had experienced some odd things working up there as well. There was one night that he told me he was cowboy camping, which, if you don't know, means sleeping outside without a tent. 
and he kept getting a weird mucusy drop of liquid on his face. He kept looking around, even yelling, but nobody was there. He told me that he wasn't below any trees, so he's sure that it wasn't sap. He never slept outside there ever again, which leads me to believe he was telling me the truth. As for my story, I have had other interesting experiences at that remote duty station, but this one was scary. It was the night of July 4th and we weren't on a fire, so the crew was playing horseshoes and having a good time. Everyone went to bed pretty early because we were going to have a PT hike the next day. I had my own small room in the double wide trailer and my bed was situated next to a big window. I started dozing off, but felt awake still. That's when I hear one of my coworkers outside my window asking me to come outside. I was laying on my side facing the window and I didn't look up, but I felt their presence there. It felt as though something tall was looming over me from outside. They kept beckoning me and I said no. Pretty quickly, their voice began to change to a deeper, raspier, angrier voice. They started cursing at me. Get the F outside. I just froze. It was sort of a demonic voice, not my coworkers anymore. I lay frozen, not moving while they yelled at me. Eventually, it stopped and I fell asleep. I woke up the next day and I wanted to ask my coworker if he was standing outside my window, but it felt a little bit too weird. Perhaps this was a mild form of sleep paralysis, but whatever it was, it was really creepy. This took place in a small city in Alaska where I grew up. One night, at approximately 12 a.m. to 2 a.m., I was lying awake. I'm a very light sleeper, and I often have trouble falling asleep. At about that time, I started hearing what sounded like an obnoxious mix of possibly a clarinet or a trumpet playing loud screeches. No harmony, just squeaks and honks in the cold night air. I sat for a while on my bed, I couldn't sleep. It was loud enough for me to hear inside. I went out the front door and stood on the porch and just listened. It sounded like whoever was playing it was a few blocks away, but at the same time, it was as though you could hear it in every direction. It was autumn and very cold at the time. I was so frustrated by the screeching in the late hour that I actually yelled out, Shut up, thinking it was a kid playing a prank. About a year or two later, when I had nearly forgotten about it, I heard the sound again, this time in the daytime in the winter air. It lasted for a few hours and then quit. It wasn't until probably five years after this that I watched a video on YouTube called Trumpets in the Sky about people around the world hearing the exact same noises and not being able to find any explanation for them. It literally gave me the chills. But now it has me wondering, has anyone else experienced the same thing? I live in northern Alabama. I was out rock hounding solo today to a place that my husband and I have gone before. Everything seemed normal when I arrived. It's a very secluded area of the creek 
with a rock bar in the middle of the creek and with a small patch of woods to the left and a dense forest on the right. I crossed the creek and set up my gear on the rock bar, grabbed a bag and started walking up the creek. About 45 minutes in, I kept looking up at the forest. I don't know why, but I just kept getting an eerie feeling. Every now and then, I'd hear a couple of thumps out there, but you know, nature, so I didn't think anything of it. About an hour in, I heard my first meow. I was so focused on pulling clay that I literally stood up and was like, I did not just hear a cat meow, did I? 10 minutes go by and I'm walking farther up the creek and damn it if I didn't hear it again. I stopped and was like, yep, I just heard a cat meow. How strange. Something really did seem off though, and I started to feel uneasy, so much so that I turned around and headed back to my sight. Something about the meow just wasn't right. Wasn't a painful meow, but just a matter of fact meow, if that makes sense. About five minutes into the trek back, I definitely heard a cat meow. I'm sweating like crazy because of the heat, but instantly I feel cold, clammy, and the hair is standing up on the back of my neck. I know what I was supposed to be hearing, a single meow, but it wasn't coming from a cat. It sounded like someone or something was imitating a cat. I keep focused on getting back to my sight and about five minutes later, I hear another single meow. Here's where I realize that things are getting really strange. The meow always sounded the exact same distance from me, no matter how far I kept walking. I finally reached my site and pulled out my drinks and plopped down to rehydrate. That's when another meow sounded, and this time, I knew with everything in me that it was not a cat that was following me. I calmly gathered up my gear and started to trek across the creek to the path to my car. There was another long meow. I made my way across the creek and hunched down in a pit. I parked my car right next to the edge of the forest and I was really starting to lose my mind. I get my keys and mace out and I put my gear on me so that I can dive into my car and rearrange later. And that's exactly what I did. I nearly crapped myself finding the courage to make it to my car, but I did and I hightailed it out of there, fast. I know that the rational answer is that somebody was out there messing with me, but how did they get back there and why? It's like 200 acres of forest. People don't go back there all that often. I'd have to believe that somebody went back there, sat around and waited for somebody to mess with. And how did they follow me without me hearing a crunch or anything? To this day, I can't explain what in the world happened that day, but something was off. All during my childhood, up until recently, I had thought that ghouls were just spooky, imaginative, scary monsters that would come out on Halloween night. But now, I know differently. I now believe they are synonymous with the creatures we know as crawlers. In Arabic folklore, the ghoul is said to dwell in cemeteries and other uninhabited places. Some say that a ghoul is a desert-dwelling, shape-shifting demon that can assume the guise of an animal. It lures unwary people into the desert or into abandoned places to slay and devour them. The creature also preys on young children, drinks blood, steals coins, and eats the dead. It can also take the form of a human 
It is a particularly monstrous character, believed to inhabit the wilderness of Afghanistan and Iran. The Galu demons were known to be part of the underworld and were thought to carry their victims off to the land of the dead to devour them. People who traveled near cemeteries and abandoned buildings or through desert wastelands were warned to be especially vigilant against these creatures. They were thought to be bipedal, though with a hunched form, and were known to crawl and sometimes run on all four limbs like an animal. I knew there was a reason why I kept warning people to stay away from the forests and surrounding areas. Since we have fewer deserts in the United States, these creatures are frequently encountered in wooded areas in addition to cemeteries. After years of research, I've come to the conclusion that crawlers are actually demons, interdimensional demons. The late great father Malachi Martin, in his book Hostage to the Devil, stated, quote, There is a dimension that is devoid of love and compassion, all the qualities that make us human, end quote. I believe it is from that dimension which these demon crawlers come. People from the Middle East are far more familiar with the ghouls. They are able to shapeshift and spend time in cemeteries as they feed off the flesh of the dead. Like I said, I used to think these were just stories, meant for Halloween and scaring kids. But the more research I do, the more I believe they're real. And I think we all ought to be vigilant. A few months ago, I read a terrifying post about something that happened in the backwoods in Canyon Lake, Texas. I had commented that I nearly threw my phone because I used to live there for a few years. I truly don't know where to begin this story. I moved there my junior year of high school. My family's house was built from the ground up on the south side of the lake. My parents didn't know that this was the side of the lake that most people avoided. I don't mean to be offensive, it's just most of the people that I knew lived on the north side. I never really understood why, until the event started happening. The house was finished the summer going into my junior year. When we officially moved in, things were great. A few months into me beginning school is when things turned incredibly dark. It all began when my dad put his guitar in our family room by the fireplace. I would come home and something would string the guitar strings so violently it sounded as if somebody had knocked it over. I began waking up to my dad being completely weirded out because all of our cabinet doors and the doors on the first floor would be open. It escalated dramatically from here. We would hear something in the woods just outside of the porch lights continually. First, we thought it was an injured animal, but dead deer and other wildlife would appear on our property every few weeks. Then we began to see inhuman things. Guests would see something walking in the hallways, opening drawers, and would see a girl in our guest house. My dad constantly hosted events and parties, including his ex-military friends. They would ask us why we were coming to their rooms at night and opening the drawers and closets and then walking out. My dad didn't believe me until his friends began commenting on figures and people in the house. The worst night was when all the doors began opening and slamming and it sounded as if somebody was walking up and down the stairs, going into every room, opening and closing the doors. I could go on and on about the things I saw in that house. It was one of the scariest times of my life. All in all, don't go to Canyon Lake.
About a year and a half ago, my girlfriend and I went down to Ohio Pile State Park. We frequent there as we live an hour away and it's one of the best parks within a day's trip for us to hike and swim, mushroom hunt and explore in general. So one day we got bored of the normal hiking areas and places that we had already been. So we decided to drive around the back roads, deeper into the woods of the park. No map, just deciding which way to turn when we got to intersections and going from there. We pass a random old cemetery. It couldn't have been a mile or more down the road when we noticed a more dirt-like road, kind of dilapidated, with a chain in front of it so cars couldn't go in. We decided to park the car and go explore the trail in general. There were no signs for no trespassing or anything like that, so we continued on. I'll never forget the eerie feeling I had as soon as we made it onto the trail or road. Just a general sense of, you shouldn't be here. But I don't listen to that feeling. My girlfriend seems intrigued. There's no one at all around and it seems like a beautiful secluded area. We head back some more and we notice that up a cutoff was an abandoned visitor center. So obviously we had to go check it out. This is when things started to get really creepy. We were about a hundred feet away from the building when that alarm in my head that said, you shouldn't be here, intensified immensely. But I was curious about the building still and my girlfriend at this time is freaking out internally. She wants to leave and she feels uneasy and unwelcome. I want to explore the building because I love abandoned places. In the amount of time it took us to cover that 100 feet, I noticed that the woods had gone completely silent. There were no bugs anymore, no birds, not even the sound of branches swaying in the wind. We get up to the building and my girlfriend is pleading that we go back. I said, let's just take a step in and then we can go. I'm approaching the stairs to the door from the left side and no joke, straight out of a cheesy horror movie, a bird out of nowhere flies into the window of the building. Not five seconds later, I heard what sounded like either a log or a very large branch cracking on the other side of the building. I'd like to clarify that there was no way it was a small branch or twig. It sounded almost like a tree breaking directly on the other side of the building. I pulled out my pistol and walked quickly backwards facing the building and I told my girlfriend to walk as quickly and as quietly as she could back to the car. We hopped in and left as quickly as the car would go and drive. I'm still not entirely sure what happened. I know that black bears do reportedly live in the area, though you don't see them too often and I've never seen one there. But like I said, I suppose it's a possibility, although it doesn't really explain the bird. The second possibility that comes to mind is that it was another human. But the thing that broke didn't sound like a human walking over a branch and breaking it. Like I said, it sounded like a tree snapping when it starts to fall. I've recently gotten into Appalachian folklore and stories, and I've been reading about Wendigos, skinwalkers, crawlers, and such. So for my question, I'm wondering if anybody has ever had a similar experience in Pennsylvania or in general, and if so, what happened? And what do you think it could have been? My girlfriend and I could never figure out why we felt so afraid. Like I said, it could have been an animal and the bird could have been a coincidence, but we both felt an overwhelming feeling like we shouldn't be there. And it still gives me goosebumps. I live in Northeastern America in a pretty rural place with lots of hills, not too many neighbors and a lot of forest. Just tonight, 
I was headed with my mother down our backyard, which is large and relatively clear for about a hundred feet. Then it switches to woods. We got to about 30 feet before the woods and I caught sight of some eyes reflecting in my headlamp. They were a good 50 to 100 feet away and I assumed that they belonged to deer. But a few things convinced me that they might not be. Around where I live, deer will run away if you make enough noise. And we were talking pretty loudly, but the eyes weren't moving. They kept staring directly at us, which is incredibly unlike deer in this area. On top of that, the pair of eyes on the right were very low to the ground and very wide set, too far apart to be deer considering the distance. We stood for a minute remarking on them and neither pair of eyes looked away. So since we were spooked, we headed back up to the house, got my brother and a machete and a bat and a metal pole. I know, a little overkill, but our area has been a little scary lately. We headed back down. I expected the eyes to be gone by that point. I mean, that's how these things usually go, right? But no, they were still there in slightly different spots than they had been, but not much farther from where they'd been previously. They stared just as steadily as they had before. So we retreated back inside. The logical answer is deer, but the lack of running away, intent staring, and wide set eyes feel like that option is ruled out. Another thought is wild dogs, but we don't really have those in our area. It's possible it could have been a black bear, but those are notoriously scared of people. If anyone has thoughts on what this might have been, let me know. Edit. As an update, just to provide more information. There were no visible signs of anything in the area as far as I could tell. The next day I looked for marks on the trees from climbing and saw none. There's a good amount of greenery covering the ground, so it's difficult to look for scat. But there were no signs of any animals having lied down on the ground. We've still been unable to find any evidence that it was something natural. A few years ago, in the northern part of Sweden, I'm going out for a nice evening of fishing. I'm what I guess is called a fishing supervisor. I check that the other fishermen got their licenses, and I do this at a certain area of lakes and streams. This was in late summer, and I had just been doing my rounds, which I usually end by going to a small lake and fly fishing for some trout. This lake or pond is pretty deep in the forest and I rarely see other people out there. In fact, I don't think I've ever seen someone else out there. This lake looks kind of like a crater. It's a perfectly round circle, perhaps 100 meters in diameter, and it contains a natural population of perch and trout. It was a warm summer evening with a slight breeze. The birds were chirping and the fish were rising to inspect the spawning insects on the surface. I rig my gear and aim for one of the fish, rising to the right in front of me. At the moment that my fly lands on the surface, it's like somebody pressed the pause button on time. The sun hides behind a cloud. The wind stops blowing. The birds are suddenly silent and the fish stops eating. A smell rises from the ground that I'm standing on. It smells like something dead, something rotten, almost as though I had a carcass buried under my feet. All of a sudden, I'm aware that there's something walking out of the forest behind me, maybe 10 to 15 meters away. It's like I can see it out of the corner of my eye, but still can't see it at the same time. Every hair on my body is on end, 
and suddenly it's very cold all around me. The thing watching me just stands there, and I don't have the courage to turn around at all. I see my fly sink to the bottom, but I can't move. I can't do anything about it, because I don't dare to move. Then the wind hits me, and it carries the awful smell away. The sun hits me again, a bird is singing somewhere in the forest, and the almost overwhelming feeling of being watched lets go of me. I turn around, and there's nothing there. On the lake, the fish start rising again. I packed my gear and threw the backpack on my back and ran for it. I ran through the forest to my car. I hit the gas and I drove like a maniac until I found the big road and civilization once more. I pulled over to the side of the road and just said to myself, what the heck was that? My heart was still racing. I haven't visited the lake since this happened and I don't know anybody else who has either so I'm not sure if anybody else has experienced something similar. I've probably visited this place 20 times or more before this happened, and nothing like that had ever happened. The only thing I'm ever really afraid of out there is bears. I do fish at a lot of ponds and lakes that are pretty deep in the forest. There's always a lot of wildlife in these places. Deer, moose, foxes, and the occasional wolf or bobcat and maybe a bear. I've never been afraid of meeting anybody or any scary person. In fact, other than being cautious about wildlife, I have never really been afraid of anything, except when visiting this particular lake from that point on. I like to look out for new, out-of-the-way fishing holes. If I'm on a trip and have my gear, I'll pull up a map, look at the different connecting waterways, and try to find back roads that may lead to spots that few people know about. On one trip, about 10 years ago, I'm in western Pennsylvania, and I'm looking for a road to connect me with this small and out-of-the-way stream that I had found on the map. I'm in the country, it's not too desolate, but houses are definitely getting farther and farther apart and looking more and more beat up. I surmise that I'm really close to where this stream is supposed to be, so I turn down a dirt road that leads toward a tree line in the direction that I believe the stream is located. The road starts out in okay shape, but as soon as I pass into the tree line, stuff gets weird. It's mid-afternoon, but the canopy of the trees is so thick that it suddenly looks like dusk. Then the road very quickly deteriorates, starts to close in, and then starts to vanish. There are banks on either side of me, so I figure I'm on some sort of old logging road that rarely, if ever, gets vehicles on it anymore. The road is getting worse and worse. Large rocks start appearing at random places in the road, first sporadically, and then more frequently. It's very unnatural looking. It almost looks like they were placed there on purpose. My car is four-wheel drive, but I'm getting a little worried because the rocks are getting larger. Combined with this is how tight the road is now. Driving around them starts to get a little sketchy. I'm now driving very slowly so I don't pop a tire or make a wrong move and get stuck on the bank or something. The road suddenly takes a very sharp left hand and downward turn. I creep along this turn, but I stop as I see the road continuing down on this weird trajectory. At this moment, my gut starts talking to me and telling me to turn around, but it's also at this point that I realize I can't. The road is not wide enough to do a three-point turn. I could chance it, but 
If I didn't want to get my front end caught on something that might be pushing over the bank or my back end going off the back in the other direction and getting stuck, I just couldn't do it. I say to myself, keep pushing forward and you're bound to just get enough room to turn around shortly. As I make my way driving this weird downward road with sharp curves and oddly placed rocks, I start to see items off to the sides of the road. At first, it's just garbage. Bottles, boxes, wrappers. Then I start seeing toys. Kids' toys. Lots of them. Like, an uncomfortable amount. Then I start seeing clothes. Some look old and weathered like they've been there for years, and some look fairly new. The amount of clothing I'm seeing also increases. Then I start seeing mattresses. Not like one random mattress. Lots of them. All over the place, and there are dirty and dark stains on them. My gut is now screaming at me to get out of there, but I still don't have room to turn around. While I'm sitting there and trying to figure out what my next move is, I get the distinct feeling that I'm being watched. The moment that feeling hits me, I audibly yell at myself, nope. Then I slam the car in reverse and drive reverse dodging all of the random rocks all of the way back up and out. I do this until the path levels out again. I was in full F this mode, and I just risk making the three-point turn. My back end goes slightly off the bank, and I slam back into drive and pound the gas to throw myself back onto the road and out of whatever dark woods bullshit I had discovered. I have no clue what I happened across that day. Best case scenario was probably some deep woods meth den. Worst case? I don't even want to think about it. All I know is ever since then, no matter what I'm doing, the moment my gut starts to tell me to get out, I get out. I was off-roading with some buddies back home in eastern New Brunswick, on the Bay of Fundy. There's this trail we go on that ends on the water, and it's at the site of an old ammunition depot from World War II. We've been here many times during the day, and sometimes at night. You can drive into and through this massive old structure, and up the hill is the admin building for this site. It's pretty far into the woods. At the very top of that hill are some grave markers from hundreds of years ago. We were told that they were old private graves. We live on the coast, not at all something that I would doubt being a real thing. We were in there one night in the big building having a fire, and we all saw and heard something quite large scramble up the side of the building and then start running on top of it. Now, there are a dozen of us there, so it's clearly not just one person seeing something crazy. There is nothing in the woods of Eastern Canada that should be able to climb as quickly as what we saw. A black bear? Maybe. But this thing basically ran up the side of a four-story tall structure and then ran across the top of it in moments. Needless to say, we got in our trucks and hightailed it out of there. On another occasion, we were exploring the admin building, which is three stories tall. It's concrete and it's been abandoned since World War II. We go all the way to the top. Nothing weird happens. But as we're coming back, we notice something weird on the second floor. An entire room is filled with lit candles, but there's nobody around whatsoever. We ran out of there so fast. This one, I will admit, could have been an elaborate prank, since lots of people would go and mess around there since it was a fun off-road trail with some history. But the thing that climbed up the building? 
To this day, that still mystifies me. This story happened to me in the backwoods. It's not paranormal, but that doesn't make it any less terrifying. I work in forestry, and I had a bear that was clearly not afraid of me and did not want to leave me alone. I pulled into our campsite at around 1 a.m. with the truck and trailer, and it's just me out there. I've got to set up two generators, one for the trailer so I don't freeze to death, and one to keep the equipment that we use warm so we can actually use it in the morning and the batteries don't die. I also got there late because I was having truck problems. I had no idea what the cause of them was. It kept dying and then it would be fine, repeating this process over and over. I set up the generator for the trailer and as I was getting the second one out of the truck, I hear a branch snap loudly. I stop and listen, and I can hear more branches snapping and some rustling in the trees. About 50 meters away into the trees, this noise keeps happening, and it's getting closer. I thought it was a person at first, so I yelled, who's there, and got no reply. The noises come right up to the edge of the clearing I'm in, a circle maybe 40 meters across and then they stop. I know whoever it is is just sitting there watching me. After about 15 seconds of me listening hard, half in the truck, I see two eyes appear, and then they rise up to about six feet in the air. I could tell it was a bear by the way it moved, which was actually a relief, because for one, it meant that it wasn't a skinwalker, and two, because I knew that there were only black bears around there and no grizzlies. But I didn't have anything to really defend myself with. No bear spray or gun or bear bangers, anything like that. I yelled at the bear. Nothing. I hopped in the truck and pulled the air horn out. It didn't even move. I slowly walked over to the trailer, which was still hooked up to the truck, and grabbed a pot and pan and just started smashing them together at it while yelling. It still didn't move at all. It just stood there, staring at me. It wasn't making any noises either. No huffing or pawing at the ground like I knew bears do if they get upset. But that didn't exactly put my mind at ease, considering that this thing was clearly not afraid of me. Eventually, after about 15 minutes of making loud noises and it doing nothing but staring at me, it finally dropped to the ground, turned around, and started to walk away. I waited for about five minutes since I still had to set up the second generator, which I had to bring closer to the bear. Picture a triangle. I was at one corner, the bear was at another, and where I needed to bring the generator was at the third. Right as I pulled the generator out of the truck, I hear branches snapping again, and it's coming back. It came back to the edge of the clearing and did the exact same thing. Stood there, staring at me, and wouldn't leave with all the noise I was making. Again, after another 15 minutes of it sitting there, motionless, it left again, and I quietly dragged the generator out, started it, ran back to the other generator, started that one, got in the trailer and shut the door and watched out the window for a while at where it kept coming back to. It never showed up again. Maybe it did after I went to bed, but there was no sign of it in the morning. I know it's not the most insane thing that's ever happened to anybody, but it was intensely disturbing knowing that this thing could easily kill me and wasn't afraid of me and didn't want to leave. It remained so perfectly still, staring at me for such a long time, and I couldn't do anything about it because I had half set up the trailer already and I couldn't leave quickly. Even if I could, there was no guarantee my truck would even start, and I still had a job to do, 
that required me leaving the probably illusionary safety of the truck and go closer to the bear in a way that would mean that if it decided I was worth the trouble, it could get to me faster than I could get back into the truck. I've had other experiences. I had a grizzly charge my truck down at top speed up north, then decided halfway to me that I was a lot bigger than it was and wasn't worth it. Everybody knows bears are fast, but there's a difference between reading the number 50 kilometers per hour or even seeing a video and seeing it in person. An animal that big has no right to move that quickly. It just seems unnatural. I've also heard plenty of very odd noises at night, and the feeling of being watched at night is nearly constant. I stay overnight way in the middle of nowhere alone on a regular basis for my job, and it's very easy to psych yourself out, late at night, alone, with no way to contact anyone except for unreliable GPS text messaging and hours from anything resembling civilization. I've been doing this for years and I'm still not used to it. I've definitely encountered a skinwalker or something like it once, but that's another story for another time and was before I started this job. Anyway, that's my bear that wouldn't leave me alone story. Hope you enjoyed it. For some background, I'm 23 and I have lived in the country all my life, growing up on the east side of Lake Winnipeg and moving to the west side as a teenager. This story takes place when I was 17 and it's true. A few years after my family moved, I started dating my boyfriend at the time. I lived within the small town, but my boyfriend lived about 15 minutes out, surrounded by woods. His only neighbor was about a mile down. I'm using miles because country roads here are done in mile sections, not kilometers. On a September night, I was at his house watching movies and things like that. I wanted to go out for a cigarette at about 2 a.m. He said he didn't want one, but for some reason, I felt scared to go outside by myself, probably because I was really tired and kind of out of it. So I made him come out with me anyway. We go out onto the front deck in the dark. He's looking at his phone. I'm smoking and enjoying that crisp fall air. Then I heard this distant cry come from the direction of the neighbor's house. It kind of sounded like it could be a dog or a coyote. I asked my boyfriend what he thought it was, to which he replied he thought it was the neighbor's dog. We were both leaning against the house, listening to it and we noticed that it was slowly getting louder, as though it was getting closer. Then it changed in pitch and tone dramatically and became guttural. It sounded something like a human screeching for their life, but it definitely wasn't human. The type of scream that just immediately makes you feel sick to your stomach and terrified. My blood turned to ice the back of my neck was prickling and we both just froze. We were just staring at each other, looking around and then back to each other, but our feet would move. I don't think I can even fully explain what it sounded like. Again, I've lived in the country all my life. This didn't sound like any wildlife that I have ever heard of. I know people's first response is that cougars and coyotes and foxes can sound like people, but I know firsthand what those calls sound like, and this wasn't that. We listened to that awful sound getting closer and louder for probably two minutes before my boyfriend grabbed my arm and rushed inside. We never lock our doors where I'm from, but damn, did we lock every door and window in the house that night. We jumped into bed, freaking out, trying to make sense of what the heck that was. And we could still somewhat hear it, even from where we were inside. We laid there silently for about 10 minutes. And then out of nowhere, it just stopped. 
obviously we didn't sleep much. The next day we drove past the neighbor's house and dog was fine, just chilling in the driveway. Nothing was out of the ordinary and it never happened again. To this day, that sound freaks me out. My friends and I are on our way from Chicago back to our home in Evansville, Indiana. As such, we have to drive through the Midwestern country to get there. Pitch black highways surrounded by trees and cornfields. About four hours away from home, my friend screams and I look up. We hit a deer going 50. The poor guy bounced off the front end and was probably dead on impact. We come to a stop and commiserate, call our parents, etc. We're stranded on a quiet highway in the middle of nowhere, trees to our right and a few houses a bit far off to our left, all surrounded by cornfields, of course. My friend is standing outside surveying the damage when we hear a scream, a man's scream, a bit far off to our left. My other friend and I look at each other, wide-eyed. A few minutes pass and we hear one again. I make a joke about skinwalkers and my friend gets back in the car. A bit later, after calling 911, we heard another scream, a woman this time, and it seemed closer. We're waiting on the deputy and nervously joking about whether it's skinwalkers or just crazy woodland people. And my friend facing the trees suddenly laughs nervously and rolls up the window. She goes, I just heard clicking noises outside my window and I'm rolling it up because I'm not going to pretend like I just didn't hear that. I know that clicking noises are often a thing with skinwalker stories and things like that. We're not really sure what happened. We think maybe something was trying to lure us out into the woods, but we didn't go, obviously. Obviously we survived too, but I don't think any of us are going to forget that experience anytime soon. This event occurred in early fall of 1971 or 1972. I'm not sure what jogged this memory, but it's probably something to do with reading a lot of off-the-grid weirdness on Reddit. Also, some of the details are a bit gray, but the gist of the story begins here. I grew up in the Philly suburbs. The Boy Scouts were popular then, and I was quite active, especially with camping. One of the go-to areas was the New Jersey Pine Barrens, especially along the Wading River and Bass River State Forest. Our patrol was on a weekend camping trip at the South Shore Campground. Lots of pine breaks, but even more swamps and bogs and boggy swamps and other things that were similar to swamps and bogs. Our patrol, probably seven of us plus one guy's dad who drove us, was assigned a three-sided shelter. The front of the shelter opened to you guessed it, the swamp. If you walked 11 feet from the front of the shelter, you'd be standing ankle deep in water. Then it just got deeper and darker and boggier from there. We mucked about on Saturday until late afternoon, made our way back to the shelter, cooked dinner and just chilled out until it got dark. And it was crazy dark. No other campers around, just the light of our slowly dying fire. We begin to hear a slow splashing sound coming from the swamp, maybe 100 feet out from our fire. One of the guys yelled something toward the sound and everything went quiet. A minute later, the splashing began again, but slower and more methodical. 
This time it was within 15 feet of the fire, but it was out of the fire's light. None of us were really concerned. We were all seasoned campers and figured that it was just a deer or a raccoon looking to score an easy meal. Suddenly, the walking became a slow, steady sloshing. This perked us up, wondering if this thing may suddenly decide to rush us. Our patrol leader jumped up, grabbed his flashlight, and pointed it toward the noise. His light hit something, and he yelled, It's a man! and ran to the swamp burn. I saw a brief flash of red flannel in the flashlight beam, and then heard fast splashing back into the swamp. The splashing eventually faded out in the darkness. So what did we do? We tried to figure out what the hell just happened, then crawled into our sleeping bags and somehow fell asleep. Nothing else did happen, and we went home the next day as scheduled. We had lots of stories about what it might have been, if it was a real person, if it was a ghost. Thinking back on it now, it must have been a piney, a local who knew the area really well. This man had to navigate through some serious and dangerous swamps to come check us out though, so it's still pretty creepy, even if it was just a man. The pines can be great and also eerie, and that weekend was both. Last night, my boyfriend and I were downstairs. It's a raised ranch style home. And we were just watching a movie and he went up to the window to crack it for some fresh air. We live in the Northeast and a couple of days ago, we got a good amount of snow. Now we do live in an area where wildlife is fairly common. He stood at the window and just stopped what he was doing in a complete stare. I asked, and babe, what's going on? He said, you have to come here and look at this. I got up off the couch and made my way to the window. We saw footprints and nothing like I have ever seen before. I've grown up in the woods my entire life. The men in my family are big into hunting. They're pretty big outdoorsmen. I can pretty much look at any track and know what it is. The back tracks looked like deer or rabbit, and the front ones looked like some type of bird, like a turkey, for example. The space in between them was fairly large. Whatever it was had a pretty big stride. Whatever it was looked like it had been circling the window, then to the side of the house, which our bedroom window is right above that. Also, where a cherry tree is, there's a second set of prints that looked like something started walking from the tree and just stopped. My first thought was, okay, something was just sniffing around and turned around. Well, there are no tracks back. They just completely stop. I've looked up every single possible animal that it could be, and absolutely nothing I've been able to find matches. This morning, my boyfriend went out there and looked around. My dog was with him. And as he was sniffing around, his fur was up, on high alert. He's not unfamiliar with wildlife, and this is probably the third time in his whole life that I've ever seen his fur go up like that. He said that the tracks didn't make any sense at all, that they appeared and just disappeared, and that there was no distinct pattern to them whatsoever. I know what you might be thinking. Did the snow cover them up? Maybe the wind covered the rest. We haven't had any more snow, and the snow that we do have is fairly hard. I can see my dog's tracks perfectly. Two nights ago, when these footprints could have been left, I was watching a movie down there scrolling through Reddit. I had this really weird feeling that came over me, like I was being watched. I literally pulled the blinds shut. A couple of hours later, I could hear this bush start moving outside. I figured it was just the wind or an animal. There's this big fat blue jay who does have a nest in there. 
But then I started to hear this faint clicking noise. This is the second time that I've heard that noise. The last time was when I lived two hours away, again in the middle of nowhere, and I was walking my dog at night. It made me physically ill. I figured I was just being paranoid. I was reading creepy stuff on Reddit, so I calmed myself down, telling myself that it was all in my head. We have cameras, but nothing on that side of the house, and there was nothing on any of my cameras. If anybody knows what these footprints might be, if it is in fact an animal, that would be great. I'm actually kind of scared. For the last three days, I've been having really bad anxiety. I just can't pinpoint it. I just feel like something is wrong or something bad is going to happen. My internal radar is going off in every possible way, kind of like a gut feeling. But like I said, I just can't put my finger on it. Something just feels incredibly off. I go hunting in southern Illinois on property that my family owns. The place is my second home, and I have spent countless hours exploring all around every inch of it. Caught all the fish in the area, hunted every legal game, and spotted the rest. So when I say that I've never had an experience like this, just remember that this was my domain that I felt comfortable in, in any weather, at any time, with any equipment or lack thereof. Two deer seasons ago, I had pulled into the farm at probably 4.40 in the morning. It was November, so there were at least two hours left until sunlight. I pulled my stuff out of the truck and walked into the woods. I have my shotgun and a revolver and knife on my belt, an elbow light clipped to the front of me, a thermos of coffee and a backpack with a book and a couple of other things for cleaning my deer should I get lucky. So I walk off the drive and into the woods. The tree stand I'm going to is less than a mile away, but through some dense second growth forest and down a rather steep hill, across some bottoms, then a lung burning steep climb to get to another ridge. I always dread the hike, but it's a good spot, so I do it often. I make it down to the bottoms, slush through the icy muck and get to climbing. With my flashlight clipped to my chest, I keep needing to physically turn my body to throw the beam around and see trees that I recognize to determine my path. This, of course, always gives the forest a horror movie vibe, even on the best of days. The leaves and underbrush are encased in frost, so every one of my steps comes with a solid crunch, no matter how quiet I'm trying to be. This time, though, I noticed there was more noise than usual. Something else was crunching close by, too. I walked about a quarter of the way up the hill, listening to my company the whole time, seeming to stay the same distance away as I moved. Naturally, I think to myself that I'm going to have a quick hunting day, so I plop my butt down next to a tree. I can't shoot until first light, but I'm hoping that if I stay really still, that whatever I'm hearing will just lounge around until then. So I click off my light, unsling the shotgun, and lay it over my knees to wait. Except I don't hear anything now. Whatever it was must have been spooked by my flashlight spinning all around as I sat. I still stayed a bit sipping some coffee to make sure, but after about 15 minutes or so of dead silence, I gave up. I probably didn't make it even four steps before the second moving thing starts up again. At this point, I'm still not freaked out. I stay facing the way I am and flip the light off again and sidestep behind a tree. Sure enough, I don't hear anything. Two minutes of sitting there frustrated before I start moving again, and my new friend does too. This is when I started to get freaked out because I worked my way up the hill, stopping to turn and look every so often. When I stopped, 
The sound would go on for just an infinitesimally longer amount of time than my own steps. Like something seeing me stop and doing its very best to stop before I heard it. This happened no less than four times. And by now I'm sweating bullets and freezing cold because I'm sweating bullets in the middle of winter. I abandoned my thermos near a tree so I could hold my flashlight and my revolver at the same time. The last hundred feet or so to my stand was done backwards so that I could be facing the noise and in theory, keep it from moving. And I didn't hear anything again after that. I got up into my stand and smoked like five cigarettes in a row. It gave me a sense of security being up in a tree behind camouflage. Still, I only hunted for like an hour of daylight and went back early. And I wasn't moving slow heading back to the truck, even with the sun shining bright. I haven't told my family about this because they wouldn't believe me, but damn, it was freaky. The sound, and when it decided to happen, felt very human. Which it likely was, as poachers and trespassers occasionally wander onto our property. Still, ever since then when I go hunting, I'm much better about letting people know where I'm going and for how long. The woods behind my house have always been odd. About a year ago, I had an encounter with something. To this day, I don't know what, but I know it's back and I know it wants me. Things were quiet. We started to all forget about the mystery woodland encounter from last year. For the most part, my girlfriend and I had moved on from it. That was until two months ago, on a cold February morning. My girlfriend discovered that one of our chicken's legs had been snapped in half. I took her to the vet and they were as confused as I was. There was no sign of any attack or any clear indication of who or what had done this. They recommended that I put her down, but I just couldn't do it. I believed that maybe with some rehab and a safe environment, she would heal. I took her home and I put her in the pool house. I went about my days thinking nothing of it. To this day, she hops around on one foot, but she's thriving. Anyway, a week goes by and I come out one morning to find another chicken that had both legs snapped clean in half. I ran over as fast as I could to find a similar situation. There was no sign of attack or any blood to be found. I took her to the vet and unfortunately, I had to put her down. At this point, I had a chilling feeling as to what might be going on here. I think it's back. The next day, I set up cameras facing those woods. I spent $700 on the best trail cams and the most well-reviewed SD cards I could find and I was determined to capture it this time. I made a rule that I would check them every day, twice a day, so as not to miss anything. Every time, I would find nothing. Just some cats and my chickens doing animal stuff. Since we found that first chicken, I haven't been able to sleep. I've had night terrors, nightmares, and sleep paralysis almost every night. I kept having a dream about the woods. Something chasing me. Something attacking me or getting lost in there. I'm constantly on edge and it seems like every noise makes me jump. Yesterday morning, I went to check the cameras. They're gone. They're just gone. I was baffled and in utter disbelief. I hid these cameras so well that not even my girlfriend could find them. And yet they're gone. I searched everywhere for these things. Every inch of my yard, every nook and cranny of the house and pool house. There is no trace of them. Angry, confused, and upset. I put on my boots, a thick jacket, and I headed into the woods. I was determined to figure out what this thing was 
and what it wanted with me. Remember now, those woods are dense and thick. Everything is overgrown and muddy. Or so I thought. I push my way through vines and bushes, around trees and stumps, and I stumbled upon something I wish I had never found. A clearing. I stopped for a moment to try to understand what I was looking at. I wish I could share some kind of satellite view to prove that this clearing can't possibly exist. But then it dawned on me. Where the hell am I? How long have I been walking? Did I go the wrong way? Am I lost? Amongst all my confusion, something catches my eye. It's one of my trail cams smashed on the ground. How the hell did this end up here? It was at this time that I realized how absolutely silent it was. I mean, I could hear my own heart beating. Reality set in and I had the immediate urge to run as fast as I could in the opposite direction. This is where I'm at a complete loss. I took what I thought was maybe a hundred steps through some dense vines and brush, and there I was, at the back of my property. It felt like it took a minute or two of scrambling to get through the thick overgrowth, and I was back. Still absolutely panicking, I continued onward until I got to the back door. I bolted the door and locked myself in the bedroom. I haven't said a word to anyone today. I called out of work, and it's been about 18 hours, and all I can think about is going back in. I'm scared. I can't sleep. And somehow, I know that it's watching me through my bedroom window. In Southeast Michigan, there's a mountain bike trail called the DTE Foundation Trail just north of Chelsea, Michigan. For a mountain biker, it has three major sections, more still under development, including connectors to a larger network, but I digress. Green Loop is easy flow. Came is big climbs, big downhills with jumps, super flow, technical climbs, intermediate. Wind Loop, long flow with grinding climbs and long downhills, technical features, intermediate. Sugar Loop is fast flow and major speed, but more technical, difficult. The usual flow is you start on the green loop and move on to the big came, then the wind, then the sugar, then back up the loops to the trailhead. There's a Michigan-based blogger named Kai Juno that summed up the creepy part of this forest. This is what Kai Juno wrote, quote, I know I've made a post about it before, but I can't find it. But the most like bone chilling thing you can ever experience is the silence when you're walking in the woods. Like it's the woods. There's always birds and bugs and frogs and stuff, but sometimes it will just go completely dead silent. Sometimes it feels like even the breeze stops. Like the animals can sense a predator nearby that's even bigger and scarier than you. So what does this mountain bike trail system have to do with the silence? The west side of the wind loop. Things just happen there. I've been to DTE so many times and the uneasy feeling never goes away on the west side of the wind. I'll pass riders who have taken some bad falls and require a medevac. There's a spot where the forest looks pretty open, but it's quiet. Unless there's a storm moving through the area, you don't hear a thing. This section is about 500 to 600 feet directly south of the intersection of Gilnan Drive and Sugarloaf Lake Road. There used to be a trail that branched off to the left, and after a tree fell over, nobody ever opened it back up. There's always this heavy musk in that area specifically. I know the smell of deer and it isn't of that. Something else lives in that area and it creeps me out. Part of me thinks it's a mountain lion, but those sightings are super rare 
and have been mostly a little bit more west or in the upper peninsula. The most perplexing thing is that this is really close to Sugarloaf Lake, and there are some people living out there, so there shouldn't be a reason for this unease. I'm not the only person that's felt it, but yeah, there's something really not right with the forest there. Not too long ago, my brother was telling my mom about something that my dad had said to him quite a few years ago that always puzzled him. My dad passed away over 10 years ago, so I can't ask him about it, and it really bugs me that I can't get more information. My dad loved being in the woods. They were like a second home to him. Whenever we would take a family trip into the woods, I could ask him what any animal sound was that I heard from the area, and he could tell me exactly what animal was making it and any other details I asked. He grew up on a farm, spent time as a forest ranger working in the fire towers, and he enjoyed hunting, so he knew nature pretty well. The woods that we would take family trips to, he was also very familiar with, as some of the fire towers that he worked in were still standing in the area. I think nowadays only one does. My brother said that there was a weekend that my dad decided to take a trip to the woods by himself to do some small game hunting. Not unusual at all for him. The strange part was that my dad came home early. From where we lived at the time, it took two and a half hours and sometimes longer depending on traffic to get to the woods that he liked. He didn't spend the night, even though he had brought everything he needed to camp for two nights. Both my mom and my brother remember him coming home early. Only, my dad never mentioned why to my mom, and only let it slip to my brother once. My dad told my brother that he heard something making a sound in the woods. A sound that he had never heard before in all his life. He knew it wasn't from any of the animals in those woods. The sound made him pack up and head home during the night. My brother tried to press him for more details, but he quickly changed the subject and never wanted to discuss it again. He never described what type of sound it was. He just said that it wasn't from any of the animals that inhabited those woods. None of the natural ones, anyway. My dad was never easily spooked, especially by nature. Whatever he heard, we have no idea, but it sure got to him good. It eats at me that I can't ask him about it. I really want more details. My brothers still take trips to those woods, and they've never heard anything out of the ordinary while out there. So maybe we'll never know. My uncle has a large stretch of wooded property in Missouri, about an hour and a half drive from St. Louis. He has a cabin, a small man-made lake, and trails throughout the woods. When we visited, we would spend a lot of time driving ATVs down the trails. One of the trails leads to an abandoned mining area. The area has a toppled over mine shaft, a couple of cement buildings, a sheet metal storage shed for core samples, and a sheet metal building with showers and a couple of rooms. There's a metal fence separating two sections of it that, for a while, was still mostly intact. All of it is in disrepair and hasn't been used for mining for many decades, perhaps a century. All of this lies in a large open area that has no trees, just sand and mud flats, which made it the perfect place to drive four-wheelers. We'd visit a few times each year, and we would take the four-wheelers out to the flats and have a great time riding. We never felt unsafe, and sometimes we would even go out at night to stargaze. Eventually, we started to notice that these sights pop up at the edge of the woods around the flats, like 
sticks stuck in the ground in lines or circular patterns with small burn piles. There were usually shotgun shells, bullet casings, and beer cans spread around. Sometimes we would see spray-painted symbols on pieces of trash or trees. Basically, it looked like people shooting targets and drinking out on the flats with a touch of weirdness with the symbols. So we didn't think much of it and just decided that we wouldn't go out at night. And we started carrying guns with us when we went out, just in case. What finally did it for me and kept me from going out there was when we discovered that the fence had been nearly completely destroyed. Only the posts were left, and on every post someone had stuck a can or a jar of something on top. And all throughout the flats and on the trails that ran its perimeter, we would find cans and containers stuck onto the ends of tree branches. Again, it wasn't anything too weird. Like, we know people go out and break stuff and do other dumb things. What got us was the scope of it. The fence was probably a half mile in length, and every single section of metal mesh had been removed, which would have required considerable time and energy, even with bolt cutters. And that alone wouldn't be too weird, because people loot metal for scrap all the time. The thing is, none of it was gone. It was just laid on the ground next to the fence. And then somebody had taken the time to cap the posts with cans and other containers. Then to boot, they had taken the time to place items on the ends of tree branches every 50 feet or so, all along maybe two miles of the trails and on the perimeter of the sand flats. That was the last time I went out there. It's been 10 years and I've moved states and I have limited contact with that part of my family, so I don't really know if anything else has happened. I know it's probably nothing paranormal, just some weird human activity out in the backwoods of Missouri, but it was still pretty creepy. Let me start off by saying that this is a true story that happened to me when I was about 13, and I'm 27 now. Whether you believe it or not is up to you. My dad used to be a part of a small hunting club in Alabama, just a handful of guys he grew up with. Once a year, we would drive to the small town of Elba to camp for a few days and go hunting. There were a few different areas of land around the town that the club owned, and club members could go hunting there. One of these pieces of land was nicknamed the cemetery because, well, it had an old cemetery on it. Nothing really creepy about the cemetery. It was in the woods and the graves were of a slave owner and the graves were of his slaves. Now in this area of land nicknamed the cemetery, there are five or six green fields. Basically a cleared out area where there are no trees just grass and a buck hut to hunt in. A buck hut is a tree house that you sit in and wait for deer to walk out onto the green field. This particular evening, we were going to hunt on a green field, number one, the plot directly behind the old cemetery. The evening started off normally enough. My dad parked the truck and we walked down the trail to the buck hut. We climbed up and started to wait and watch the woods. A little bit of time passes and my dad tells me that he is going to go out for a short walk to see if maybe he sees any deer on the trail. Keep in mind, I'm 13 years old. Not a big deal. I've hunted by myself before and I'm not afraid of being alone in the woods. Besides, it was still pretty light out. So I said, okay, and he climbed down. It was just me, my 32 caliber Marlin rifle, the grass field in front of me, and the dense woods around me. This is where things start to get strange. I sat there for a freaking eternity, or what felt like an eternity, and it was now almost twilight. My concern for my dad was growing because he still wasn't back yet. I was worried that maybe something had happened to him or that he had gotten lost. However, he's an experienced hunter, and if he was lost, he would yell 
or fire off a shot. But the woods had been dead silent. I figured maybe he found a good spot that he wanted to hunt the twilight or dusk hour of the day, because that's prime time for hunting. So I focused my attention on the grass field in front of me, just watching, listening, and waiting for a deer to walk out onto the field as the light of day began to fade. Just then, across the field, I saw and heard some brush moving and breaking. The thought did cross my mind that it could be my dad, but I highly doubted it. No way it could be him. That would be incredibly dangerous and stupid. I raised up my rifle, pulled back the hammer, aimed it at the moving brush, and patiently waited for what I hoped was a deer to walk out. Then a girl floated out of the woods and onto the grassy field. She was transparent white with a long flowing dress and long white hair. She floated from one side of the field to the other and then disappeared back into the woods. I watched her for a solid minute or two. I couldn't believe my eyes and I was petrified. Now I really wanted my dad back. A short time passed and it's now pitch black and I'm still alone. My concern for my dad was quickly turning into a panic, but I was too afraid to yell or go look for him in the pitch black woods where I had just seen a freaking ghost. I sat there for hours, terrified and alone in the darkness. Thankfully, he finally returned. He acted as if he hadn't been gone long at all. I asked him where the hell he'd been, and he said he just went for a short walk up the trail, turned around and came back. That timeline made no sense. He was gone for hours. It was very unlike him to leave me alone for that long. He was adamant that he had only been gone for 15 to 30 minutes. We walked down the trail back to his truck. I couldn't get out of there fast enough. The whole experience still confuses me to this day. I don't know who the ghost was that I saw. I don't know if my dad went through some kind of time warp where time sped up. I don't really know. What I do know is that I never went hunting there again, and I don't plan on ever going back. For our anniversary, my wife and I rented a cabin around Divide, Colorado. Our last night there, it started to snow. We were laying in bed, just relaxing, and we started to clearly hear footsteps on the front porch of the cabin. Nobody should have been around. I went to check, and nobody was there. Being a believer in Bigfoot, I thought, well, maybe it's something like that. So I looked out the windows and there was no sign of anything anywhere. There was fresh snow on the ground and there were no prints. That's what I really thought was weird. I laid back down and it happened again. So I got up, looked around, and there weren't any prints or anything. It happened a third time after that. I couldn't figure out why there were no prints when we clearly heard footsteps on the front porch. Then we heard this wrestling noise coming from the roof. That happened a couple of times too, but I chose not to go outside to look. I think it was maybe three years ago when this happened. I remember that it was winter because it was really cold and snowy outside. I was left alone in my family and I's cabin while the others went Christmas shopping for food, last minute packages for some friends and something else. I don't really remember exactly why they went out, but that's not so important. My point is that I was all alone in our cabin I was playing some games on my phone 
and listening to some music on the radio in my room on the first floor of the cabin. I remember that I suddenly got cold and went to get a blanket that was on our sofa. Just when I was about to get up and grab the blanket, I saw some kind of shadow in my peripheral vision. I didn't really care that much because I thought maybe it was just my imagination playing tricks on me because I didn't really like being alone in general, especially not in a cabin on a mountain in the middle of winter. I got the blanket and went back to my room to play some more games. About an hour passed and I had nearly forgotten all about the strange shadow. But then I saw it again, and this time it stayed in my peripheral vision for about three to five seconds before it went away again. I got a little creeped out about it since I was the only one in the cabin at the moment, so I decided to lock the door to my room. Right after I locked the door, I heard some kind of crying upstairs on the second floor of the cabin. At first I thought it was my little sister, who was about three years old at the time. She used to cry a lot. I asked out loud, what's wrong? Did you hurt yourself? I heard her answer, yes, I fell while playing with my dolls. Can you come upstairs and help me? I unlocked my door and headed toward the stairs. When it finally hit me, I was alone in the cabin. So whatever was upstairs was not my little sister. I sprinted out of the cabin wearing only a t-shirt and my dad's slippers, and it was freezing cold outside. I stopped running about 150 meters away from the cabin and looked at it from a distance. In one of the windows on the second floor, I could see a shadow just standing still. And even though I couldn't make out any eyes, I got the feeling that it was staring at me. I stood there outside of my family's cabin in the freezing cold for maybe about 30 minutes, and I cried until my family finally arrived. My mom and dad asked me what was wrong, but I didn't want them to think I was crazy, so I just made up a story. I don't remember what I told them, but they seemed concerned about me. One thing I remember is that I talked my mom and dad into driving me to my grandparents' cabin because I refused to enter ours. Ever since that day, I refuse to join my family when they go to our family cabin. It's really hard to explain, but the feeling that I got that day in the cabin can only be described as unwanted. Like someone or something wanted to harm me. I still have nightmares about that shadow figure thing. Even today, it's haunting my dreams. This happened to me when I was in high school, living with my parents. One night, I went out with friends. I drank a couple of beers and I went back home. I was just a little tipsy, not drunk, and I decided to take a shower before going to bed. It was about one to two in the morning. The shower cabin that we had wasn't fixed to the floor or the walls. It was like a capsule, but it was very heavy and hard to move. I entered the shower and after a few minutes, the cabin started swinging left to right and it was very loud. I was standing trying not to move and it stopped. But as soon as I continued to shower again, it started swinging again. I stepped outside and there was my dad banging on the bathroom door asking what I was doing because the noise woke him up. I just got dressed and went to bed. The next morning, my dad asked me again what that noise was, and I tried to explain what happened. He said that I was just drunk and fell in the shower, so I moved the cabin. But that did not happen. I know that it didn't happen. I wasn't drunk. I had had maybe two beers. And I was standing the whole time. I had never fallen. It moved by itself, something that should have been impossible. I went to the bathroom and tried very hard to move or swing the cabin back and forth, but it was impossible. I still have no idea what happened that night.
My grandparents used to live in the Ozarks in a tiny house in the woods. I loved it there. Being from West Texas, it was always nice to resort to a place with trees. After a year or two of living in the house, my grandparents decided to renovate it to make it look like a log cabin. I had always felt something really unsettling about the house, and I warned them to be careful because renovating the house could stir up unpleased spirits. They went ahead with the renovations, gorgeous woodwork on the house with two beautiful decks looking out onto the mountains and an entire new living area in the basement. It was so pretty, and I was really excited to stay there in the summer. When I arrived though, the atmosphere was tense. It felt angry, even though my grandparents were very welcoming. It was quite strange. I got an official tour, and for the most part, the interior was the same. Then we went to the basement. I was overwhelmed with fear. I was hesitant to go down alone, and when I would, I could never stay for long. I always slept upstairs. I never felt safe down there. One day, I was making my way down the stairs to get some laundry, which was located across from the basement. I had only taken about three steps down when I suddenly felt cold and couldn't move. I just felt petrified. It wasn't too long before I felt a force on my back, and the next thing I knew, I was sliding down the stairs. I was still so petrified that I couldn't even scream. It was a silent fall. When I could move again, I rushed for my clothes and ran back up the stairs, and I didn't go back down for days. A week or so went by. It was July 3rd. It was storming all day, but still pretty warm outside. My grandparents had left for a party down the street, and I had decided to stay and hold down the fort, all alone. I was upstairs in their big open loft on their computer, just killing some time. It was still storming outside, and it was the last moments of daylight. I was listening to music with headphones over my head, browsing YouTube and the like. I felt a familiar cold breeze, but instead of my entire body, it was just my neck. And instead of it being extended like wind, it was brief. It was like somebody was right behind me and just blew on my neck. I wasn't moving. I was too scared to even breathe. I just stayed still, the headphones still on my head. All of a sudden, my headphones flew off with such force that they hit the computer screen in front of me. I screamed, ran, and panicked. I tried turning on the TV, but all it was was startling loud static. I tried turning it off, but it wouldn't. Trying to calm my nerves, I looked at a painting of a meadow that my grandparents had hanging by the TV, and I saw it. I saw a man with the most sinister, evil face I've ever seen, with empty white eyes. I felt so much fear staring into them. Trust me, he'd never been there before. I ran outside in the rain, shoeless and terrified. I walked to the house where my grandparents were, and I never explained what happened. My boyfriend and I rented a cabin in the middle of nowhere in upstate New York. We arrived on Tuesday. By Wednesday morning, I awoke with a deep cut on my hip. On Thursday morning, we were awoken by the TV turning on by itself. On Friday, my boyfriend started seeing shadows out of the corner of his eye. And then that night into Saturday morning, we were about to go to sleep at 3.30. We stayed up really late. As soon as we turned off the lights to sleep, we heard a deep guttural growl that lasted for about two seconds. We both immediately froze and then turned the lights back on. 
Now we were wide awake. We then realized that pictures of one child in the house had been defaced and an extremely heavy chandelier started swinging. I'm not entirely sure what was in there and we're not totally positive if it's safe to return. I was up near Antelope Lake, California, exploring this old mining town known as Lucky S with my girlfriend and her parents. There were a total of four of us. Lucky S is out in the middle of nowhere on this seemingly endless fire road. Then it just appears from the forest and you suddenly find yourself between at least four cabins, all in different stages of collapsing. When we got there, it was in the middle of the day, no later than 2 p.m., with clear skies. Knowing I was going into buildings that may or may not be haunted, I wanted to try to capture anything and everything that I could. So I brought my Nikon to take photos. We explored four or five cabins, ate some food, and then walked about a quarter mile farther up the road to the second half of this rundown town. While my girlfriend's dad was examining some old piece of large machinery and explaining how it used to work, I walked off alone to check out the next cabin. There were no steps leading up to this one, so the easiest way inside the structure was to either get a running start and jump in or pull yourself up by grabbing onto either side of the doorway. I elected for the run and jump version and totally ripped my shorts down the leg. I'm in this rundown cabin, and I take a shot of my girlfriend and her parents outside the other building. I turn and take shots of the holes in the roof of the cabin I'm in, and then I hear an odd noise, like one of them is shuffling debris just outside the doorway that I jumped through. So I stop and stand still, listening. Then I hear an obviously loud knocking coming from the doorway. I quickly turned and I see all three of the people that I'm with still outside the structure across the way. No one was near me. So I turned back toward the other end of the cabin, the one that I'm in, and I just stare toward the doorway. Seconds later, there's more shuffling, followed by three obvious footsteps. The first one is the loudest, I think, because of how you have to enter the building. You can't just step in. So these three footsteps sounded like they walked right toward me and then stopped. I stood there for a few more seconds and then slowly walked toward the doorway. After that, I never heard anything again. It was my first and only experience like this. I wasn't alone. It was in the middle of the day. It was outside and it was very sunny and bright. So I guess that's the least scary way to experience this. In any case, I'll take it. Either way, there was nobody near me and nobody in the cabin with me that could have made that sound. So I don't know what happened, but it definitely wasn't natural. This is a story of my first encounter with the paranormal that I can remember. I was about eight or nine years old and I was playing with my little cousins at their parents' house during a family gathering. Behind their house is a large forest located in Northeast Florida. My cousins, their neighbor and I were playing hide and seek in the forest. The only rule their parents had was to stay within sight of the house. Of course, we didn't listen. I was getting bored of the game and I wanted to do some exploring. I convinced the other kids to join me as we headed deeper into the forest. I noticed this ball of light floating in midair. I thought I was seeing things. I remember rubbing my eyes just to make sure that it wasn't in my head. 
I asked my cousins if they saw it too, and when I pointed it out, they confirmed that it was there. It was bright and bobbed back and forth, changing from a yellowish color to a transparent green hue. We followed it for I can't remember how long, but we reached a small cabin and the orb disappeared. It was dusk at this point and curiosity got the better of me. My cousins and the neighbor kid were too scared to go up to it, but I did and I peeked inside the window. I saw a dim light inside and what I thought was a human skull sitting on a table next to some jars. Then a shadow from within moved across the far wall. I got chills and signaled to the other kids to run back the way we had come and I took off immediately behind them. We ran as fast as we could and we didn't stop until we were inside the house and I locked the door behind us. I remember getting in trouble because our parents couldn't see us from the kitchen window. I didn't tell my mom or anyone else what we saw because I didn't want to scare my cousins or worry our parents. To be frank, I'm not even sure what I saw or if what I think I saw was there. Later that night, I woke up to the sounds of helicopters and dogs barking outside. It was well past midnight and I asked my mom who was standing in the kitchen with the rest of the adults, what was going on. The adults had stayed over after the party and they were all just standing there, their eyes glued to whatever was happening in the backyard. I stood there and tried to peek through the kitchen window with them. My mom says that they found the body of a woman in the forest and a cabin where her killer was staying. There was a manhunt going on. I remember not being able to sleep for the rest of the night. The glaring white lights that shine through the folds of the blinds from the helicopter was only one of the reasons. I'm still not sure what that orb was. Maybe it was the spirit of the woman who was trying to lead someone to her killer, or maybe it was something more nefarious. I'm not even sure if one of the other kids told anyone about the cabin that we had seen. Maybe they did, and maybe one of their parents called the police. I just remember us not being allowed to even go near the tree line anymore whenever we visited after that night. I never wanted to anyway. I'm 24 now and have had many other experiences since then, but this is the one that I actually forgot about and was reminded of recently when reading up on Will-O-Wisps. I just thought I would share where it all began for me. I was up north at my uncle's cabin when I saw something really strange. I'm laying in bed at night and it was like one o'clock in the morning, so it was pretty dark outside. We're surrounded by trees everywhere. I'm laying on the bed upstairs and I'm staring outside at the windows which are downstairs because I can see it from where I'm at. The windows are very large. From the far left window, I see this massive bright white orb floating above the deck or porch. It moves back and forth between the one window and the other. I can't fully remember if I saw it pass over or behind one of the blind spots between the windows, but it just kept going back and forth multiple times with some speed. I gaze at the window and watch the orb travel from one side of the window to the other side multiple times. The size of the orb, from what I can remember, would be about the size of a large watermelon. I know that it was not the moon. Even when the porch is wet, the light of the moon doesn't really reflect. It was just my dad, my grandpa, and I there. There's also one other important thing. This place is where my uncle David's ashes are buried. Not my uncle the owner, but my mom's other brother. He's not buried near the porch of the house, though. But I still wonder if it might have been him.
Our family has a small cabin up north that we go to when the summers get too hot. Our cabin has four rooms and a loft. There's a kitchen area, a living area, two bedrooms, one bathroom, and the loft. The rooms are tiny and our family is big, so we're always bunking up and sleeping on air mattresses all over the place. This particular weekend was 4th of July and the whole family came up to the cabin. Once everybody got settled in and had lunch, we all wanted to go for a walk in the woods. It was a beautiful day and we all started to venture out. My nephew, who was four at the time, started to get a bit fussy and tired. So I took him back to the cabin with me for a short nap. I set up the air mattress up in the loft and I put him down for a nap. It was almost 1 p.m. and I figured he could nap for 30 or 40 minutes and then be ready to go back out and play afterwards. My nephew then wanted me to lay down next to him, so I did, and we both started to fall asleep. I finally woke up by the motion of the air mattress moving. I figured my nephew had maybe rolled over to the other side or something, but now I was awake and I could feel the sun on my face from the small window above. I glanced over to my nephew and he was fast asleep not facing me. I started to nod off again, but then I was woken up by the same motion of the air mattress moving. It's that sound, you know, the swooshing of the air. It felt like somebody had just sat down on the air mattress at my feet. So I look up and I see nothing. My nephew is still sleeping in the same spot. So then I just lay there, awake, and my eyes were still focused on the lower part of the air mattress, down by my feet, when all of a sudden, an area of the mattress started to depress, you know, like when someone had just sat down on it and made the indentation. I heard that same swishing sound of a rush of air, and I screamed. My nephew woke up and I grabbed him, and we ran down the stairs and out the door. We waited outside until the rest of my family returned from their walk in the woods. And when I told the story, my sister-in-law told me that her mother had experienced paranormal stuff at the cabin for years. Thanks for letting us know. To this day, I still don't know and can't really explain what it was, but nothing like that has ever happened to me since. I don't know about the rest of the family though. My story takes place on the big island of Hawaii when I was about 10 or 11 years old. My dad was into hunting wild boar and sheep. Sometimes he would take the family with him to stay at a cabin that my uncles had built. I can't say exactly where the cabin is located, but to get there, you would have to take a turn off the main highway onto an unmarked road and then drive about an hour up the mountain off-road through the woods to reach the cabin and hunting grounds. It's a small one-story cabin and the front door is just a sliding glass door. Across from the sliding door are the three bedrooms that had two bunks in each room, no doors. The bathroom was just an outhouse with no lights or running water. We had to walk through some bushes and trees to get to it. It was a nice little spot not ventilated well and cold, but quaint. I couldn't help but feel like there were a lot of spirits there, mostly because my uncle said that a huge battle took place near the cabin during ancient times. I immediately think, damn, night marchers. To some, night marchers are just a part of Hawaiian folklore, but to native Hawaiians, they are very real. I was already creeped out by that place. I remember feeling really vulnerable. At some point during the trip, my cousin, sister, and I started wandering around outside of the cabin in the open area. It was basically a field of lava rock covered with grass, weeds, and trees that lined the outer edges of the perimeter. 
We were bored, so we grabbed some hammers and started smashing the small lava tubes to see if we could find something. The lava tubes we were smashing weren't giant, like caves, but just small hollow pockets or bubbles of air that formed during lava flows and hardened over time. You could just tap your shoe on them and tell that it was a pocket by the sound. Well, let's just say, be careful what you wish for, because in one lava tube in particular, we found something. We smashed it, looked inside, and what we saw sent chills down our spines. It was a pile of bones, sitting on long, brown bird feathers. It didn't look like human bones, but like some kind of animal, maybe a chicken. Okay, you're thinking, wow, that's not scary at all. But the bones were perfectly preserved and still had some pink and reddish color to them. They seemed fresh. So we started pondering how the bones had gotten there. There was no physical way that a person could have put those there. And why wouldn't they have gotten destroyed by the lava? The bones had to have been there for hundreds of years at least because the volcano was no longer active. It was as if the lava flow went around the bones and hardened over it, protecting it almost. The only explanation we could think of was that it had been an offering to Pele, the fire goddess, and that we shouldn't mess with it. We immediately covered the opening with rocks and got the hell out of there. We never told our parents. The next morning, my dad asks us if anybody went to the outhouse early in the morning. We all say no. Oh, that's weird, he says. I woke up and saw somebody standing at the sliding door, so I thought maybe somebody had gone to the bathroom. We look at each other, horrified. Like, what if it was the person that left the offering, and we totally disturbed it and now we're screwed? We asked for more details. He said that it was too dark to tell who it was exactly, but that it was a large man and that he just stood there at the door, staring into our cabin. My dad tried to play it off like maybe he was just dreaming, but I was terrified, fearing that I had disturbed someone's offering to the gods and they were mad at me. It could have been a human, sure, but it seemed really unlikely given our location. There were no other cabins or homes built at the hunting grounds, nowhere near them. Either way, I never stayed there again. Back in April of 2011, my family and I stayed in Skyline Cabin C82 at Jellystone Park. It's the one right beside the nature trail. Each of us experienced something that we believed to be paranormal, but none of us admitted it to each other until after we had gotten home. It turns out that my sister, who was eight, and I, who was 11, actually saw the same figure at the same time. We don't remember the time of night, but both of us recall waking up for an unknown reason to find a tall man standing by the bed with his arms crossed and an angry look on his face. At first, we thought the figure was my dad, and we were confused as to why he seemed angry with us. Then, we realized we could see straight through the guy to my coat hanging on the wall. I quickly rolled over to the other side of the bed in fear, as my sister slowly did the same. Later that night, my sister woke up again to see a man sitting at the dining table in the other room. She turned on her flashlight to see who it was, and the figure disappeared. My mom also woke up during the night to see a white orb fly in through the window and out through the door. As soon as the light went through the window, she heard a voice scream, you don't belong here, or you aren't welcome here, one of the two. Our stay at cabin C82 is something that we reminisce about often We've been curious if anyone else has experienced anything strange there. So if you've stayed at Jellystone Park in Lori, Virginia and experienced anything paranormal, we would love to hear your story.
This happened around the time that I was 11 years old. My dad had just bought a log cabin in the woods of Maine. The place was completely dead, and while we had neighbors, we rarely saw them. We had already spent a few nights up there on a previous trip, about a 250 mile trip just to get there. We decided to take another trip up there for a long weekend. As this cabin was old, my parents decided to get some work done on it to make it more appealing. So they hired people to come and redo some things in the rooms. At the time, there was only one bedroom available for us to sleep in. As night fell, we all got ready to sleep. There were six of us in that one room. Mom, Dad, me, two brothers, and sister. In the middle of the night, I wake up to audibly clear boot steps in the living room. The bedroom was connected to the living room. All that was between us was an old wooden door and a rusty deadbolt lock that would definitely come off if somebody were to kick the door in. As I was still waking up, I was in that foggy state that you are kind of when you're just becoming conscious. I wasn't all there. But then I heard the voice of my sister saying, do you hear that? So now I know that this isn't just part of a dream leaking into reality. I sit up quickly and look to the other bed and both of my parents and my sister are looking at the door and looking at each other. My heart starts to race, not knowing what to think. I then hear my sister say, are we going to die? Which really doesn't help the situation at hand. As my other brother starts waking up, the boot steps stop for a moment and then continue. Mind you, there was no fading of the steps which means that the sound came from a general area. We continue to just look at each other in fear and worry, none of us knowing how or why somebody would get into our cabin. As my last brother begins to wake up, the boot steps stop. My dad then gets out of bed and grabs the machete that he placed under the bed and heads toward the door. Placing his ear to the door, slowly to try to see if he can hear anything else, he can't. Then, in one quick motion, he unlocks and opens the door while wielding his weapon, prepared for anybody that might be there. He walks out into the living room, then to the other rooms to see if anything was there. But everything was clear. As a matter of fact, all the doors and windows were locked. There was no possible entry into the cabin, seeing as nothing had been tampered with. It was really hard to get back to sleep that night. As I woke up that morning, I remembered what had happened the previous night. I remembered hearing those boot steps, and I even confirmed with my family that it wasn't a dream and that we all experienced the same thing. As there was no possible way that a person could have entered the house, I came to the conclusion that this was paranormal. I had my share of paranormal experiences growing up. My family and I have tried to debunk this a hundred ways, but we just can't come up with a solid solution. If you think you have a reasonable cause for this incident, let me know. And before somebody says it was somebody outside or an animal, no. I know for a fact that the boot steps came from inside the house. This was definitely one of the scariest experiences of my life. When I was younger, I used to spend hours in the woods behind my house. One time, when I was about nine or 10 years old, I was in the woods and I saw some stepping stones that led into a clearing. Those stones had never been there before. I peeked into the clearing and saw this little cabin with smoke coming from the chimney. It was surrounded by a well manicured lawn. Although it looked peaceful, charming even, 
Something in my head said, run. So I did. About a week later, I went back into the woods, to the same spot. And the clearing was normal again. No stones, no cabin, just a basic clearing, the same one that I had grown up with. I haven't stepped into those woods again ever since, and it's been about 20 years. I don't know what that cabin was, how it appeared or why it disappeared. And I don't know what would have happened if I had followed the steps and gone up to it. But to this day, I'm just very glad that I didn't. This story is 100% true and takes place in Cincinnati, Ohio, specifically Claremont County. I'm female, 31 years old now, and this happened in 2006. So at the time, I was 17 going on 18. My boyfriend will call Mark, my friend will call Amy, and her boyfriend, now husband, will call Neil, are the ones involved in this unexplained event. So for some background first, there is this abandoned cabin in the middle of the woods. You can only get to it by walking about a mile one way. There are abandoned cars, an ambulance, some tractors, and some other random vehicles, like a short school bus, and they're all covered in gunshots. There's not even a path to drive a vehicle back there. If there were, we'd be walking a mile one way to get to them, so... I'm not even sure how they got there or how long they've been there. My boyfriend and I had gone with two other friends previously to this encounter, and it was creepy, but it was nothing compared to what happened when we went with Amy and Neil. So on our previous trip, we went with our friends that we'll call T and J. T and myself went upstairs and we had a Ouija board. We just asked random stupid questions that I can't even remember. What I do remember is that it spelled out hooey, and we thought that was funny. We said goodbye on the board, and we were looking around the upstairs, which was really just an attic. We found massive kids' socks in the walls, like tons of them. It was really random and weird. We got startled when an alarm clock started ticking. It wouldn't stop, so I smashed it to pieces, and that was that. We walked downstairs where the boys were and made our way back outside. We found a creepy well that was all covered up. And then, all of a sudden, we heard that alarm clock start ticking again. But I know that I broke it, so it kind of spooked us out, but nothing major. We saw an outdoor cellar that we had gone into, and there was a child's boot seemingly a girl's, with a bone inside the shoe. So we were like, okay, we're done for today. So my boyfriend and I were telling Amy and Neil about this cabin and what had happened when T and J came with us. So we decided that we were gonna go later that day. The day that this encounter happened, Mark, Neil, Amy, and myself all went to the lake, packed a cooler with food and stuff like that, and probably spent about five hours or so at the lake, just eating and hanging out. We left the lake and stopped at Amy and Neil's homes, dropped the cooler off, which was in the trunk of the car, and then went on our way. After getting everything out of the trunk from our lake trip, we headed to my boyfriend's parents' house, where we parked the car and began our hour-long walk. We had flashlights, and that was it. The walk there was very uneventful. We had to walk through two huge drainage tunnels to get to this cabin. We make it there and it wasn't dark out, but it seemed different this time. I'm not really sure how to explain it, but it was just different. We did come later in the day than previously, so I chalked it up to it being that. Just like last time, when we get inside, I decide to go upstairs and I ask Amy to come with me. I wanted to show her the socks in the wall, 
And I also wanted to check on that clock that I had broken on the last visit that I heard ticking outside previously. As we started to go up the stairs, there was this big crash, like something had been thrown or knocked over. Amy gets freaked out, and then out of nowhere, she books it outside and back down to the creek, yelling at Mark, Neil, and I to come on. I go chasing after her, and she's in tears, having a full-blown panic attack. She keeps talking, but I can't understand her. Finally, I get that she saw someone looking in the window at us. We tell the guys, and literally nobody is around. It's just the four of us. Since she's so distraught, we decide to just go ahead and leave. As we're walking back down the creek bed, heading back the same way we'd come, Mark and Neil are just kind of kicking over these huge rocks. We stop and realize that there are huge rocks, I would say boulders, standing right up in a line on the entryway down to the creek bed. They couldn't have been there, not even 20 minutes prior, because we would have noticed them when we were on our way there. So this seriously freaked us all out. This is not normal, and it's not natural. So we pick up the pace and start to haul ass out of there. We make it to the first drainage tunnel, and we turn on our flashlights. Literally, none of them will turn on. Four flashlights that worked perfectly fine on the way there. And now none of them will turn on. We were like, what is happening? So 30 minutes later, we're back at my boyfriend's parents' house where Amy and Neil had parked the car. Amy gets in the car because at this point, she's just ready to go home and forget that this event ever happened. The rest of us are still outside the car. Suddenly, Amy gets out of the car, screaming and jumping up and down and flailing around. She's covered in ants. We were like, what the hell is going on? So we look and they're coming from the back seat, from the trunk. Neil opens the trunk of his car and laying in there is this huge, rusty, extremely old wool sock covered in ants. Now remember what I said earlier? We had been in and out of that trunk all day long and there was nothing in that trunk when we left their house from dropping off the cooler. Now there's a wool sock covered in ants that covered the car? This was too much for any of us to wrap our heads around. Needless to say, we've never been back there. And personally, I will never go back. It turns out that the man who used to live in that cabin was named Hubert, and he was often called Hui. My boyfriend had actually been to the cabin once before I ever went and he found these journals there. The man, well, let's just say he did some pretty terrible things to kids. His journals went into detail about it. Obviously, I'm not going into detail here. But looking back at that first Ouija board experience, Hui makes a lot more sense. This was honestly the first and only time that I had ever encountered something to this level. Like I said, I'll never go back. Even to this day, when I talk about it, I get goosebumps. I can't explain what happened that day, and I have no idea what Amy saw that scared her so badly in that window. But I do know that boulders do not stand straight up on their own in a line, and nobody could have done that fast enough. Nobody could have messed with the four flashlights either, because we had them in our hands the whole time and no physical person could have put that dirty, old, ant-infested wool sock in Amy and Neil's car trunk. It was locked. So I guess the lesson I learned is if you're ever wandering through the woods and you come across a random cabin, just leave it alone. You never know who lived there, what they did, and who or what may still be there. Unfortunately, I think we learned that the very hard and unsettling way.
This is something that happened a while ago at a cabin that my family and I were renting. My sister and I were sitting outside on the back porch around 11 p.m., maybe getting closer to midnight. We were talking when we heard a noise. To me, it sounded like someone was clapping their hands, kind of like in The Conjuring, at least that's what it reminded me of. No one was outside, and the neighbors were pretty far down the road, so if it was someone, they would have had to walk all the way to the house and be standing pretty much right outside of it. The rest of my family were talking inside the kitchen. We could have heard them, and it would have been obvious if they were the ones clapping. It happened three times in three different locations, once right next to the house, once in front of us, which would have been in the back in the woods, and the third time came from the front of the house. I really don't know how to explain it, but it was pretty creepy. We were on our trip to Yellowstone from California. We were a group of seven adults. We took a flight to fly to Salt Lake City, Utah, and then we drove up to Henry Lake, Idaho, where we had booked a cabin. We reached the cabin at about 5 p.m. on the first day. This was a huge cabin with a living room, kitchen, one master bedroom, and a dining room downstairs, with a set of stairs on either side to go upstairs. Also, there was an entrance into the kitchen as well as the landing outside the master bedroom from outside, apart from the main entrance that ended up in the living room. There were about four bedrooms and three bathrooms upstairs, a very old and rustic looking cabin. We didn't feel anything bad during that entire evening. However, the nighttime did feel very eerie. My husband and I slept in one of the bedrooms one of the couples used the master bedroom downstairs and another took the master bedroom upstairs that was farther down the hallway from our room. The only single guy in the group took the bedroom next to us. So on our first night there, we all went to our respective rooms at about 11 p.m. since we had plans to leave early for Yellowstone the next day. My husband and I both fell asleep as soon as we hit the bed. I don't know what time it was, but I suddenly woke up with a scream. At the same time, my husband woke up with a scream too. While I do have nightmares and have in the past where I would cry in my sleep, it was the first time that I had ever screamed, and I don't remember having any dreams or nightmares that night. My husband has never had nightmares, so it was unusual for him to wake up that night too. The guy in the next room was on the phone talking to somebody. He heard our screams and came in to check on us. We assured him we were okay. Again, we all went to bed, but I kept having weird feelings throughout the night, and I was completely unable to sleep until I saw the sunlight coming through the window. We all woke up at around 9 a.m., and we were discussing the incident. The other two couples were unaware of it, but they did mention hearing random footsteps throughout the night, thinking that we were up walking around. We were there for five days, and we didn't experience any other events for the rest of the stay. But the cabin gave out significant negative energy, and not a single one of us wants to stay there again. We would leave as early in the morning as we could, and come back late at night just to sleep. We haven't had any other experiences like that, ever again. So a couple of my friends and I were staying at my family's cabin for a week in the summer. A lot of weird stuff happened throughout the entire week. The last day we were there, was the day of the creepiest and most unexplainable part. One of the first days after my parents left, one of my friends went out for a little run late at night. 
After about five minutes, he comes sprinting back to the cabin and tells us that he saw a black figure in the woods beside him. We all thought that it was weird, but we didn't really think much of it. The day after, nothing really happened except for when we were in the jacuzzi. This was around one to three in the morning. We started talking about the scariest dreams we had ever had, and so we all told each other. But then one of my friends begins telling the rest of us that when he was younger, he used to not only dream, but also see in real life this tall black figure in his room at night, and that it was a really serious thing because he started getting really emotional about it and started crying as he was telling us. As he's telling us the story, I hear footsteps in the woods below us, but I decided not to tell the rest of them until the next day. Regardless, we were all pretty spooked at this point. The last day, we didn't really have anything planned, so we just hung out at the cabin. When it started getting late, around one to two in the morning, one of my friends told us that his towel kept falling off the hook that he had hung it on. This happened probably around three times. When he hung it up the last time, I saw him do it. He hung it properly, and there was no way that it could have just fallen off by itself. But we went to check on it later, just in case, and it had fallen off. His blanket, which had been folded on the bed the last time we checked, was now spread out on the floor. Cabinets in the bathroom also kept opening by themselves. At around 4 a.m., we all decided that we should probably get some sleep, and so we did. And because we were all scared, two of my friends stayed in my room for the night. Just as I was going to sleep, my friend who was on the floor asked if I could hear the rustling noises coming from the kitchen and living room. I said no, so the three of us slowly walked out through the hallway into the living room. And just as I enter and turn on my phone's flashlight, I felt my stomach drop more than I ever have before. The couch and chair cushions had been flipped upright, like they were standing vertically, and the pelts in the chairs had been thrown onto the floor. Since we were so freaked out, we got everybody out of the cabin, and for some dumb reason, we called the cops. Of course, they couldn't do anything, they were probably just thinking that we were a bunch of kids on some strong drugs, but we weren't. It was about 5 a.m. at this point, and we didn't get any sleep that night. I know it doesn't exactly sound scary, but I had never had anything paranormal happen to me before, and it was probably the scariest thing that's ever happened to me. happened when I was camping 20 years ago and I can't get it out of my head. If you have any ideas about what this might be, I'm very interested in hearing it. I was visiting my uncle and cousin, Sarah, in rural Pennsylvania. I was about 16 and Sarah was about 12. Sarah asked me if we could go camping, which meant pitching a tent at the top of this huge foothill that was on the property. The foothill was very steep and had woods at the top. I'd never been camping before then, but I figured if anything happened, we could just walk back down to the house. So I said, cool, no problem. We pitched the tent so the woods were directly behind it, with the tent opening facing out toward the scenery and the view. We roasted marshmallows, told campfire stories, and got in the tent around 11 p.m. or midnight. Sarah fell asleep right away but I couldn't, so I was just lying there counting sheep. Suddenly, I heard leaves shuffling in the woods behind the tent, and I heard footsteps coming out of the woods behind the tent. There were a few steps, and then it would stop. Then a few more, and as it got closer, I heard it step on some large rocks. It sounded like a really large hoof stepped on the rock, because it made that same clop sound as a horse. As it got closer to the tent, I could feel the impact of each step in the ground under me, so whatever it was sounded very heavy. 
At first I thought it was a large buck, and I debated waking up my cousin so she wouldn't miss it. But then it kept coming closer to the tent, closer than a deer or buck ever would have. And suddenly I was overcome with this feeling of full body dread, like something was very, very wrong. Then I heard a really bizarre sound. It sounded like it was coming from about eight to 10 feet off the ground. And the best way I can describe it is like someone had a huge roll of masking tape and was pulling off a big section at a time. It was this odd tearing sound for lack of a better word. And each tearing sound was loud and lasted two to three seconds. I told myself that it was a deer and that it was tearing bark off trees and that's what was making the noise, but deep down I knew something was wrong. I didn't want to risk waking or scaring Sarah, so I just lay there as quietly as possible, praying that whatever it was would leave. But instead of leaving, the tearing sound got closer, still about eight to ten feet off the ground. Now it was directly behind the tent, within five to ten feet. Right then, I heard Sarah scream whisper my name, and I realized she was awake and heard it too. She asked me what it was, and I told her that it was fine, that it was just a deer, and to go back to sleep. She said, that doesn't sound like a deer. But I insisted that it was, because I was too scared to make a run for the house with whatever this thing was right outside. So we listened to it slowly move around to the left side of the tent still close, still making the sound every few seconds. And then things got even weirder. It started moving around to the front of the tent where the ground dropped off steeply. So each few feet forward was also several feet down. As this thing went around to the front, the sound stayed at the eight to 10 foot height and was slowly moving to the right. Now, if the thing making this sound was standing on the ground, then the sound should have dropped several feet, but the sound stayed at the same height all the way around. I even wondered if it was a bird, but it was moving too slowly, and that wouldn't account for the hoof steps I'd heard before. After the sound faded into the woods, Sarah and I just lay awake for the rest of the night, too afraid to leave the tent. At first light, we booked it back to the house and told my uncle what had happened. Even though he didn't know what it was, he just shrugged and didn't seem too concerned. But that experience scared me so much I've never been camping since, since I know I didn't hallucinate or imagine it because Sarah heard it too. Has anyone else ever heard of anything like this? I've asked friends who are avid outdoorsmen, hunters, and trackers, and none of them have ever heard of anything like it. One night, in the spur of the moment, my best friend, my girlfriend, and I went camping on the banks of a creek that I lived within five miles of. We grabbed a 20 pack of beer, some blankets, and some cigarettes, and headed out in my piece of shit van with good spirits. It was about a week to 10 days before Halloween, so it got dark on us pretty quickly. We made haste and gathered firewood with flashlights, ignited a fire, which rapidly grew hot, and threw off a lot of light, which allowed us to gather enough wood to chill and drink a couple of beers. We broke out the boom box and commenced having a good time. A few hours went by very quickly, and my girlfriend went to the van to sleep, although I don't know how, as it was pretty cold away from the fire. Anyway, my friend's girlfriend got off work at midnight and brought us more beer, though we didn't need it, as we had only drank about half of what we had initially brought. Those two got in an argument and she left. We watched as her taillights faded into the night. Then the weird stuff started happening. This place wasn't in the middle of nowhere. It was secluded, but we could see farmhouses from where we were. It was far enough tucked out and cold enough where nobody would be screwing around anywhere near us. All of a sudden, my buddy goes, screw that woman, and turns up the radio as loud as it would go, but not for long. It was about that time that I heard what he was talking about. 
a distinct woman's voice from across the creek scream in a guttural way, help me. I looked across the fire at my buddy to see him look as pale and sheepish as I felt. He turned down the radio before I could say anything. Dude, did you hear that? He said. He grabbed his cell phone and we both grabbed flashlights and shined them across the creek. He called his girlfriend to make sure she didn't have car trouble down the road. She was already home. That was like a relief and more stress at the same time. It wasn't her, so who the hell could it be? We stood there in the grip of fear. Lights shined across the water. We didn't hear anything for what seemed like forever. Just when we were about to chalk it up to imagination or jitters or something, we hear, help me. A woman that couldn't have been a hundred yards away from where we were standing, which was right on the opposite bank of the creek from where we were. We quickly shone our lights to where the plea for help was coming from, but there was nothing there. We both called out, hello, where are you? Hello? No response ever came. Being experienced in the outdoors, we both knew that if she was being attacked or chased, there would be other noises we could hear, like rustling in the fallen leaves, or as close as it sounded, some more cries for help or twigs snapping or something. By this time, whatever buzz we had from the beer was long gone. We began gathering whatever we could grab and I woke up my girlfriend and commanded her to start the van and that we were leaving. She promptly did this and it's probably a good thing that she did because what came next still scares me to this day and is completely unexplainable. As we were piling in, we hear, help me, come from the very back of the van, which was in the complete opposite direction of where the screams had been coming from. Needless to say, we left the beer and radio and got out of Dodge. I had my girlfriend get out of the way and I burned out, nearly wrecking the car in the process. I drove the dirt road about 60 all the way out. This happened in October of 2002 and I can't reconcile what it was. I tried saying that it was maybe coyotes or foxes. They make a yipping bark and a really scary scream respectively. There aren't any mountain lions within 500 miles of this place, so it wasn't that either. But whatever it was spoke, and to my knowledge, none of those things do. Whatever it was, it scared two 21-year-olds into leaving a case of beer behind. Honestly, I don't think I wanna know what it was. Although, I think I have a pretty good idea. I was out walking the woods at an ungodly hour of the morning. I believe it was around one to two in the morning. Last year, I was working at a church youth camp in Wisconsin. The camp was on two sides of a highway and a tunnel under the highway connected the two sides of the camp so that the campers could more readily access the other side. My then girlfriend and our friend liked to walk the woods at night after we were done with work. The first time we had done this, we were scared shitless by a fox barking. The deer in the woods were fairly docile and didn't spook easily. We soon learned to identify the sound of the fox and we saw it several times. One night, it was just me and my ex-girlfriend walking through the woods. As we rounded a corner in the trail, I noticed movement in the field by the tunnel, gray shapes. I assumed they were deer and I pointed them out to my girlfriend. We continued our walk past the tunnel. Just as we passed the entrance to the tunnel, maybe about 20 yards, we heard the most horrendous screeching. It sounded as if somebody was being strangled. It did not sound at all like the fox, but we shrugged it off. We continued up the road. All of a sudden, I had this weird feeling and I turned around to see a tall figure standing in the road. It was dressed in white and it was all hazy. I wondered if I was a little too tired and was seeing things, so I poked my girlfriend and asked her to take a look behind us. She immediately noticed it too. Something we both noted was that our eyes kept sliding off the figure. It was like we couldn't keep our vision centered on it. I was thinking this and she voiced it without me saying anything to her. 
I pulled my hunting knife from its sheath, but I somehow knew that it wouldn't do anything. Without looking away from the thing, I said, let's go, now. We backed away and then started running, and we didn't stop until we were back to the cabins. When I got back inside the cabin, the guy in the bunk next to me was still up texting his girlfriend. I quickly told him what I had seen. He looked at me and said, that's why I don't go out at night. I never went back out into those woods at night again, and when I talk about this, I still get chills and a nervous feeling. We had no drugs or alcohol, we were both under 21, and we were working at a church camp with strict policies, so I have no idea what we saw. When I, when I was around five, I went camping with my parents in a place called Bear Creek Reservoir in BC. It's a very isolated place, deep in the woods. We got there by driving up an old logging road. The actual reservoir itself was very beautiful and quiet. I actually looked up the area on Google Maps and it still gives me chills, even looking at it from a satellite perspective. But anyway. The day passed by without incident, and we mostly just swam the whole day. We went to bed that night, and nothing unusual had happened. But the following morning, I woke up in my parents' tent just as the sun was making its appearance. I unzipped the tent and noticed a figure standing maybe 50 feet away. The light was still fairly dim, so it was hard to make out distinct details, but it was just standing there, staring at me, unmoving. The entity had the figure of a woman of average size, but instead of seeing a face, there was just darkness. Even so, I could tell that it was looking at me. And instead of clothes and skin, it had leaves and sticks, as if it was made from them. I remember feeling very afraid of this creature, like if I left the tent, I wouldn't be seen again kind of fear. So I tried waking up my parents, and they were both really pissed that I woke them up, and they didn't believe me at all, until they finally got up later and explored the area. We ended up finding a bunch of man-made structures made of branches and other weird stuff in the area, but not one where I had seen it, so I don't know. Anyway, that's my true story. Let me know what you think. I'd like to go there again someday and see if I can find anything, but maybe it's best I don't. When I was in northern Nova Scotia this last year while camping and fishing, I saw these odd shadow figures in the treetops. Everything was proportional about them, except for their arms. They were just way too long. They appeared just after dusk and they never came near to the ground. They didn't necessarily feel malicious, it just felt bad like I shouldn't do anything that could draw their attention, or else it would have gone badly. Nothing of note happened other than them being there, but I'd never heard of anything like it before. Is anyone aware of any legends or anything describing shadow figures and treetops? I'd love to even have a name for these things, because to this day, I still have no idea what I saw. About two years ago, my husband and I took our five kids to a water theme park in Idaho. We live in Washington State. We borrowed my dad's trailer and truck and thought it would be less expensive and more fun if we camped at a campground down the road rather than the one made for the park. I've driven through Idaho before and so has my husband, but we've never stayed there before. To preface my experience, I have had nightmares on occasion where I felt like something was trying to possess me. 
I always end up reciting the Lord's Prayer or yelling or something. I'll be honest, sometimes it takes a couple of tries and I always have my husband wake me up because I'm screaming. I regularly pray for protection, wear protective crystals, and ask my guardians for protection also. I feel as though because I regularly research and read into the paranormal, it's best to take precautions. So here we are at this campground. The first night, everything was great. Nothing happened. The next day, we take the kids to the park, spend all day there, and come back to cook dinner and get ready for bed. I also must say, while I have read a lot about sleep paralysis, I have never experienced it until this night, and I have not since. Once we were all in bed, I started to fall asleep. While asleep, I feel awake. I can see the trailer around me in kind of what felt like a blur, but I'm unable to shout or scream or move. I look to the end of my bed and see what looks like a short, four foot tall or so demon-like thing. It has horns and it's difficult to make out its face and it's terrifying. All of a sudden, I feel my husband grab my arm and I'm awake. He says, you were screaming, are you okay? I told him I was fine and tried to go back to sleep, but the same thing happened again, except this time the demon was closer to me. I remember shouting in my head, Jesus is my savior, go away, but he wouldn't. I remember trying to scream for my husband, but I couldn't. Then once again, my husband grabs my arm and wakes me up, saying I'm still screaming. At this point, I still told him I was fine. I attempted to sleep once more, and the same thing happened again and again, and every time, the demon thing was even closer. No matter what I tried, he wouldn't leave, and again, my husband would wake me up. Eventually, I told him what was going on. He said he was sorry. This time, I didn't try to fall back asleep. I wrapped as much of him as I could around me and desperately tried not to sleep. I felt like something was trying to pull me towards sleep, but I fought it. Next thing I know, I woke up the next morning and told my husband the entire story. I have never researched the area. I can't remember the name of the campground. Because I was so terrified, I haven't really shared this story until recently. Where do I begin? This had taken place a few years ago. I was with my best friend, and we decided to go camping at a campsite in Flagstaff named Lockett Meadow. We had taken our dogs, and after a day of hiking and exploration, we played around a fire and eventually went to sleep. I awoke in the middle of the night to find this deep figure outside our tent, burying itself into our tent. It had this weird way of hovering back and forth over my body and my dog, who was curled up, awake, and not moving or making a sound at the bottom of my feet. I look over and I see my best friend passed out and his dog. I'm unsure whether or not his dog was awake, but I was clearly the only one between my friend and I that was, and I'm experiencing this terrifying encounter. I eventually covered my head and thought about anything to make me fall asleep. The next day, I asked my friend if he had somehow been awake through all of that. I explained what happened, and he replied no and thought that I was lying. I told him maybe it was a bear or something, so we looked around our campsite but couldn't find any trace. No trails, no prints, nothing. We also had food out on a table near our tents and a trash bag hung up on a broken branch. So even if it was a bear, I'm surprised it wouldn't have gotten into any of our food. Either way, I remember how scared I was seeing this dark object observing our tent. I don't know if it was the wind or a deer or a bear, who knows, but this is just one encounter out of the whole camping trip. The next night we decide to camp at Beaver Creek. Mind you, we were in Arizona before we settled in, we explored Sedona. We drove to Oak Creek and parked our car near a trail down to the water. 
We took our dogs and hiked to the creek. After we finished jumping in and swimming, we dried off and were about to head out. Next thing you know, we see from the corner of our eyes a big rock being thrown near us, making this huge splash in the water. We look up and can't see anything above us, so we run over stones and rocks to get a clear view of the top, and we see nobody. We yell out a bunch of foul stuff and heard nobody running off or anything like that. When we got to our next campsite at Beaver Creek and set up there, my friend told me that throughout the trip, since we started in Flagstaff, he's had rocks being thrown at him, even before that big ass rock at Oak Creek. We looked at each other and thought maybe someone was following and messing with us. Then we sort of laughed it off and said that was impossible and that we were just trying to connect dots and have it be a cool adventure. Nothing happened that night and going into the next day where we packed up and headed home with nothing of a memory to be justified by. To this day, I'm still not entirely sure what we encountered. This happened at a school camp when I was about 11 years old. Our school camp was scheduled to be at a campground about two and a half to three hours away. I remember talking to people about the camp and where I was going, and one of my friends who was a year older told me that they saw something like a pair of eyes when they were down at the creek one night. Skip ahead, I can't exactly remember what night this was of the five day camp, but I remember exactly what happened and I always will. We were sitting with the other students and we had just finished eating, meaning it was time to play games and to calm all the kids down. My friend Savannah told me that she needed to go down to our tent and change clothes and asked if I would come with her. I said that I would and one of the teachers said that I could go with her. Keep in mind the tents were way away from the rest of camp and it was actually a walk to get to them as it was a huge campground. So we got a torch and walked down to the tents. We got in and left our tent window open for light as it would have been awkward to have the torch on. Stupid, I know, but we were young. We turned around and I started changing too. Then something very bright caught my attention. I looked at the window and there were flashing bright lights everywhere and I swear there was no way it could have been a camera because there were tons at the window moving so fast. I quickly spun around and in like one second, they were at the door, then vanished. I quickly said to my friend, what was that? And we totally freaked out. We quickly finished getting changed and hurried back to our class and teachers where the teacher had just talked to the class we had to explain what happened to the teachers. It seems like just a sicko taking photos when you hear the story, but I promise that I know it wasn't a camera. You can take my word for that. There was no way, and I've been around cameras modeling and stuff, so I know what all the camera flashes are like. I don't know what I saw that night, and I don't think I ever will, but I know that I will remember that night for the rest of my life. A few years ago, my mom and I decided to take a road trip. We were going to different camping and hiking spots along the California coast, and we were in the Big Sur area at the time of this particular incident. It was getting to be later in the day, so we had sort of been scrambling to find a campsite to sleep at. I can't remember the exact details, but for some reason, we ended up going to this long, windy mountain road that seemed to go up forever. Eventually, at the top, we found this secluded site with camp spots and even a bathroom. We didn't see anyone around, but the sun was about to go down, so we figured we could find the person in charge in the morning and pay them then. By now, it was dark, and we had been around the fire for a few hours. 
our sight was right at the edge of the trees. I heard some rustling coming from that direction, and I looked up. Two people were walking one in front of the other, dressed in all white, perfectly clean clothes. The person in front had their arm back to hold the other's hand, but they both looked straight ahead, and they didn't acknowledge my mom or I whatsoever. They walked out of the woods, past us, and then right back into the trees. Here's what's weird. Neither of them had lights. They were totally barefoot, had no belongings with them, and were not dressed warmly. It was probably around 40 degrees, pitch dark and rough terrain. Not to mention the gut-wrenching, heart-dropping feeling I got when I saw them. I asked my mom if she saw that, and she said no, even though she was facing the same direction as me. I was on edge the rest of the night and had trouble sleeping. In the morning, my mom found the camp owner, paid him, and told him what I said I'd seen. He replied nonchalantly, Oh yeah, those are the night walkers. People see them around here sometimes. When she asked him if he thought they were paranormal, he said, Pretty damn sure. We got the hell out of there as soon as we could. This is my story of a dude I happened to come across in the deep woods in Florida. This was in Ocala National Forest. I probably came across either a poacher's camp or a drug operation, and they put signs up to scare people away. In any case, my friend and I were hunting and stayed out past midnight looking for hogs. We realized we were way deeper into the woods than we had planned on being, and we began to walk out. We were probably three or four miles into the woods, off the main road. We were walking in the dark, heavily armed with AR-15s, sidearms, and fixed blade hunting knives in a hip sheath. So we really weren't afraid of anything. Plus, the moon was bright enough to navigate by, even under the trees. We had lights mounted on our rifles, and I had a large, powerful flashlight in my hand that I could make into a strobe or use as a club. The point is, we weren't paranoid of anything. We felt very prepared. We were heading back and we started to hear something hauling through the woods on our right. It was about to cross the trail in front of us. Most trails are old logging roads. They're pretty wide and they make square quadrants out of the forest. This particular trail cut across one of the quadrants and was overgrown and thin. We thought it was a deer or maybe a black bear. Either way, we couldn't shoot it at night. So instead of using the rifle lights, I used my handheld light. We waited until we heard it get near the trail, and then I turned my light on. All we saw was a pair of white legs cross the thin trail about 50 feet in front of us. They looked human. We were a little baffled, like what moron goes crashing through the deep woods at 1 a.m. in shorts and through the thick brush, not the trail. Super weird, but again, and armed as we were for hogs, we pushed on because it would have taken like 30 minutes extra to turn back and go around the quadrant. We hear crashing now and then in the woods, but it never got close to us again. Finally, we reached my car and I was relieved that it was still there and not broken into. We keep the rifles loaded, shove our handguns between the seat and the center console and get into the front seat. I began to drive out of the forest with my moonroof open, and the stars were just gorgeous. It's easy to forget how amazing the night sky is in the middle of Ocala. About half a mile down the road, my headlights fall onto a man in a checkered button-down shirt and shorts, just walking along the road. We're miles from any paved road, and then it's another five to ten miles on the paved road to get to a town. Also, this is in the northern part of the forest, where there are no old cabins that were built before it was declared a national park. This dude had no backpack or anything. Was this what we saw across the path? If so, what was he doing walking out here at 1.30 to 2 in the morning with no supplies, no flashlight, nothing? He didn't even look at us as we passed. 
Anyway, as we got near the paved road, we unloaded the rifles and put them in the trunk and went home. It was a really fun trip, and I can't wait to go back. But I will always be armed in Ocala. Something seriously weird is going on out there. I took my super skeptic boyfriend on our first camping trip up to the Mount Adams area because I'd heard of some spooky UFO action in the area. We hadn't been dating that long. We saw some UFO action that defied his skeptic explanations in a dispersed spot, but nothing I hadn't seen before. Lights appearing out of nowhere, zipping along and then disappearing, lights appearing and joining up and then disappearing, stuff like that. It was pretty satisfying to hear him say, Yeah, I have no idea what that was. A few months later, we were camping with his dad and stepson, who were both longtime veterans in the Forest Service and Bureau of Land Management. We mentioned the spots where we had camped, and his stepdad, who is not a believer of anything like this, said that the area we'd been in had been his beat for years. Without any prompting from us, he said, we were supposed to be up there looking for camp thieves. We never caught any thieves, but we saw a lot of weird stuff in the sky. When I pressed him for details, he got a little cagey, but he did tell a really creepy story about how these big black logging trucks with no lights would appear and steal lumber in the middle of the night. So he and his partner staked out one night to catch them. They were backed into the bush and had to sit in complete silence to let the truck cool down so nobody could detect them with heat or night vision goggles. The back of the truck was deep in the bush, meaning that only the forest was behind them. Then, after over an hour of sitting in silence, these huge bright lights appeared behind them from deep within the forest. They were so bright he could see the entire outline of the truck, the antenna, the spotlights, and their silhouettes in the shadow. This was the early 80s, so we're not talking LED lights here. He said that he'd never seen anything like it. Then the lights went out, and everything was silent. No truck noise, no rustling in the forest behind them, nothing. I love the guy, but he has the imagination and personality of a potato, so there's no way he made this up. That's why it was so creepy and believable to me. He had a few other stories, too, that I'd love to get more information on. I, for one, believe him. For my lady's birthday, I took her to Gatlinburg, a popular, touristy, one main boardwalk town in the Smoky Mountains of Tennessee. We camped the first night, a few miles out in the woods at a popular location, Elkmet Campground. The campground was beautiful, tall green trees like baby redwoods, a clear water river scattered by checkered rocks, families with little ones running around. It was great. Through borrowing a tent, we found that we had no steaks and headed into town for supplies, whiskey, and hot dogs. It was dusk by the time we made it back to the campground. Most campers were surrounding their dissipating fires or cleaning up before the quickly coming night. Our tent was still up, but crunched up a little without the steaks allowing it to spread open as widely as it could. We fixed our tent and started a fire. As our night progressed, we found ourselves surrounding our campfire two to three hours later around midnight. Now, this was the sort of campground where another campsite is just 30 yards from yours. Bears frequent the area, and my girlfriend was already freaking out a little bit, which is why I booked our site in the dead center of the whole campground. All the other campers had gone to bed at this point, and the only sound we could hear was the slowly crackling fire and the light stream of the river flowing into the rocks. The clouds were covering a crescent moon, so there wasn't much light to begin with. We had flashlights, and I would occasionally shine the light around us while avoiding hitting the other campers, 
to confirm that we were fine and that there were no bears. Seemingly out of nowhere, from the campsite behind my girlfriend and to my left, a light shined directly on us and then all around in a frantic yet focused manner, kind of like the Eye of Sauron. I saw what appeared to be a man with the strangest gait I've ever seen. He wore a headlight and was focused on his picnic table. The man's gait seemed to me to be a little bit like Jar Jar Binks, just not normal. I could see through my periphery that the man focused his light on the picnic table, and whenever I turned my head toward him, immediately his light would hit my girlfriend and I. I could only see the outline of the man through the light of his headlight and the occasional flash of my light at his campsite once he continued to flash his light at ours in a very disconcerting way. This was the campsite across from us, where we saw no one at all the night prior. I could only see the outline of his body as all black, as if he was in an all black bodysuit. His movements were eerily repetitious. For what went on to close to an hour, this man would shine his headlight on his picnic table, make limited motions with his hands, if any at all, then walk five steps back to his tent, shine his headlight at his tent, then walk back to the picnic table, shine his light at us, and repeat it all over again. If this was just the man looking for something, he was on a cocktail of drugs. Once his light was on us for too long for comfort, I shined my flashlight on him for an extended period of time. It was at this moment when I went from annoyed to fight or flight. A chill ran down my back as I saw the outline of the man disappear in front of me and the light from his headlight bounce down to the ground, then fly across the ground from his campsite. It seemed to jump along the ground and into the bushes diagonally from both of our campsites. It wasn't like the headlight had been thrown, but as if it ran across the ground like if it was on the head of a dog. I took my flashlight away and watched his light slowly come back out of the bushes and climb back up to the height of a person. The shadow figure returned back, walking out of the bushes and back to the campsite to continue the same odd behavior. There were no sounds at all coming from this figure throughout the entirety of the night. Sometime later, we went into the tent for shut-eye, and the shadow man figure was still at his odd routine. The following day, the tent from the shadow man's campsite was gone, like no one had ever been there. I then found out that just a mile from our campsite was a small town called Elkmont Ghost Town, with abandoned buildings and a cemetery up a trail a bit. I couldn't find any other stories of Elkmont Mysteries, but I wouldn't be surprised if there are other stories involving the Headlight Man. This happened to me a while back when I decided to go on another camping trip alone. I always liked camping alone. There's something serene and sobering about being isolated in the middle of the wilderness, and I always found it relaxing. So I planned out what trail I was going to take and packed my camping gear and my rifle for protection, and I jumped in my truck. I get to this trail early in the morning, and I hike for about 15 to 20 miles until I find the right spot, and I head off the trail to find a place to put up my tent. I stumble upon this nice sized clearing and decide that it's a nice, beautiful spot to settle down. I am exhausted at this point, but I set up the tent at the southernmost edge of the clearing next to the tree line, and I manage to get a fire going. I roast some hot dogs and start to hear a sound in the distance underneath all the forest noise. It sounded like an animal, most likely a deer, with a lame leg as it sounded like the animal was making a walking, dragging noise. I felt bad for the poor guy, but it was too far away and it was getting dark, so I couldn't really go find it and put it out of its misery. I think nothing of it after that and I go back to eating my food. After I eat, I douse the fire and crawl into my tent and get into my sleeping bag. I decide that even at my exhausted and relaxed state, I can't go to sleep yet, so I pull out a book I brought with me and I start to read by the light of the lamp. 
Hours go by and I hear that sound again, this time closer, right at the opposite side of the clearing. Surprised, I put my book down and I listen to this animal walk drag across the clearing toward my tent. It's really loud at this point, and it now sounds like the hooves are all being heavily planted with the dragging noise following seconds after, almost like the deer is dragging something along. It makes it to about what I assume is the middle of the clearing and stops, and I hear nothing. No breathing, I mean not a sound from this animal. I unzip the tent and I look into the clearing. There's nothing but trees and darkness. What the hell? Unnerved at this point, I zip up the tent and sit there listening for other noises. Nothing. Just the crickets and the breeze. I decide that there are a lot of strange noises in the woods and I tried not to let it bother me. Besides, I had my rifle. I start to doze off when I hear men's laughter off in the distance to my right, then women's laughter, and then sticks snapping far off to my left. I'm up now, wondering if what I'm really hearing is what I'm really hearing, or if it's just a product of being half asleep. I hear more faint laughing from a couple of other directions, all different. Old men, old women, younger people, even children. And I confirm that it's real. The noises are closing in, and I grab my rifle, preparing to fire a warning shot off into the air in case they came too close. Something about this laughter, how far in I was, the noise earlier and the time of night, told me that this was not just another family strolling through. I was on edge enough already, but then I noticed that the nightlife was dead quiet. Not even the wind was making any noise. I decided enough was enough. I unzipped the tent and fired a shot into the night. I sat there and surveyed the tree line and saw nothing. I listened intensely to my surroundings, no laughing and the forest sounds had returned. Relaxing just a little bit and figuring that I scared off whoever it was, I sat down and in my exhausted state, I fell asleep. I wake up later in a cold sweat racked with anxiety, and it was still dark outside. I immediately hear two people whispering not far from my tent. Alert, I grab my rifle and I listen to what they're saying. I can't make out much, but I hear something about being lost. So I shout, hey, who's there? The voices fall silent. I shout again, are you guys lost? Who's there? Suddenly a huge burst of flame like a flamethrower erupted from the middle of the clearing, illuminating several silhouettes of people just standing around. In shock, I fire my rifle, blowing a hole in the front of my tent, and it goes dark. Without checking my surroundings, I get up and sprint out of my tent, making a hard left back to where the trail was. I hiked until sunrise back to my truck with my head over my shoulder the whole way, I never heard anyone follow me. I never saw anyone or anything the whole way out, but I couldn't shake the feeling that I was being watched. After that, my enjoyment of camping alone left me, just like I left all my gear in the woods that night. I managed a resort in the Adirondack for several years. The place is old and rustic. It's miles from civilization and very peaceful. It was built in the 20s and had somewhat of a sordid past. It was built for a Canadian senator who would run rum down from Canada during the prohibition. We still had the underground locked safe room where he would store the booze as well as hidden booze hiding areas underneath some of the cabins. Calvin Coolidge stayed at a camp across the pond during his presidency and would visit my camp, for the spirits, I'm sure. Anyway, I met a girl and decided to sleep out under the stars on the camp's peninsula. It started to rain, so I suggested we sleep on the screened in porch of the boathouse, which I thought was a pretty good compromise. 
So, after we were all set up, it was getting pretty late, about 1.30 in the morning or so. We were laying there, and I was all tossing and turning because I'd been asleep and woken up. So I have a hard time falling asleep after stuff like that. We'd been laying there for about a half an hour or so, when I hear the bathroom door open in the boathouse. It couldn't have been anything else but that door. I did all the maintenance on those old buildings, and oiling that particular door was on my work list for the next day. I knew exactly what it sounded like. My first thought was that it was my boss, the owner of the camp. She is notoriously nosy and has been known to spy on the staff in their staff quarters. So she was my first logical thought as to who had made the noise. Why she would have been hiding out in the men's bathroom in the boathouse for over an hour is beyond my comprehension. I proceed to hear footsteps walking across the boathouse, down the three steps onto the dance floor and stopping right in front of the door to the screened in porch. I lay there just waiting for the door to open and for my boss to call my name. As the minutes stretched out, I started praying that she would open the door, walk away, sneeze, dance the funky chicken, anything. But there was nothing. The rest of the night I stayed up, stiff straight in my sleeping bag. No receding footsteps, no door noises, no nothing. Just my girlfriend, myself, the night, and an empty boathouse. The next morning, my girlfriend, she wasn't at the time, but she was the four years that followed, rolled over to me and immediately asked me about the footsteps the night before. She had also stayed up all night, waiting for some other sound to explain those footsteps in the night, and heard nothing. She was terrified. We never went into that boathouse again. I unfortunately had to go to the boathouse myself on a daily basis. Everything was cool during the day. At night, I had to turn all the lights in the camp off. This is something I've done every night for the past three years. However, ever since that, there was always a sense of dread going in there, being alone in the dark in the boathouse. The worst part is that there's this enormous hanging bed in there in front of the fireplace. It was for the former camp owners to take naps on during the day hung on chains so that the bed could be lifted out of the way for entertaining guests in the evening. Every single night, that bed was swinging. A 175 pound bed swinging on its chains in the darkness of the boathouse. Until my last day at that camp, if I went in at night, that bed was swinging. A couple of years ago, my brother bought a large piece of land out in the middle of nowhere, about 30 miles or so from cell phone reception. It's quiet. There's no light pollution, no paved roads, and not a lot of people around. Shortly after he bought the place, two of my brothers, the landowner and another, myself and our families, spent a weekend camping on the land and doing our best to clean it up. People had used it as a dump. There were many downed trees and stuff like that. On the second night that we camped there, I woke up in the middle of the night to relieve myself. As I was walking to the bushes in the dark, I realized that I could faintly hear music. This didn't really strike me as odd because I knew my brother had a radio in his camper. I finished up and went back to sleep with no further thought on the matter. The next morning at breakfast, I mentioned the radio and the music. Several other people recalled waking in the night and hearing music. But here's the kicker. No two people heard the same music. Finally, the brother who had brought the radio woke up. I asked him about the music 
and he seemed a bit freaked out. He said that he woke up sometime during the night and went outside to smoke. He had heard music as well and had assumed that it was someone else. I should mention though, that he was the only one with a generator and a radio. If it wasn't his radio we heard, it wasn't anyone else's either. I've been back several times, but I'm a bit freaked out by that place at night. I have fun while I'm there, but I'm almost always armed and I don't sleep in a tent anymore. I sleep in my SUV with the doors locked. It might seem kind of dumb, but realizing that everybody heard different music when there were no people, no functional radios that were on, and no electricity is quite creepy. This happened maybe 20 years ago, when three friends and I went camping at Kentucky Lake. Well, technically it was Lake Barkley. So we had just settled on a campsite after hiking maybe an hour from where we had parked. It was on a small inlet, maybe 300 yards long and 150 yards to the opposite shore. We had it all to ourselves, and we camped near the U-bend of the inlet so we had a limited view of the lake proper. We could see it to the left, but it was mostly blocked by trees on the opposite side of the little bay. It being relatively hot and humid, we were all standing in the water after having set up our tents and things like that. The sun had gone down maybe an hour earlier, so there was still a little bit of light left. I think it was early summer or late spring. So we're standing there, shooting the breeze, you know, up to our shoulders in the water. It felt great. Suddenly, above us, there was a meteor-like fireball that lasted maybe two seconds at most. It appeared to be very close, but there's no way to be certain. We saw it fall behind the opposite spit of land, and presumably land in the lake. Immediately afterwards, the entire lake lit up, seemingly from the bottom. Seriously, all the water visible from where we were standing, including our little inlet and the portion of the lake proper, lit up like the entire floor of the lake was made of spotlights. It flashed two or three times and went out. There was no accompanying sound whatsoever. A few seconds went by when one of the guys asks, okay, did anyone else see that? which was followed by an evening of us all theorizing what it could have been because yes, we had all seen it. To this day, none of us have any idea what it was, but we all saw it. It may not be as weird or terrifying as some stories, but it's easily the strangest thing I've ever encountered. When I was 17 or so, two friends and I decided to camp in the field next to my housing estate so we could drink beer and listen to music as loudly as we wanted. This was a huge grassy field on a slight hill where all the surrounding houses were far away enough so that we wouldn't disturb the neighbors and we couldn't be seen by anyone unless they were extremely close to our tent. It became late, and my two friends had fallen asleep. I was having trouble sleeping around this time, so I lay awake for hours, just thinking. Around 3 a.m., I heard the distinct sound of grass and vegetation as someone walked on it outside of our tent. I was stunned with terror. For one, because this was a private field owned by a farmer, who would probably be angry to find us there, but more so because I hadn't heard anyone approaching. Just suddenly, there was someone outside the tent where there wasn't before, no approaching steps, nothing. 
I held my breath out of fear and shock, which is when I heard another set of footsteps belonging to a dog by the sound of it. Filled with dread, I just lay as still as possible, breathing slowly and quietly, listening to this person and his dog walking back and forth outside the tent. I thought we were going to get shot or beaten by this dude. Then I saw this guy's shadow, which freaked me out a hell of a lot more than I already was. It was huge and looming over us every time he passed our tent, and I couldn't see the dog's shadow even though I heard it making increasingly erratic circulations of the tent. This carried on for around five minutes, although it felt like much more time had passed. The shadows disappeared and the sounds faded away. They didn't leave or anything. It was more like they were still walking just outside the tent, but with perpetually lighter footing. When I was sure that the sounds had ceased and that there was no threat waiting for me outside, I freaked out at my friends, still as quietly as possible, and said that we had to go because someone knew we were here and we could get in trouble with the owner. I told them everything that had happened, but they didn't believe me thinking that I had been asleep as well and had dropped the whole thing. I assured them that I hadn't and that we had to go right away. They tried to get back to sleep, ignoring me because they're lazy as hell and didn't want to pack everything up and go. I gave up too, even though I knew that now I'd never get to sleep. 10 minutes later, the sounds returned in the same way they had gone the volume gradually increased just outside the tent. It wasn't like anybody approached. It was just louder and louder, and then it was there. I felt the same dread that I had felt before and whispered one of my friend's names so they could wake up and hear. One person said, shh. They had already heard it, and they told me to open the tent to see who was terrorizing us. I did so, slowly easing my hand out of the sleeping bag and up to the zipper. It felt like it took five minutes for me just to reach it, so I was sure not to make a single sound, and I pulled it down so violently I nearly ripped the whole thing in half. There was nobody there. We got out within the space of about five seconds, and there was nobody anywhere. As I said, we were atop a hill in the middle of a field so we could see if anyone had decided to run, but there was nothing. Even though it was impossible for anybody to escape our seeing them, I am absolutely positive that there were footsteps outside our tent that night. This is just added to by the fact that my other friends heard it the second time. To this day, we have no idea what it was. One summer, I helped the Boy Scout troop that I was a part of, and we took the troop down to Antietam National Battlefield. I received my Eagle Award two years before, but wasn't particularly active afterwards. I liked camping and they needed a few leaders, so I decided to go. A number of other troops had also come down for the weekend, and we had a weekend full of Civil War education, reenactments, and troops pranking other troops. All of the troops were camped along Antietam Creek on the other side of the Burnsides Bridge Road. That side isn't part of the park. It was pretty easy for anyone to cross the road and walk onto the battlefield to go up to Burnsides Bridge along the creek and see the field where the Union soldiers massed and tried to cross the bridge. I grew up outside of Gettysburg so ghost stories about Antietam didn't bother me at all. There's enough weird tales in Gettysburg that other battlefields really didn't faze me. The second night that we were there, the troops all hit the hay early due to the fact that they were made to march all day by an overzealous reenactor. I took a walk over to the bridge right after dinner and the sun was slowly sinking towards night. 
It was actually quite beautiful seeing the field and the creek. I walked up to the bridge and started to cross it when I felt an excruciating sharp pain in my chest. I almost doubled over in pain and clenched my chest. I thought maybe I was having a heart attack, but both of my arms were fine and free to move. I put both hands on the part of my chest that hurt and felt another sharp pain right below the top of my right shoulder, in the meaty part above your pecs, underneath your shoulder and just in front of your underarm. That pain came and knocked me down, where I almost cracked my head open on the side of the stone bridge. I laid there, freaking out, and scrambled to my feet and booked it back to camp. I got back to camp and had the other scoutmaster take a look at my chest. I have these two raised red lumps that under the skin you could see were turning into blood blisters. He asked me what I was doing and I told him that it happened when I was just walking around the battlefield. Not once had I thought about a haunting or anything like that. I called in an evening and turned in. The next morning after breakfast, the troops were scheduled to meet with a park official at Burnside's Bridge. Our troop and about four other ones stood on the battlefield facing toward the bridge where the park official was detailing the history of the battle. When he talked about the bridge, then I paid more attention. I found out the Confederate sharpshooters took up positions on the other side of the creek and that on the side where we were all at was the Union. The Union soldiers were supposed to take the bridge and were just picked off left and right up on that bridge. Confederates lost somewhere in the neighborhood of 500 soldiers and the Union lost over 15,000. No Union soldier ever made it past the halfway point of the bridge. At this point, my scoutmaster just looks at me and I'm wondering what the hell happened to me the night before. I'm pretty sure that I felt ghost bullets and to this day, it's one of the weirdest things I've ever had happen to me. At my high school, all the seniors went on an annual camping and rafting trip up in Maine. My class only had about 90 kids in it. All the kids got assigned cabins, four to a cabin. The campground was beautiful. It was right on this huge lake at the bottom of a mountain. On the first night that we were there, some of the people who worked there sat around this huge bonfire with us and told us the story of a ghost who haunted the grounds. Apparently, the campground used to belong to a rich family back in the early 1900s, and the daughter of the owner drowned in the river, or something like that, while sneaking around after dark with her lover. They said that if you were in bed and you heard the sound of rushing water, like a river, she was outside waiting to guide you to the river. If you saw her light, you would be entranced and she would walk you to your watery death. The teachers told us that they only told the story to scare the kids from leaving their cabins after bedtime and that it wasn't real. I got paired up with three other girls in my cabin and we stayed up the first night giggling and talking. By the time we finally fell asleep around 3 a.m., I was jolted awake by a loud sound. It sounded like something large splashing in water. The lake was nowhere near the cabins, by the way. You had to walk like 15 minutes to get to the water, and the river was at least three or four miles away. I figured it was a dream or something, so I ignored it. But a few minutes later, it happened again. I looked over and saw that two of the other girls were wide awake, petrified. One of them looked out the small window, but nobody was there. We didn't sleep well that night. None of the other kids heard the noise, 
except for a group of boys whose cabin was very far from us. They said they heard it at around 1 a.m., right outside their cabin. And when they woke up, there was a bright light shining into their cabin. When they looked out, they could see a light flashing in the dark trees. We all confronted the campground people, but they all said they had nothing to do with it. The teachers did runs every now and then throughout the night to check and make sure the students weren't out of bed or doing things they shouldn't be doing. They said that they didn't see or hear anything. We didn't believe them. And one of the girls in my cabin was so scared that she wanted to go home. She called her mom and everything to come and get her. Keep in mind, this trip cost all of us a lot of money and we had paid for three days. The teachers tried to calm her down and the campground people insisted on staying up with us to see if it happened again. She stayed. The next night, the teachers stayed outside our cabin while the campground people stayed outside the boys' cabin. All of the students were accounted for. One of the teachers continued to walk around and check all the cabins so nobody was out of bed. Nothing happened for a while, so eventually, I fell asleep. I woke up what seemed like minutes later to one of my cabin mates screaming and pointing at the door. I looked over and saw really long, dark, wet hair dangling in front of the window. The teachers came running in and a few minutes later, so did the campground people. The other girl was sobbing and it woke everybody up. We told them what we saw but the campground people said that nobody else was staying in the campground and the teachers confirmed that everybody was accounted for and nobody had wet hair. Nobody slept that night and for the last night, we all just camped out in the main hall because we were too afraid to sleep in the cabins. I had forgotten about this story until just now. I've always figured that either the teachers or workers there were playing a sick joke, but I guess I'll never know. One time, about two or three years ago, I was out in the woods camping with my brother. We had just gotten there at about 4 p.m. to set up and everything like that. Once we had everything set up, we got a fire going. I told my brother that I was going to go get some firewood because we really only had enough to start the fire. It was about seven o'clock and then I suddenly got really cold, even though the weather wasn't cold at all. When I got this sudden rush of coldness, I felt a heavy feeling of just pure evil and hatred and despair. I immediately went back to my brother. He told me that it was fine and that there was probably just a strong thing of wind that made me cold, but I knew something was wrong. We sat around the fire and I just felt like someone or something was watching me. Once again, I started to feel that same feeling of pure evil. It started to get worse and worse, kind of like it was growing inside me but I tried to brush it off and I just went to bed. At around 2.20 in the morning, I heard something that sounded like a scream and it woke me up. I looked around in the tent and got a flashlight. When I turned the light on, I noticed that my arm was bleeding and had been cut open by something in multiple spots. I woke my brother up in a panic and told him what had happened. He said that he didn't know what I was talking about and that my arm wasn't even cut, even though I was looking right at it and it was obviously cut open and bleeding. I was like, are you joking? He continued to say that nothing happened to me and kind of irritated, said that I was pranking him. At around that time, I felt a huge amount of pain in my arm and then I heard the scream again, but it didn't sound like how a human screams. It was more of a screech, as though there was some kind of animal or some creature in the distance that was in pain. I looked at my brother and asked if he had heard it, 
And he said, what do you mean? I didn't hear anything. Nothing happened. At that point, I was scared for my life. I mean, if it was an animal, he would have heard it too. I was just praying that nothing more would happen. After a few minutes, I heard the scream again. Every time that thing screamed, I would get that feeling again, and my arm would start to burn. Eventually, all of it stopped. After that, I wasn't able to sleep for the rest of the night. The next morning, I told my brother that I just wanted to leave right away. When we got into the truck, I could have sworn that out of the corner of my eye, I saw something run through the woods. We got to the truck, and I looked to the right while packing the stuff up, and four of the trees had marks, like they'd been clawed by something. The thing is, the marks were at least 12 feet up in the trees, maybe higher. At that point, I was tired and scared, so I just got in the truck and we left. To this day, I still haven't gone camping again, and I still wonder what that was. I've never really had any paranormal experiences before, but I cannot explain this. I'm in college, and about seven other people and I from my school went on a backpacking trip. We had two experienced leaders. We drove to Zaleski State Forest, which is in the Appalachian region of Ohio. It was early April this year, and it was cold. Everything was still dead from winter. After hiking miles into the forest, we set up camp at the backpacking campsite. There were a couple of other groups of people as well. A few of them were friendly older couples and then two college-aged girls. Everyone was pretty spread out from each other. We set up camp farther away from everyone else. I've always been able to sense energies of places and the energy in this place wasn't great. It was almost spooky. Each of us had individual one-person tents, and we formed a kind of cluster in this site, with my tent being in the back, so no one was behind me. Our cluster was also right next to the forest, because this backpacking site was like a big cleared off square in the middle of the trees. Fast forward, I'm dead asleep around 2 a.m., and I wake up to leaves crunching right by my tent. I hear footsteps, walking in circles around my tent. They had a sort of heaviness to them that couldn't be a deer or a dog. Also, it sounded like it was bipedal. I could not make this up. This creature or thing was circling my tent for a long period of time, slowly creeping up to the sides of the tent and then just stopping for periods of time that seemed like forever. Then it would move on, walking around the rest of our tent cluster. I could hear a human-like breathing from the mouth whenever it was close to my tent, like a sort of light heaving. I was shaking, too scared to unzip my tent and investigate. I kid you not, this went on for hours, and it seemed to me like I was the only one awake. Out of nowhere, I see an illuminated light shape from my tent, although I couldn't tell what it was from inside my tent because it was all zipped up. It was like a warm glow, and it didn't move, kind of like a flashlight would if you were holding it still. I was paralyzed in fear. I simply couldn't believe that it was an animal. At some point, probably due to sheer exhaustion, I fell asleep but I could hear the heavy footsteps circling right up until the point that I did. In the morning, I questioned my fellow campers about it, and my leader admitted that she had heard the footsteps and the noises as well, admitting that it was bizarre and that she would have investigated had she not been so groggy. One of the boys in the group said that he also noticed the light that came on, but thought that it was someone else. Not a single person in the group had gotten up to go to the bathroom or turned on a light that night. 
I've heard things about the Appalachian region being creepy and bizarre, and now I believe it. Some people on Reddit have leaned toward Bigfoot, because apparently he's associated with light orbs. I've never really been a Bigfoot believer, but I'm telling you, this didn't feel like just any animal, or person, or anything I've ever experienced before. So maybe Bigfoot is as good an explanation as any. A few years back, I went camping with two buddies in the mountains near Lake Tahoe. We hiked about two hours with our packs to a small lake and set up camp. All was normal during the day. We made some hot dogs and beans and then stayed up until it was dark to watch the stars. Once it was dark out, we hiked up to the top of a large boulder to get a vantage point to see the stars over the trees. I recall that there was no moon out that night because we could see the stars so clearly due to the limited ambient light. We were pretty far out there, so there was no background noise or light from humans. Once our eyes adjusted after a half an hour or so, we could see all of the stars and even some satellites slowly moving in the sky. After we're done stargazing, we head down to our tents that were set up right by the lake. We have two two-person tents for the three of us. My two friends shared one tent and I was alone in the other. We set up the tents right next to each other on the same flat spot. I fall asleep pretty easily because I was tired from hiking and exploring all day and because it was so dark out and I like sleeping in the dark. However, at about three or four in the morning, I wake up to a rustling on the outside of my tent. In my half asleep days, I'm not sure if it's just wind or something else. I keep listening and I realize that it's something brushing against my tent. It sounds like an animal pushing its nose against the tent fabric and sniffing. The sound is coming from the side of the tent right next to my head so I can hear it super clearly. At this point, my heart is racing and I'm lying frozen in my sleeping bag, hoping that whatever is outside will leave my tent and it'll just be over. I think about calling out to my friends in their tent, but I don't want to startle or anger whatever is outside. So I decide to just keep lying still and hope it will leave. My mind is going through every possibility when I finally realize what it is. When we had set up our tents earlier that day, there wasn't much flat space, so we placed our tents very close to each other like I said. Evidently, they were so close that when my friend was moving his feet in his sleeping bag, they brushed up against his tent, which was right near my head. So all along, it was my friend's feet moving around, and there was no animal or person outside. Phew. However, that wasn't the end of the weird stuff. And I only realized that this next part was weird once we had left the next day and I got home. As I laid in my tent and tried to slow my heart after realizing that the rustling was my friend, I was looking at the shadows of the trees on the wall of my tent. They reminded me of when I was a kid, when a car would slowly drive down your street and the headlights through the blinds would cast shadows that slowly draw across the ceiling. At the time, it made sense to me, and I thought it was just like when I was a kid. Considering that I had just thought a creature was outside my tent, this seemed like nothing. However, as I mentioned earlier, it was a moonless, pitch-dark night. So what could that light have been? It was a very slow-drawing light, that had the shadows of the trees moving across my tent walls for about five minutes. We were very far from civilization, so there's no way that it was a car or a flashlight from a midnight hiker, because the light was so steady and slow moving. 
I don't know if it was a flare or a comet streaking across the dark sky or something else. I still don't know what it could have been. And I think maybe I'm okay with that. In the early 90s, my parents sent me to a YMCA summer camp in the New Jersey Pine Barrens. It was called something like Matalonike, and it was located on the shores of a series of man-made lakes in Medford Lakes, so not exactly backwoods. We all knew the stories of the Jersey Devil, but the camp had a few of its own ghost stories. The White Lady, said to have jumped off a bridge on her wedding day, and Hatchet Harry, an axe-wielding maniac who got kids that wandered into the woods. I assumed both of these stories were developed to keep kids from wandering off. What I encountered was neither of those. I woke up in the middle of the night in my bunk, hearing some rustling in the bushes. The cabins were basically a half wall with screened windows all around, save for the back wall, with eight bunk beds, four on each side. You could lay in your bunk and look right out the windows. It really sucked, though, when it rained because there were no shutters to close. I had heard this rustling, so I grabbed my flashlight and I shined it into the bushes from across the front of the cabin, sweeping from bottom to top. There was nothing else in that direction save for woods, as our cabin group was right on the edge of the camp. I didn't see anything out there, so I put my flashlight back, but kept it next to me and got ready to settle back in. But then this light reappeared. It was this bluish white light and flickered slightly, kind of like a firefly. The light slowly followed the same path that my flashlight had traced from bottom to top. And then it disappeared. It scared the hell out of me, but I didn't bother to wake my grouchy counselor she wouldn't have believed me anyway, since she already thought that I was just a troublemaker. So I just smushed down into my sleeping bag and tried to get back to sleep. I never saw it again after that point. My best guess is some sort of firefly that thought my flashlight was a prospective mate, although the fireflies in that area usually had a greenish hue. I've shared this story before, but I've never really gotten a satisfactory response. Maybe I'll never know what that was, and maybe it was something totally natural. But I still thought it was really freaky. I have been backpacking and camping, mostly solo as an adult, for the majority of my life. I'm cautious about my surroundings, and I listen carefully when I'm out. I try to remain an observer and move through the land with as little impact as possible. I'm also very interested in the mysterious and the obscure. Cryptids, alternate realities, and the unexplained fascinate me. I've read most of the missing 411 cases, and I'm a serious devotee of true crime. All of the morbid and curious things I can find, I devour. Anything strange that will fire the imagination. There have been occasions where I have felt slightly uncomfortable, or watched even, when I've been out in the woods. But mostly, I've just chalked it up to being alone and alert. Maybe my inherent skepticism makes me less susceptible to encounters that other people experience. I always look for logical conclusions first. I even think that David Politis is experiencing some kind of confirmation bias. I don't know that all the missing 411 cases are what he thinks they are. I've never encountered any truly off or deranged people out in the forests, but I do consider that the biggest threat is the human animal. A few years ago, I set out to camp near an old growth forest in North Georgia. Most old growth here is gone, but there are places that haven't been logged. And if you get the chance to visit one, wherever you might live, I would suggest it. 
It's beautiful, serene and alive in a way that's hard to describe. This particular forest was one of hemlock and poplar, and the trees were massive. I had a guidebook that gave directions out into the sticks following little country roads that eventually turned into gravel. After a long drive into a national forest, I parked near the trail, which was unmaintained, meaning it wasn't very popular or highly traveled. I hiked out through the woods to where the trail eventually just kind of stopped. There was very little undergrowth. I spent the afternoon just exploring. I was looking at the trees and enjoying the calm. Eventually, I made my way down to a creek and crossed over it to an old field that formed a sort of bowl in the land, with hills and ridges on all sides. The fact that there was a field means that there had, I guess, at one point, been people living in that area, but I saw nothing of the sort when I was there, and my map showed that I should have been far from any roads or settlements. I set up my tent and made some food. It was late when I decided to have a little smoke and lay out in the field in front of my tent and just look at the stars before bed. There was little to no light pollution, and I always relished the opportunity to enjoy the sky at times like those. As I was laying there, I began hearing a loud knocking sound from up near the ridge where I'd been earlier in the day, maybe a thousand yards away. Three knocks and a long pause, followed by three more, and then it would repeat. When I say knocks, what I mean is a very loud noise, like two logs or trees being hit together, loud enough to reverberate in the little bowl that I was in, loud enough that you could almost feel it. I could pinpoint where the sound was coming from, but it was night in the forest and anyone who's been out there knows that it is dark. I thought it had to be a person making the noise because what else would make such a rhythmic sound? It was extremely loud and would have taken considerable effort to produce. I had seen no one else at all that day and the direction from which the sound was coming was the section of old growth that I had explored earlier. And that's it. That's the story. Eventually the sound stopped and I went to bed feeling like I had heard something that I wasn't meant to hear. Or maybe that I'd heard something specifically meant for me and me alone. Both disturbed me. I packed up and hiked out the next day. I'd be lying if I said I wasn't hyper aware and waiting for something else to happen, but nothing ever did. I've told friends about this and they'll either say that it was for sure a Sasquatch or that I was for sure close to someone's house that I didn't know about. But why would a person be out in the woods late at night, banging logs together in the dark? I'm not ready to come to a conclusion. Like I said, I'm a skeptic, but I'll admit that I have no idea how to explain what I heard that night. in a mountainous recreation area, well after dark, by myself, with no flashlight or camping equipment. I had planned on meditating and fasting all night. At about 10 p.m., I decided that I was hungry, and I started walking down off the ridge that I was on. All of a sudden, there's something big in the darkness. I hear its footsteps in the grass. It sounds very heavy, and very large. I got really scared and I started talking to it, pleading it to leave me alone, that I was just going down the hill and that I just wanted to pass and I didn't want any trouble. I started singing some kind of song and I found two rocks and started banging them together. I made it past the place that I last heard it moving, which was only about 14 feet from me. I heard it shift its weight. It was still there, but it didn't walk. The comforting part was that it wasn't moving toward me. The scary part was that all my forceful talking and shouting and noise making 
hadn't scared it at all. I had to stay close to its position because I was on a steep ridge. Something that wasn't afraid of me out there could only have been a bear or something paranormal. The last I checked, bears don't exactly understand human language and don't negotiate with you if you ask them to let you pass. I don't know. I banged the rocks together all the way down the hill so it could hear me moving away. I'm not really sure what this was. And sometimes I think that I'm just fine never knowing. Okay, so I had this experience a long time ago, and it's been something that has driven me crazy ever since. I need to know if this has happened to anyone else, or if anybody knows what it might be. I believe in the paranormal, but I had never heard of anything like this happening to anyone else. So here goes. When I was 10, I was at a friend's house for her birthday party. It was Friday the 13th, but nobody was really that aware of it. Like nobody thought of the date or anything. Anyway, it was a camp out in her backyard which is basically in the middle of the woods. When it comes time to go into the tent and sleep, most of the other girls decide that they would rather sleep inside. Except for me and one other girl, we decided that we wanted to sleep in the tent outside. So the rest of them all slept inside while this other girl and I were outside. The birthday girl's dad slept in a separate tent right next to ours. The girl and I were talking and then, for some random reason, I asked her what the date was. She said, oh, it's Friday the 13th. We both kind of paused for a minute, thinking it over. And we both just kind of said, whatever, that's just a myth. Remember, we were still young, so while we had heard that Friday the 13th was bad luck and stuff like that, we hadn't really seen any scary movies, and we weren't informed about all the bad things that happened on that day. To us, it was a campfire story. Anyway, we don't give it another thought, and eventually, we go to sleep. This is when things took a turn. I am a very heavy sleeper, but I was woken up in the middle of the night. I have no idea what time it was. We didn't have cell phones yet, but I think it was somewhere between midnight and 3 a.m. I woke up because I heard this deep, menacing laughter it honestly sounded evil. I sat up and it immediately stopped. I thought I must have just been dreaming, so I went to go lay back down. As soon as my head hits the pillow, it starts again. It's an extremely low man's voice, just going, ha ha ha. I wake up my friend from her deep sleep and ask her if she's hearing it. She sleepily says no. She said she didn't hear anything and she fell right back asleep. I brushed it off once again and once again I tried to go back to sleep. But as soon as I laid my head on the pillow, it started up. I noticed that every time I heard it, it got louder, as if it was getting closer. I tried one more time to go back to sleep, but this time it was so loud it sounded like it was 10 feet away. At this point, I wake up the girl and tell her we're going inside. She's tired, so she said she's going to stay out there. I wake up my friend's dad from his tent next to ours, and I tell him that I want to go inside. He woke up and escorted me inside where I was finally able to fall back asleep. I tell everyone the next day what happened, and they all tell me that I'm crazy. But when I talk to the other girl who was in the tent, she tells me that after I left, she started hearing it too, and that she would swear by it. Whenever I tell people this story, the first thing they say is that it was the dad messing with us, but I'm certain that it wasn't. I knew this guy very well, and he just isn't that type of guy. He's very plain and very quiet. I had known him a long time, and I've never seen him act differently. The other reason I know that it's not him is because the entire time it was going on, I could hear him snoring from his tent. So, 
it definitely wasn't him. I've never been able to get that evil laughter out of my head. Ever since that day, I've been afraid of the dark, and I've always felt like something is watching me. I suffer from sleep paralysis from time to time now, and whenever I do, I hear the laugh. This was 10 years ago, and it still haunts me. Something strange happened while I was camping at Gatlin Point in Land Between the Lakes Recreation Area. This past weekend, I was camping with some family and some friends there. This was quite a beautiful spot, right on the water. I had a great day setting up, cooking, and then a good evening, sitting by the fire and relaxing. At about one in the morning, my wife and I went to bed. At four, she woke me up and said that it sounded like somebody had thrown something into the lake. I told her it was probably just a fish jumping in the water. But right about that moment, I heard the splash, and it was not the sound of a fish jumping at all. It sounded like somebody had thrown a concrete block into the water. If you've ever heard a fish jump, you know that sound versus something thrown into the water. A couple of minutes later, there was another splash, but this time it was even closer and louder. A couple of minutes later, another. This is where things get really strange. At the waterline distance away, but right even with the tent, we heard a subdued scream and then the splash again. I opened the tent and shined my flashlight toward the shore and scanned it back and forth saying nothing. Nothing was there. Then the scream and splash again, farther to the right this time, but not by much. Then again farther down, and then gone. I got up and drove around. I searched with my light, and I found nothing. I don't really believe in ghosts or anything like that, but I'm having a really hard time with this one. Does anyone know what this might have been? Years ago, my parents bought a piece of land in the southwestern Colorado prairie, near the Huerfano River, deep in the middle of nowhere. I've lost count of all the camping trips that we had in my dad's expansive canvas tent atop what we would later dub as Cyclone Hill, on account of the furious winds we've experienced camping atop the hill. Some gusts powerful enough to rock our old F-150 back and forth. Immediately upon exiting the car, you feel the land. Call them spirits or psychic remnants, or just the knowledge of so many eras past leaving an indelible mark. The feeling of being watched is instant, constant, and lasting. Below Cyclone Hill is a spiraling labyrinth of arroyos dug out from flash floods over time. What's cool is that the deepest arroyos connect and lead a trail down south to where the road curves around the land and heads west, if you know which arroyos to follow. Usually this road is washed out completely, and instead of hard dirt road, there's about a foot or two of quick mud. As a kid growing into a teenager and then an adult, I have learned how to track animals that use the arroyo trails at night most of these are just coyotes, which yip and sing throughout the night. Eerie at first, maybe, but I've always found it kind of cute, listening to them make their way throughout the Arroyo Labyrinth, yipping and howling and singing all the way. There are jackrabbits that are almost too fast to see, lizards that live in the woodpile, and about a billion different bugs. There are beautiful families of hawks living in selected areas. For years, a great white owl lived in an old dried off chute of the river near cliff walls that rise on either side of the Huerfano, the farther east you walked, 
and occasionally you would hear this owl screech, and it was the most hauntingly beautiful thing you might ever hear. The only neighbors we had were tarantulas about the size of a frying pan that liked to say hi to you in the morning by climbing up on the walls of the tent. Honestly, they're very friendly. So now that I've established this area to you and hopefully demonstrated that I know this land like the back of my hand, let me explain, or try to explain, what happened to my dad and I one random day camping at our land. We always wake early to watch the sunrise, which is always worth it. It was summer, and the temperature at midday climbed into the hundreds, so you relished the cool, sweet, dewy mornings. While drinking coffee, my dad, sitting off at our table, leashed to the tent so the wind didn't take it to Kansas, I walked around to the west side of our 12 by 12 canvas tent, to where we keep a sizable wood pile for our camping stove. As I turned the corner to walk along and inspect our wood pile, I noticed something odd. And when I looked down, I saw a footprint. The prairie dirt was displaced with a perfect shoe print. It was a simple shoe pattern, very oval, like bulky skate shoes, except with a more rounded sole. The shoe itself was maybe a size five, tiny, especially compared to my size 12 boot. I knelt down to look at it, and that's when I realized that there were more, both in front of and behind me. Behind the tent, about 35 to 40 yards, is the road you come in on, that curves westward after sloping down about a mile south. The footprints came from that direction. At this point, in sort of a half crouch, completely forgetting the coffee in my hand, I followed the tracks all the way to the road, they were almost perfect indents every time. And what made me very puzzled was how long the stride was. Imagine your normal step and how long of a stride that takes up. Now take into account height and possible leg length. Now this is possible, I guess, but isn't it odd to imagine somebody with very tiny feet goose stepping along the prairie making strides that you would see someone making if they were over six feet tall. I certainly thought it was strange as I tried to match the stride and couldn't, even though I'm over six feet tall. Plus, with this strange stride, I could rule out my mother and sister who A, weren't there, and B, had short legs. Nobody else came here. There are no houses or people, and our land is clearly marked and fenced about as well as you can fence that land. At the road, the tracks stopped. And I don't mean I lost them down the road. I mean, they stopped. There was the road and then two perfect side-by-side -side prints as if someone had set their shoes down. Nothing before that. The idea that somebody could drive up to our camp, jump out and walk past our tent is creepy but I find it very hard to believe. If you've never been to the prairie, you might have gotten the idea from my mentioning of the wind and animals that nights out here are loud, as they are in the mountains or foothill campgrounds with lots of bugs and animal noises. You would be wrong. Yes, you can hear the coyotes, but they aren't nearly loud enough to penetrate the quiet of the night. It's so quiet that the slightest of sounds would wake up any moderate to heavy sleeper, and both my dad and I are light sleepers. The tracks I found by the tent and woodpile literally passed by my dad's head on the other side of the canvas tent. Whatever made them literally could have touched him, they were so close. With the way they were walking, too, I find it very difficult to believe we wouldn't have heard them considering we've been woken up many times to critters coming to check out our tent. Is it possible that I misread the tracks? Sure, I guess. But bear in mind that I've been doing this my whole life, and I've tracked animals back to their dens before. It's much easier in the prairie compared to the mountains or grassland, because the ground is dirt, and displaced dirt looks different than non-displaced dirt. A shoe print is a shoe print, 
and the distance between them was long enough to make me believe that this person was goose-stepping or just very tall with very long legs and very tiny feet. And that is just very odd. So where do the tracks go? By now I've informed my dad and showed him everything that I have found up until that point, including freaking him out some by pointing out how close the tracks were to him, separated by just a sheet of canvas. We geared up and followed the tracks out past the tent and down. The tracks descended the hill, never breaking the long stride, which is not only hard as hell to do, but dangerous, as the prairie dirt could easily slide on you and send you down the hill face first. I know this from experience. Once down the hill, the tracks descend into the Arroyos and to our shock, perfectly follow the Arroyo Trail. We track these footprints with true trepidation, growing more and more perplexed, as the tracks crazily walked up and down the arroyo walls at such extreme angles that whatever made them had to be walking almost sideways at some points. When we reached the road and the washout, we found the tracks stopped once again, just as they had appeared at the top of the slope. Only now, we would be able to tell if a car passed through here and picked up whoever the footprints belonged to. But there were no tracks. The washout was nice and flat, free of any human-made tracks. This freaked me out. It's not possible that you could pass through this area and not leave some kind of mark. I made a search in widening loops from the center of the washed-out road, covering at least 100 feet in every direction picking up the original tracks that led to the dead end and not finding them reappear anywhere. They were just gone. I put my hand in the last two tracks, both feet again side by side, like someone had taken their shoes off and stuck them in the perimeter of the mud to make two perfect prints. They were still soft and pliable. The mud hadn't hardened yet, still wet from the evening before. We pushed on toward the Werfano, all the while our eyes fixed on the ground, trying to find even the slightest hint of a track. There was nothing. Whatever it was, its tracks appeared on our road somewhere between 11.30 at night and 4.30 in the morning when my dad woke up, and they walked past two grown men, both very light sleepers, passing mere inches from one of their faces then proceeded to goose step down a hill, down into the arroyos and run up and down the arroyo walls as it marched on down the washed out road it had just been on, only to then stand perfectly still, feet side by side, and disappear. All in the middle of the night, all in the middle of nowhere on a random summer night. To this day, I think about those prints and really wonder what they could have been. The skeptic in me is just as puzzled as the believer in me. I really have no idea how or why this small-footed, long-legged person or thing just casually walked past our tent, down into some arroyos, which at night are dark and spooky as hell, and then disappeared back into the night it had come from. I've discussed this with my dad, and he holds the opinion that it may be a good thing we didn't wake up to see whatever the hell was out there. Because while we've never felt afraid down there, that day, we did. In all the years before and since, we've never had any encounters like that. And while we have had other weird things happen to us down there, involving voices on the wind and other weirdness, nothing tops that for me. And at night, when I'm all alone, lying in bed thinking about this, I can't help but wish I had seen it, whatever it was, because the mystery of it will confound and thrill me until my dying day. This happened in 2018, in December, just before Christmas. Two of my friends and I, we were 17 at the time, and a cousin of mine who was 15, were camping in the woods. It was on the property of one of the friends that had come along. 
We were there for five days and pretty much did it all by ourselves, except for water. That we would hike back to the house to grab for the day, since it was pretty impractical to get water ourselves for five days. This region was relatively dry, with no water filters or anything like that. We'd lie down pretty early, which felt rather primitive, literally when the sun set. Every night we would hear boar around our tent and steps. Paranoia fueled it a lot, but we had a bow, two axes, and some big knives. One day though, and I think this was either the last night or the second to last, we were just having a chat after dinner, like we would often do, and we hear a scream. It was pretty odd. It didn't sound human, but I have no clue what animal would be doing it either. I know a fair amount of our country's fauna. I've heard a lot of their screams, but this one was just different. The scream sounded like it had a buildup, not like a scream where you immediately hear the loudest part and then it dies off, but like it started low, got really intense, and then stopped. It sounded far enough, say 50 to 70 meters or so, but then it happens again, and again, and again. Now, suddenly, it's coming from almost all sides, and it was getting pretty close. It didn't sound super menacing, even though we were really scared, shooting my air gun with no rounds just to make a sound. It got to the point where the sound seemed like it was coming right to where the campfire couldn't shed light, just outside of what we could see. I remember that we had set up some traps for rabbits down the trail that day, so we gathered all the strength and courage that we could, and we went there. The bait was gone, but the traps were unarmed, and that was a stupid idea anyway. Rabbits don't scream like that. We had some pretty strong flashlights, but we couldn't see a thing. All of a sudden, the sounds just stopped, with no clear reason. It was the most terrifying experience I've ever had, and anytime somebody asks me for a scary story, I share this one. Also, where I live in Portugal, we don't have any cougars or anything like that that typically screams. Maybe there's no explanation, I don't know. But all I know is that it terrified me, and I still think about it to this day. A few years ago, my mom and I decided to take a road trip. We were going to different camping and hiking spots along the California coast, and we were in the Big Sur area at the time of this particular incident. It was getting to be later in the day, so we had kind of been scrambling to find a campsite to sleep at. I can't remember the exact details, but for some reason we ended up going up this long windy mountain road that seemed to go on forever. Eventually, at the top, we found a secluded site with camp spots and even a bathroom. We didn't see anybody around, but the sun was about to set. So we figured we could find the person in charge in the morning and pay them then. By now it was dark and we had been around the fire for a few hours. Our site was right at the edge of the trees. I heard some rustling coming from that direction and I looked up. Two people were walking one in front of the other, dressed completely in white, in perfectly clean clothing. The person in front had their arm back to hold the other's hand, but they both looked straight ahead, never acknowledged my mom or I whatsoever, and then walked out of the woods, past us, and right back into the trees. What's weird is that neither of them had lights. They were barefoot. They had no belongings with them, and they weren't even dressed warmly. It was probably around 40 degrees, pitch dark, and rough terrain. Not to mention the gut-wrenching, heart-dropping feeling I got when I saw them. I asked my mom if she saw that, and she said no, even though she was facing the same direction as I was. She could never see them. 
I was on edge the rest of the night, and I had a lot of trouble sleeping. In the morning, my mom found the camp owner, paid him, and told him what I had seen. He replied nonchalantly, Oh yeah, those are the night walkers. People see them around here sometimes. When she asked him if he thought this was paranormal, he just looked at her and said, Pretty damn sure. We got the hell out of there as soon as we could. Given that this happened in the middle of the woods at night in the Pacific Northwest, as well as the fact that I was a child when it happened, I understand that this could be almost anything. However, even at 23, recalling this moment still brings tears to my eyes and cold chills down my back. I was about 10 years old and it had to have been around 11 p.m. I was at a horse camp in Battleground, Washington and I was the only person awake in my cabin. I heard this sound far off in the distance. It sounded like a horse whinnying, which makes sense. Only it didn't stop. It was one long whinny that kept going. After about six to seven seconds, the pitch grew lower and lower until it turned into this god awful, low guttural scream. It went on for probably about 30 seconds with no pause. I know 30 seconds seems short, but when you're sitting there as a child with nothing between you and it but a screen door, it feels like ages. I never heard that sound again after that, and I know it's a very short story, but even now when I tell this story, it brings tears to my eyes. Other than Bigfoot, because I'm sure it's not that, is there any folklore pertaining to the Pacific Northwest that could account for this sound? I don't know of anything that starts out as a horse whinny, never stops, and ends up in a demonic growling scream. I would love to know what it was that I experienced. Maybe I won't be so afraid of it anymore. A few months ago, three other friends and I went out to camp near a lake. We went camping on the shore of the lake, right next to a forest that went up a hill. It was nighttime and the sky was very clear. We had a fire going and so one friend and I decided to go a bit farther near to the lake to look at the stars. You could see the Milky Way and everything. It was really cool. While we were there, we were talking a little bit, and I noticed a light in the forest, above where the other two friends were, and above where we were camping. It was really bright in the middle, like a white orb, and at first I thought it was a person with a flashlight. The next thing I know, it zipped in a straight line, super fast, then went back again, with the same speed. Then, instantly, it just disappeared. My other friend who was with me saw it, and we both got really freaked out. He is very religious and can't explain it to me, but still doesn't want to believe that it's anything paranormal. So I'm kind of alone in this. The other friends didn't see anything because it was behind them. I have no idea what it could have been. The weird thing was that it was at the moment we noticed it that it reacted and moved around and disappeared. I wonder if it had been there the whole time while we were camping. There would have been no way to see it. Only when we moved away and then faced toward our camp could we have seen it. I told my other friends about it and they thought I was just joking. And the friend who was with me and saw it doesn't want to talk about it. So I don't really have any good answers. For the rest of the camping trip, I felt really uneasy.
This happened to me a while back when I decided to go on another camping trip alone. I always liked camping alone. There's something serene and sobering about being isolated in the middle of the wilderness, and I always found it relaxing. So I planned out what trail I was going to take, packed my camping gear and my rifle for protection, and jumped in the truck. I get to this trail early in the morning, and I hike about 15 to 20 miles in until I find the right spot. I head off the trail to find a place to put my tent up. I stumble upon this nice sized clearing and decide that it's a nice, beautiful spot to settle down. I am exhausted at this point, but I set up the tent at the southernmost edge of the clearing next to the tree line, and I manage to get a fire going. I roast some hot dogs and start to hear a sound in the distance beneath all the forest noise. It sounded like an animal, mostly like a deer with a lame leg because it sounded like the animal was making a walking, dragging noise. I felt bad for the poor guy, but it was too far away and it was getting dark, so I couldn't really go find it to put it out of its misery. I think nothing else about it after that and I go on eating my food. After I eat, I douse the fire and crawl into my tent and get into my sleeping bag. I decide that even at my exhausted and relaxed state, I can't go to sleep. So I pull out a book that I brought with me and start to read by the light of my lamp. Hours go by and I hear that sound again, this time closer, right at the opposite side of the clearing. Surprised, I put my book down and listen to this animal walk drag across the clearing toward my tent. It's really loud at this point and it now sounds like the hooves are all being heavily planted with dragging noises following seconds after, almost like the deer is dragging something along. It makes it to about what I assume is the middle of the clearing and stops. I hear nothing, no breathing. I mean, not a sound from this animal. I unzip the tent and I look into the clearing, nothing but trees and darkness. What the hell? Unnerved at this point, I zip the tent back up and I sit there listening for other noises. Nothing, just the crickets and the breeze. I decide that there are a lot of strange noises in the woods and just tried not to let it bother me. Besides, I had my rifle. I start to doze off when I hear men's laughter off in the distance to my right then women's laughter and stick snapping far off to my left. I'm up now, wondering if what I'm hearing is really what I'm hearing, or if it's just the product of being half asleep. I hear more faint laughing from a couple of other different directions, all different, old men, old women, younger adults, even children, and I confirm that it's real. The noises are closing in, so I grab my rifle preparing to fire off a warning shot into the air in case they came too close. Something about this laughter, how far in I was, the noise earlier and the time of night, told me that this was not just another family strolling through. I was on edge enough already, but then I noticed something. The nightlife was dead quiet. Not even the wind was making any noise. I decided that enough was enough. I unzipped the tent and fired a single shot into the night. I sat there and surveyed the tree line and saw nothing. I listened intently to my surroundings. No laughing and the forest sounds had returned. Relaxing just a bit and figuring that I had scared whoever was there off, I sat down and in my exhausted state, I fell asleep. I woke up later in a cold sweat, racked with anxiety, and it was still dark outside. I immediately hear two people whispering not far from my tent. Alert, I grabbed my rifle and tried to listen to what they were saying. I couldn't make out much, but I heard something about being lost. So I shouted, hey, who's there? The voices fall silent. I shout again. Are you guys lost? Who's there? Suddenly a huge burst of flame, like a flamethrower, 
erupted from the middle of the clearing, illuminating several silhouettes of people just standing around. In shock, I fire my rifle, blowing a hole in the front of my tent, and it goes dark. Without checking my surroundings, I get up and sprint out of my tent, making a hard left back to where the trail was. I hiked until sunrise back to my truck, with my head over my shoulder the entire way. I never heard anybody following me. I never saw anyone or anything the whole way, but I couldn't shake the feeling that I was being watched. After that, my enjoyment of camping alone left me like I left all my gear in the woods that night, and I've never done it since. The summer after my second year in high school, I went up to Pike National Forest in Colorado for a summer field biology camp. It was pretty cool because I'd never been camping prior. I had a small two-man tent that I shared with my buddy from school. We had met this kid at camp and instantly became really good friends. His parents were loaded and his tent, which was about 10 feet from us, was huge, like a 10-person tent. The night before this incident, a huge windstorm blew through the valley and absolutely annihilated his huge tent. Mine was fine because it was low to the ground. Anyway, for the rest of the time, he slept in our already packed tent. I slept closest to the door of the tent because I always had to pee in the middle of the night and I didn't want to have to climb over people. So the night this all went down, I woke up, no idea what time it was, went outside to the forest, peed, and crawled back into the tent. I was laying there for a bit, and there happened to be a lightning storm overhead, cloud to cloud. As I was watching the light illuminate my tent, I started hearing whispering. It was female whispering, back and forth. I tried to hear what it was saying, but it was unintelligible. The whispering started to get closer and closer until it was right next to the tent by my right ear. It just stopped. I didn't hear anyone walking or anything like that. Then all of a sudden, lightning lit up the tent and there were shadows of people cast onto the side of the tent. That's when the chanting began. It sounded like a different language, all female voices and a bunch of them. I just closed my eyes and slipped under my sleeping bag, terrified, and put my hands over my ears. The next day after breakfast, we all went back to the tent to get changed, and the new guy who was now staying with us says, pretty wild last night, right? To which I responded, you mean the lightning? He said, no, the frickin' scary chanting. I think this place is cursed or something. So it wasn't just me. But it did help that someone else had heard it and we could talk about it. Now, every time I go camping, I stop drinking anything two hours before I plan to sleep so that I don't have to wake up in the middle of the night to pee because I am not going out there. This happened on a cliff overlooking the ocean. My family and I were camping on a site close to the edge. And one day during our stay, we all started hearing this guttural howling noise coming from the cliffs. It was like nothing I had ever heard before. We were curious, so we took the long walk to the cliff to see if we could identify the source. As we got closer, it got louder and louder until it was drowning out any other sound. We could barely hear each other when we were yelling to each other. The sound seemed to be traveling up the cliffs from the beach below, but it was like a mixture between what I would describe as a mechanical sound and some giant thing roaring in anguish. We all had inexplicable feelings of dread and we booked it out of there as fast as we could. The noise did not get quieter as we descended back to our tent. 
it stayed at its deafening volume. The strangest thing was that no one around us could hear it. We asked and observed people through the day and night to see if they reacted or looked curiously, but nothing. We were the only ones who could hear it, and that was impossible considering how loud this thing was. The volume made the ground feel like it was shaking. It was one of the strangest things that we've all experienced. I don't know if it was some kind of mass delusion or something like that, but it was definitely wild. When I was young, I attended the local scout group based in my village in Hampshire. The amount of things that I learned from scouts and the lessons that it taught me are innumerable, but one particular memory stands out. Once on a camp at an old scouting campsite, I remember we were playing a game at night, which was World War II themed. Our leader loved creating military themed games. In this game, each team had a bomb a colored string of wool, that they had to fix to the enemy base, which was a random piece of rope that was put up in the woods, making sure not to get caught by the enemy soldiers, which were the leaders carrying flashlights. As somewhat of a tactician, I departed from the other scouts, who were heading straight down the main path toward the enemy base, and also toward the leaders, instead opting to flank around deep into the woods which took longer, but proved to be more successful in the dark. Eventually, deep in the woods and on my way to another bombing run, I heard the distant sound of the whistle. This signaled that the game was over and that everyone should return to the camp. I began making a leisurely stroll back through the darkness. I can't remember if I was alerted by sight or by sound, but my attention was drawn to a short silhouette walking through the woods about six to eight meters away. Assuming that this was one of the younger scouts who was also returning to camp, I decided that it would be funny to try and scare them by making growling noises. Immediately after making the noises, the silhouette stopped dead in its tracks, turning toward me. In the darkness, I couldn't make out any of their clothes or features, but I could clearly see the blacked out silhouette of a child. After the figure had clearly noticed me, but not made a sound, I decided to carry on making growling noises. But then the silhouette just turned around and began to walk away from me. They were clearly unfazed by my attempt to scare them. So I figured that I would just follow them back to camp. However, after a few steps, the figure literally face planted into the ground, still about eight meters in front. I jogged a bit to catch up with them and make sure they were okay, but upon reaching where they were, there was no trace of anyone. Confused, I looked around for a short while, seeing if they had scrambled off, but there was no noise of someone running away, and I didn't notice them get up. They had just vanished. Still in a state of confusion, I continued to walk back to the camp alone. I didn't really tell anyone until years later when it clicked in my brain that things just didn't add up. Something else that sticks in my memory from that camp, which is probably unrelated but still strange, was that part of the woods had been cut down and the grounds heavily churned up by some sort of heavy duty machine. Whilst exploring this area, some of my friends and I found an old leather briefcase that looked like it had been churned up by whatever machine had been in the area. Upon opening the briefcase, we found a really old scouting uniform. Think sand colored and military style with shoulder lapels, with quite a few loose badges and some other personal items that I can't remember. I don't know if it was related to the boy or not, but it's still kind of strange. Before I tell you my stories, it might be helpful to tell you more about my background. 
I'm a 23-year-old boy whose family moved during the Yugoslavian War in 1999 from eastern Serbia to Switzerland. We used to live in a small village across the Danube at the Bulgarian and Romanian border, a region that has a very colorful history. Many bloody historic events occurred on the soil where we live. Roman emperors used to rule this area as well as many historical figures such as Attila the Hun, Alexander the Great, or Vlad the Impaler, all of which resided here once and fought battles. The region has been occupied many times. The longest used to be under the Ottomans. This occupation lasted for almost three centuries. After the Ottoman occupation, the country didn't have much time to recover, and the First and Second World War had struck the country already. Many people died during the First World War, about a third of the population. As a result, guerrilla groups like Setniks, Partisans, etc. were formed, killing even more people. In conclusion, many people were unjustifiably tortured and lost their lives, which is probably why there are many occurrences of the paranormal here. Magic is also very common here. The so-called Vlak Magic or Vlaska Magica in Valation is said to be one of the strongest in the world, and many people tend to practice it and religiously believe in it. As a result, there are many stories about paranormal events. One of my favorite ones is a story my grandfather told me. He grew up in the forest in a small and old house about 300 years old. He was adopted by my great-grandfather, who used to be a leader in one of the upcoming resistance movements against the socialist regime after the Second World War. He fought in both world wars and, even with all this, he took great care of my grandfather and loved him as if he was his own child. Fifty years passed since he left his home, and all of those people living here died, but my grandpa still visits this house and stays overnight there. This place creeps me out. Even during the day, there's an aura to this place that just makes it uncomfortable to be there. I can't imagine staying there overnight, but he frequently does, and one day he told me a very strange story. While he stays there, he says he often gets visited. At first, I thought visit like the ones you get from neighbors or something, but he told me that one night, he woke up to a hand crawling over his head. It was a huge, white, pale man kneeling next to him and sort of crawling over his head, speaking with a calm voice in Vlaski, the dying language that we used to speak here, which is a mix of Moldavian and Romanian. He told me that his skin was white and that it was glowing in the night. He didn't have any hair and the hand felt very soft. My grandfather has always respected the dead and was never really afraid. He told me that he didn't really speak to him and just enjoyed his company, since he knew in some way that he wasn't evil. Another time, he told me that he used to fix small parts around the house. When it started to get dark, he slowly began getting ready to leave his tractor because it takes like an hour to reach the next civilized place. While putting stuff back into the barn, he heard loud noises in the attic. It didn't bother him until a plank was thrown down the stairs. He recalled one time they even threw down a rock into the wheelbarrow that he was pushing into the barn. He told me he just turned around, locked the barn, and didn't even frown. They expect you to react, he said. Don't give them this pleasure. He told me this while laughing, then said, it makes them go crazy. Growing up, I heard a lot of these stories, and it really does run in our family, having these experiences from time to time. The scariest thing that happened to me occurred during the summer of 2009. My grandfather told me during this summer break, as usual, stories from the past of how he used to walk these woods alone in the dark and what he experienced while doing so. And since I was in my teen years, I started to question the reliability of his stories. From time to time, I took out my old motor bicycle and drove it out into the forest. Driving around was the only time I could really think about stuff and, you know, be in this type of state where you question everything and think about the world. 
So one day, I took out my bike and decided to drive around. I still don't know why or how, but somehow I found myself driving to the old house that he grew up in. I didn't really bother to question why my intention was to drive there, so I just kept going. I always believed that I was a kid, pure by hearth, and no evil could ever come to me. While I was driving out, I thought about the probabilities of actually encountering a vampire. I live, as I mentioned, in East Serbia, where vampires are still widely believed in. My grandpa always told me not to go out past dark, but I didn't really care, so I still kept going. Remembering back, I thought that his intention was to keep me scared so I didn't get lost in the woods. But being a teenager at the time, I thought I was invincible. And in fact, even if a vampire did cross my path, that I would pass by him with no harm. There aren't really streets there, it's just a dirt road between trees that leads to what seems like nothing. After an hour, even the dirt road started to vanish. While I was driving and thinking about how strong I was, I noticed that my hand felt very wet. I thought it was because I was sweating, since this region can get very hot. After taking a look at my hand, I saw that there was blood all over it. At first I thought it might have been a bug that I had squished, but there was just too much blood for that. So I started to look for wounds, but my hand seemed perfectly fine. My heart slowly began racing, and I took a sharp turn and drove back home. I remember this to be the moment that I was the most scared in my life. I had the urge to look behind me every second that I was driving through the forest. It felt like someone was sitting behind me just waiting for me to fall down. After arriving home and telling my grandpa, he just started laughing and told me never to question their abilities again. Everything happened this summer when I was working and living in the Chicago area. I don't know much about spirits or paranormal events, so I'll give you the facts of what happened and you can come to your own conclusions. In the first few weeks of my new job, I met this really great guy. We'll call him Paul. We hit it off immediately, and one day he suggested that we go hiking in the woods. I'm originally from Russia, so I was practically raised in the woods. I spent half of my childhood in them, and I was really excited about his proposal. As we're hiking, it starts raining, like pouring rain. I've never seen anything like it. We go deeper and deeper into the forest until there are no more paths, and we're practically treading swamp water. All this time, we're just talking about random stuff and getting to know each other while not really paying attention to the surroundings. There's no one around since we've gone pretty deep into the woods already and it was pouring buckets. Eventually, we stumble on the skeleton of a teepee, just the bare wooden structure of it, and thought that it was pretty cool, so we kept going in that direction. Suddenly, we both hear someone crying. It sounded like a baby. It is a forest, so lots of animals can imitate that sound, like deer, cubs, etc. And the cry sounded distant anyway, so we thought nothing of it and walked forward. Within seconds, we heard this thing right next to us, which seemed strange since it sounded so far away at first. It was so loud now that it could have been a few feet away. We start looking all around even looking up into the trees, and absolutely nothing was there. It was a pretty weird situation, so we kind of speed walked in the other direction. As soon as we stopped for a break, the sound starts up right next to us again. It was like something was telling us to book it, so we did. We ran faster than what was probably safe in that kind of weather, half looking at Google Maps and half relying on memory we made it back to the entrance of the woods. Both of us agreed that what happened was pretty weird and decided to look into the history of the place. Immediately websites like 
most haunted forests in Illinois started to pop up. Turns out that the place was the site of ancient Native American burial grounds. Not surprising since a lot of tribes used to live in various parts of Illinois. And apparently, it's where three young boys were brutally murdered and left naked in a ditch. Pretty dark stuff. Paul and I went back and I kind of forgot about the incident. Until one evening after work, he tells me that he can't stop thinking about the cry and he wants to go back to see what was there. Naturally, I think it's a stupid idea, especially because it was already dark out. But then Paul's friend Ryan joins him for kicks. And since I'm worried for both of their safety, 20 something fresh out of college dudes can be very dumb. I come along thinking that at least I could try to keep them out of trouble. So we hop in the car and we drive over there. Traffic is insane and my friend takes a wrong turn. So we get there at around 11 PM. We get out and head into the forest. Now there's no street lights anywhere near us, except right at the edge of the road and flashlights can only do so much. So our visibility is pretty bad. We eventually get to a small wooden bridge that leads us across the river into the actually deep part of the forest. As soon as we cross, I start feeling uneasy. We weren't supposed to be in the woods that late in the first place, but this was a deeper feeling of guilt, like we were intruding or disturbing something that was there. Ryan, who's been leading the way and feeling all confident and cocky, saying that there's nothing out here, stops all of a sudden. On the other side of the bridge, the three of us were hit with this feeling of dread and panic, one that I've never felt before in any forest, and I've been to lots, both in the day and at night. We all exchange nervous looks, and suddenly, we hear crunching, coming toward us from the dark. The feeling at this point gets so intense that Ryan, confidently walking ahead seconds ago, now looks uneasy and says, I think we should go back. We all slowly turn around and start speed walking toward the bridge. No one talks until we get to the other side. And Ryan says, I, I was just nervous because, you know, I might have been a homeless person and I didn't want to deal with that. Right. Eventually, we get to the road where our car was parked along the side. And that's when I see a girl, maybe in her early 20s just walking along the highway. She was wearing very little clothing and looked a little strange. Her walk wasn't a drunk one. She just seemed to be almost, I don't know the right word for it, but vibrating, undulating, I'm not sure. But there wasn't a building around for miles, just straight road. My stepdad is Malaysian and he's told me a bunch of ghost stories about young ghost women on the side of the road killing drivers but I was willing to risk it because I didn't want to leave this girl all alone, ghost or no ghost. So I convinced Paul to slow down a bit when we got to her. I called out to her from the passenger window, asking if she needed help. The girl slowly turns around and with the creepiest, slowest smile spreading across her lips, she nods. I was hit with that same feeling that I had gotten back there in the forest and almost regretted slowing down. But whatever, my sense of wanting to help that girl was greater than whatever weird stuff I was feeling. And if I died, well, at least I'd have a clean conscience. She gets in the back of the car, right behind my seat and next to Ryan, and he just starts to chat her up, flirting, asking her where she's from and what she's doing. Typical. All this time, I'm turned halfway around keeping an eye on her because I feel like as soon as I turn around and face the road, something bad is going to happen. She's keeping steady eye contact with me the entire time, even when Ryan is talking to her with that slow, creepy smile while slightly undulating. I still don't know what to call it, but it seemed snake-like. Ryan asks her where she's coming from and she says, oh, just around. He asks if she's coming from a bar and she nods her head yes, except there's not a single bar anywhere even close, not for miles and miles. She said she was walking home and gives Paul an address, 
which is 15 minutes away by car along nothing but forest. My eyes literally hurt from keeping eye contact with her, and she just keeps smiling and undulating and giving off this feeling of dread. This feeling just keeps increasing, so eventually we drop her off at her street. There are lots of old looking smaller houses there. When I turn back to look at her a second later, she's completely gone. I couldn't sleep that night. I kept imagining her creeping up the stairs, her smiling face undulating from the shadows. About three years ago, I was on a family vacation to Eastern Washington, and a central aspect of our trip was visiting Lake Paragon State Park. It's an extremely rural area with a tiny Western town about a mile away, and that's about it for miles. Anyway, we had just arrived for our 10 day stay in the afternoon, and it was now around 11 PM. My mom and I left our hotel to go down to the park as she was really into photography and the moon was full. If you're not familiar, Eastern Washington as a whole is pretty desolate. So the night sky is generally incredible with very little light pollution. There were no clouds to be seen and we were a ways down a dirt back road over the park above the campground with no real roads anywhere in sight. We got out of the car and took some pictures with nothing more unusual than the eerie silence. About 15 minutes into our visit, we're both facing away from the moon, looking at the rolling hills, and we notice this odd concentration of light on one hillside, about a quarter mile away. Before either one of us could point it out to the other, the mass of light shining on this hill rolled away into nowhere. It took two seconds and was entirely gone. The whole hillside was brightly lit up and then nothing. We freaked out and got out of there as fast as humanly possible. We both saw it. There were no other people, no moving clouds and no roads from which headlights could shine. We still have no explanation for what we witnessed. I was on patrol one night in my town and we were told to go to some weird place that none of us had ever heard of. Cernan Lake is how it's pronounced. I haven't been able to find it on any maps after the fact and we had to be directed by dispatch to a back road which was barely visible from the highway. Grass had grown over most of it and you could only see tiny gravel rocks here and there. We're no strangers to small towns out in the middle of nowhere seeing as there's a ghetto calling itself Lake Annette nearby. Anyway, someone had reported a woman screaming inside of a motel and two men had gone into the room and not come out. Naturally, this sounds like a pretty big deal. So we're sent out there and being guided over radio by dispatch. When we get there, it's basically just a set of eight buildings, one of which is a gas station. There were no pumps and it was basically just a house with a concrete drive-in. The motel is the closest thing to the road. A bunch of people, maybe about nine, were standing outside the motel. Most of the lights inside were on, and at first we didn't hear any screaming. We tried briefly to talk to the people outside about what was going on, but everyone said something along the lines of, I don't know, I just woke up because of all the screaming. Seeing as this was a potentially dangerous situation, I drew my taser and my partner drew his service pistol in case the taser didn't work for whatever reason. Thick clothing, probe going off too far to one side, something like that. As soon as we open the front door to the motel, the screaming starts up again. It was incredibly painful to the ears and caused us to run to the room from which it was coming. We yelled in that we were the police and we went in. As soon as the door is open, the screaming stops, just gone. The room looks completely ransacked, scratches on the walls. No blood though, 
Nothing seems to be missing, just misplaced or damaged. The bathroom was completely clean, no scratches. Closets were empty. We looked under the beds even, and nothing was there. We poked around for as long as we felt was necessary and radioed in that we didn't find anything. We waited for other people to come out and help. We left and went back to the station and wrote up written reports. We still have absolutely no idea what happened. Investigators don't have any idea, and we haven't heard anything from the lake town since. I've been having sleep paralysis fairly frequently, hearing scratching on the walls and footsteps, as well as nightmares. None of this happened until we went there. I've been working with a psychiatrist to deal with it, currently trying Ambien to see if it'll keep me from experiencing sleep paralysis I've been tempted to go out there again on my own time, but I haven't been able to work up the nerve. Our department can't afford body cams for everybody, since we're a small town department. We can barely afford repairs on our vehicles, so we didn't get any footage. I have no idea what this might have been. I'm leaning towards some kind of elaborate prank, but it just seems odd. Like, it would have taken way too much effort to actually fake it to be worth it. We've seen the guy who owns the so-called gas station coming to our gas stations and filling up gas cans. He puts them in the back of his pickup and drives back toward the highway with him. I also asked around as the post office said that they do occasionally get mail to and from there, but it's mostly tax stuff. I haven't been able to find it on any maps. The view is blocked by trees on Google Earth and you can't really see the turnoff on the highway. I've been having trouble finding really any official records related to it, aside from a case file from the early 90s, before I was even born, about a textbook domestic disturbance. A couple of years ago, my pops and I decided to go on a road trip. It was very out of the blue. I wasn't even expecting it, but I decided to go anyway. It would be some solid father-son bonding time. After driving for what seemed like a couple of hours, it was maybe around 8 to 9 p.m., we pulled up into this gas station for snacks and water and to use the bathroom. And we went back inside our car. Keep in mind, this gas station was basically in the middle of nowhere. Anyway, we got back into our car and decided to look for a motel, but there were none. And I mean, there wasn't a single one anywhere near us. My dad was really tired, so we decided to sleep in the car. We pulled up into this sort of resting area slash parking lot and decided to go to sleep. My dad fell fast asleep, but I was on my phone for a couple of hours. And around 11 p.m., I just felt suffocated by the tense air, and I decided to step out for a bit. I felt safe because the gas station was still in sight, and there would be a couple of trucks that would occasionally drive by, so I felt at ease. At this time, I was also texting my friend who lives in Seattle, Washington, and we were on the phone for a bit. Then I saw what looked like a large cornfield. I was a city guy, so I'd never seen a cornfield in real life. So I decided to cross the road and just get a closer look. So that's what I did. I walked extremely close and started feeling like I was being watched. But again, I thought, well, you're literally outside in the dark standing next to a tall cornfield. Of course you're gonna feel weird. So I brushed it off. I even considered going in, but then I thought, why would I even do that? So anyway, I decided to just take a step back when I noticed a barn, a large white barn with red, maybe black strips. It was hard to tell in the dark, but it surely was a barn. And I was stupid and young when this happened, maybe 14 or 15. So out of curiosity, I decided to just check it out. The barn was next to the cornfield, kind of tucked in a little. I literally thought to myself, I wish I could see something that would freak me out as a joke because I never really thought that anything would happen and I love being scared. Anyway, I started making my way toward the barn. 
getting closer and closer. I remember very vividly that I was wearing no socks and just slip on slides. I remember the dirt rubbing against my toes while I walked. I remember sending pictures to my friend in Washington, jokingly saying that I saw something and I was gonna go check it out. As I got closer, I did see something. Behind the barn, but sort of to the side, like how when someone peers from a corner. At first, I thought it was a bell. Literally, I assumed that it was just a bell attached to the corner of the barn. So I just walked closer. I kept moving toward it. And then I saw the head of something or someone just peering around the corner at me. At that moment, I straight up froze. My flight or fight was out of function, apparently, because there I was literally seeing someone or something peering at the corner and I didn't do either of those things. After about five to 10 seconds, the noise that Snapchat makes when you get a notification snapped me out of it. And I just ran as fast as I could across the road to my dad's car and got in. I felt a sense of relief wash over my body and somehow my dad was not awake. Me gasping for air wasn't enough to stir him from his sleep, I guess. I really considered waking him up and telling him that we have to leave and telling him what I saw, but he would assume that I was joking or having some kind of episode since he's never believed in anything paranormal or out of the ordinary at all. I took deep breaths and just texted my friend telling her what I saw, but she didn't believe me. I don't blame her and I won't blame any of you either if you don't believe me. I have a hard time actually believing what I saw sometimes but I know it was real. I was sober and fully aware, but from the bottom of my heart, the part that disturbs me the most is that whatever was peering at me from around that corner was very tall, at least seven, maybe eight feet tall. And every time I think about that, I get a sense of dread and paranoia. I haven't told any of my family, not even my dad, but if any of you have a clue of what I might've seen, let me know. I wasn't hallucinating. And this was way before I figured out anything to do with psychedelics or drugs in general. I've been trying to piece it together ever since it happened. I was sort of 50-50 on paranormal encounters before, but after that experience, I believe. I believe in walkers and wendigos and ghosts and everything pretty much. It's completely changed me. I wanna know what's out there. I want to know what I encountered. I'm a sheriff's deputy in a fairly busy county. Along with the job comes the unfortunate familiarity with what a decomposing human body smells like. To me, it's very similar to an animal carcass, but with a much sweeter odor. Not sweet in the sense that I enjoy it, hell no. That smell normally means a bad night for me and another gruesome memory to add to my catalog of things I would rather forget. With that out of the way, I'll get to what happened. Last night, I was patrolling a geographically isolated area of the county, which is very large and sparsely populated. Having completed the hour-long trek to the northwestern county line, I began driving through the mountains back toward civilization. About 25 miles from town, or the closest semblance thereof, I hit a straight stretch of highway through a wide valley. Since the weather was nice, I had my windows rolled down. As I passed the entrance of an old logging road, that familiar smell of sweet rot suddenly filled my car. Not just a whiff, a cloud of it, filled the cab as if there was a weak old human corpse sitting in the front seat next to me. It was all too familiar, but this time there was something else that I couldn't place. It lingered for a few moments, then went away just as quickly as it had entered. Realizing what I had just smelled, my heart sank and I pulled to the side of the road. I told myself it was just a dead animal in the ditch and that my mind was playing tricks on me. I turned my car around and drove slowly back toward the logging road. 
The closer I got to it, the smell became stronger, and I grew more certain that I was about to find a body. Holding on to a shred of hope that I was wrong, I parked my unit on the side of the highway just before the dirt road. I radioed to dispatch, told them my location and that I would be out of my unit for a moment. I didn't say why to avoid an awkward disregard on a possible body on the side of the road. I shined my flashlight into the ditch and into the encroaching briars and weeds as I walked closer to where I believed the source of the smell was. Once I was a few yards away from the dirt road, I saw the opening of a concrete culvert going under the highway. At this point, the smell was nearly as strong as it had been when I first passed. The opening of the culvert was about three feet in diameter, just large enough to hide a body inside. I cursed and held my breath as I leaned over and shined my light inside. An empty tunnel stretched the width of the highway. Somewhat relieved, I stood and looked around. It smelled as if I was standing on top of whatever was emitting the odor. I searched around the brush for a moment, but found nothing. Thinking the origin might be on the opposite side of the highway, I crossed to the other ditch to continue searching. As I walked away from the other side of the road, the smell grew faint. I stopped at the opposite end of the culvert and peeked inside, just to double check. The odor was nearly gone at this point. I stood up and checked my surroundings when I heard a crack in the brush behind me and the smell engulfed me even stronger than before. Thinking for a moment that the wind must have shifted, I froze when I realized the air was dead still. Whether it was fear or something else, a shiver went down my spine. In the distance, I saw headlights coming down the highway. As the car came near, the odor seemed to move away, farther into the bushes toward where I had heard the crack. The car stopped, and the passenger rolled down the window and asked if I was all right. I lied and told him that I was. I thanked him for checking, and I walked briskly to my car as they drove away. I got the hell out of there. Once I was able to get cell service, I called my friend who was patrolling the opposite side of the county. I explained what had happened, trying not to let on that I was spooked. Once I was done, he paused for a moment, then asked about the unusual hint of something which accompanied the smell. He asked if it was sulfur, and I put two and two together. It was sulfur that I had smelled. I asked if he thought I had found a demon in the middle of nowhere, to which he responded with a concerned, yes. This guy is the son of a missionary and has been all around the world. He has seen, rather smelled, this before and told me that it was a very concerning experience. This spooked me even more because his responses were very out of character for him. Maybe something else happened. Maybe there's some shred of a possibility that there's a scientific explanation. But honestly, I think I agree with my friend. I think there's a demon in the valley. This is one of the many things that I have never told to anyone before, because I'm pretty sure that nobody would have believed me thinking that my imagination was just wild, and sometimes I still doubt that anybody will believe me. But I remember this happening for real, so I wanted to share. This thing happened to me in the past when I was around nine, and I always used to hang out with my oldest cousin, who was seven back then. We were pretty inseparable at the time, before everything changed when he turned 18. I was spending the night at my granny's house, as I used to be her personal dog sitter, and he decided to come hang out with me. He suggested that it was a good idea to go into the nearest forest, which was almost right next to her house. We were living in a medium-sized city, but the forest is almost always near buildings at some parts or areas. Around 10 or 11 p.m., we decided just to walk to the edge of the forest since it would have been completely foolish to go deep into the forest that late. 
I told him that that would be a good idea, since we were both kind of bored and feeling adventurous. We headed out and just started to walk toward the edge of the forest, both up for having a small adventure. But that didn't even last a half hour before the weird things started to happen. I remember when I was standing against a big tree and looking just in front of me, my cousin was near my side, like six or seven inches away from me. I was looking in front of me and I felt like I was searching for something. I'm still unclear of what exactly it was, but I was just looking. All of a sudden, I saw red eyes staring at me from out of nowhere, but they were really far from us. I turned toward my cousin and asked if he was seeing what I was, but he ignored my question. So I turned back to look at the eyes and they were much closer than before. I blinked a few times, but of course I couldn't see anything around them and they weren't getting closer. I just saw trees. I turned back to him and asked the same question, but he kept ignoring me. So I turned one last time to look at them to see that they were even closer and closer. I just kept watching them, feeling a little bit afraid at this moment, and I swear that they started to come toward me, even when I didn't look away. So I just grabbed his hand and ran as quickly as I could until we saw the street lamps. After that, I've never seen or experienced the same thing ever again. The weirdest thing in hindsight is that I never heard it getting closer. I never heard anything at all. Even if it had been like a wolf or a dog or something like that, I would have heard rustling or branches or something. But there was just nothing. It's been 16 years since this happened and it has always stayed with me. I've lived in rural Massachusetts for 17 years of my life, and I've encountered a lot of wildlife in my time here. One day I was moving my mare up toward another pasture, which was a little ways down from my house, a good 15 minute walk. I tacked her up and we were making our way down the main road. The road is still very rural, dense forest lies on either side, and cars rarely drive on it. It's a perfect main road to horseback ride on. All of a sudden, my mare wouldn't keep going. Annoyed, I dismounted and decided to lead her on foot to the pasture. We were making our way around a corner when I noticed my mare's gaze fixated on something. Less than 15 feet away from us was a large black bear. As we made eye contact, my heart sank into my stomach. I was 16 years old at the time and barely weighed 100 pounds. Staring down something so large is unforgettable, and it was one of the scariest things I've ever experienced. Not only do I have this thing's attention, but I have a whole damn horse with me, and I'm on the ground, not even on the horse. Maybe I didn't act the way I was supposed to, but I'm alive, so I'm not complaining. I slowly started walking backwards with my mare, not wanting to risk anything. Adrenaline does weird things. After I re-rounded the corner and the bear was out of sight, I mounted my mare and made my way back to my house. I actually drove up with my car and managed to get a few blurry pictures of it, but nothing to write home about. I have had a lot of weird-ass borderline paranormal encounters in the woods, but nothing beats Mother Nature's creatures.